break the rules for debating repeal of the Obama administration's health care bill. The House is expected to debate the rule on Friday with a final passage vote set for next Wednesday. Committee Chair Congressman David Dreyer has just gaveled the meeting to order. This is live coverage on C-SPAN 2. Mr. Klein and the Chairman of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Upton. And uh, gentlemen, let me just say that uh, this uh, legislation has been written and uh, introduced by Mr. Cantor, the repeal measure, and I've introduced the replace measure in response to a commitment that was made to uh, immediately have an up or down vote on a repeal of the health care bill and a very strong commitment that we made to deal with replacing this measure with uh, some of the thoughtful proposals that came forward during debate, many of which are supported by President Obama and, uh, and other Democrats as well. So we welcome you here and uh, whatever remarks you have uh, will be included in their entirety in the record uh, that you have prepared, and we'd uh, welcome summary from you. So why don't we begin with uh, Chairman Klein. Thank you, uh, Chairman Dreyer. Uh, good morning to you and Ranking Member Slaughter, and members of the committee, many new members uh, in, in new seats. Uh, kind of an exciting day. I appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of this legislation that reflects the wishes of the American people and repeals a disastrous government takeover of health care. The Education and the Workforce Committee's interest in this legislation is primarily found in the provisions affecting employer-provided health care, with more than half of all non-elderly Americans receiving health care coverage through an employer-provided plan. These elements of the law are among the most consequential for individuals, families, and our economy. Numerous provisions in the law threaten job creation and economic growth, but few are as visible as the employer mandate. The law requires every employer with more than 50 workers to provide government-approved health care coverage. Those who do not or cannot afford to will be slapped with a penalty of $2,000 per worker beyond the first 30. The potential for harm is obvious. This law is a job killer. A small business with 50 employees would be penalized to the tune of $42,000 for hiring a 51st worker. One new worker. $42,000 in new cost. If they do not want to pay the penalty, they have the option of providing government-approved health care coverage, a proposition that could cost even more. Hiring new workers will be more expensive, making it harder for job creators to put Americans back to work. The hiring disincentives are particularly strong for small employers hovering near the 50-worker penalty threshold. The law puts pressure on small business with fewer than 50 workers not to grow and it pressures those with just over 50 workers to actually eliminate jobs. The only way to avoid paying a penalty on workers is to provide government-approved health insurance. Not surprisingly, that's easier said than done. President Obama famously and repeatedly promised the American people they could keep their health care if they liked it. Unfortunately, the regulators in his administration seem to have a different plan. In June, the administration issued regulations on the so-called grandfather provision the part of the bill that is supposed to protect current employer plans, making them immune to the law's costly mandates and complex requirements. To the contrary, the regulations will increase employer costs, and the administration's own estimates indicate up to 69% of all employer plans are expected to lose grandfathered status by 2013. The picture is worse for small businesses, up to 80% of which could lose their grandfathered status and become subject to the law's costly new mandates. As a result, some estimates indicate 87 million Americans can expect to see changes to their plans thanks to the grandfather rule. If you like what you have, you cannot keep it. Instead, you'll have to pay more for something different. We all know that more mandates mean higher costs. Perhaps that is one reason why the Congressional Budget Office estimates 3 million individuals will end up in the public exchanges or on Medicaid. 3 million is an estimate, but in reality, Many more Americans could be forced into exchanges in the Medicaid program. The more difficult we make it for employers to provide affordable coverage, the more likely it is that plans will disappear and consumers will have no choice but the government-run Medicaid or the exchanges. As a result, costs for taxpayers will explode. I know that our colleagues on the other side of the aisle will talk today about a handful of provisions in the law that are more appealing than the employer mandates and eviscerated coverage. They're setting up a false choice, trying to convince us and the American people that we cannot improve health care without orchestrating this government takeover. It's just not true. 
I look forward to casting my vote to repeal this law so we can get to work in our committees to carry out the wishes of our constituents, and I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Klein. Mr. Upton, and we're happy to be joined at the table representing the Committee on the Judiciary, Mr. King. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman and members of the committee. Uh, I do appreciate the opportunity to testify in support of repealing the Job Killing Health Care Law Act, a bill that is key in our efforts to promote policies that will help put Americans back to work and actually bring down health care costs for working families. In trying to secure passage of the controversial health care law, Speaker Pelosi famously said that the House needed to pass the bill so that we could find out what's in it. Well, in the 10 months since its passage, the American people have learned what was in the bill, some of it anyway, and they have overwhelmingly rejected it because it does kill jobs and increases costs. Our nation's unemployment rate is nearly 10 percent. It's over 12 percent and has been so in my home state of Michigan the last three years. This is flatly unacceptable, and it underscores the urgency of our efforts to end job-killing policies like Obamacare. The government takeover of health care destroys jobs with a host of tax hikes and costly government mandates. It raises taxes on the American people by more than $500 billion. And at a time of soaring unemployment, the law alarmingly includes $210 billion in new payroll taxes, $60 billion in new taxes on health plans, $27 billion in taxes on pharmaceuticals that, pa that patients need, $20 billion in taxes on common medical devices used by patients like pacemakers and oxygen, $15 billion in increased taxes on people with high medical expenses, and $13 billion in taxes by restricting the use of flexible savings accounts for things like over-the-counter drugs, including allergy medication. Hundreds of billions of dollars in new taxes will not only suffocate our economy, it will hurt families at a time when they can least afford it. This is not the American way. And let's, let's not forget the $52 billion employer mandate. According to a study by the NFIB, an employer mandate could eliminate 1.6 million jobs by 2014. Two-thirds of those job losses could come from small businesses that should be driving our economic recovery. At the Blair House Health Care Summit last year, Speaker Pelosi claimed that the health care bill would create 400,000 new jobs almost immediately. Well, the only new jobs Americans can are, uh, see for now are, met, are Washington bureaucrats writing thousands of pages of regulations, even as they hand out waivers because of the law's unworkable mandates. Mr. Chairman, we must work together to foster a new era of job growth that encourages investment and innovation. We must repeal this job-killing health care bill that raids the pocketbooks of working Americans and sends their hard-earned tax dollars to Washington to create jobs for bureaucrats who decide what health care the public can have. We need to free our job creators from the uncertainty of the bill's regulations and taxes so jobs can be created in places like Washington Township, Michigan, not Washington, D.C. When the health care reform debate began, the President said the goal of reform was to lower costs in fact, he predicted Americans would see their premiums reduced by as much as $2,500 a year. However, the CBO now estimates that Obamacare will actually raise, not lower, health insurance premiums in the individual market 10 to 13 percent. Americans are now facing the prospect of a $2,100 increase in premium rather than the $2,500 decrease that was promised. The President also promised, as Mr. Klein said, that if Americans like their health insurance, they could keep it. Yet the bureaucrats enforcing the new government rules have stated that almost 87 million Americans would lose their current coverage. Despite the administration's billion-dollar taxpayer-funded ad campaign to convince seniors otherwise, the $575 billion in cuts to Medicare to fund new entitlements will hurt the Medicare program and its beneficiaries. The administration's chief actuary estimates that a full 50% of participants, or 7 million seniors, will lose access to their Medicare Advantage plans. The bill cuts hundreds of billions for Medicare providers that, according to the actuary, could force 15 percent of providers to leave the program. The result would be, and I quote, jeopardizing access to care for beneficiaries. And despite claims to the contrary, the cost of Obamacare will markedly increase the federal deficit. Proponents of the bill understood that the program could not sustain itself so they use misleading budget gimmicks to hide the true costs. The law, as we remember, 
provide six years of benefits provided with 10 years of tax increases in Medicare cuts. And according to a report author, authored by a former director of CBO, Obamacare will increase the federal budget deficit by more than $550 billion in the first 10 years of the law and $1.4 trillion in the following 10 years. Finally, instead of stopping skyrocketing health care costs, Obamacare increases them. The administration's chief actuary predicts that the federal government and the country will spend $310 billion more under Obamacare than we would have without the new law. Even after the bill was signed into law, the Republican minority pleaded with the former chairman to hold hearings on the massive overhaul. We asked for hearings to examine how companies will be forced to change or even drop their health care plans, leaving the promise that if you liked your insurance, you could keep it as nothing but empty rhetoric. We sought hearings with the Secretary of HHS and other members of the administration bureaucracy now in charge. Our calls went unanswered. Mr. Chairman, things will change now. As the new chair of the Energy and Commerce Committee, we will embark on a number of hearings in both the Health and Oversight Investigation Subcommittees. We will not let go unanswered to the call of the American people who spoke loud and clear in November and rejected this massive government expansion and takeover of health care. I yield back the balance. Thank you very much, Mr. Upton. Appreciate it, and congratulations to you. Mr. King. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I very much appreciate the opportunity to testify before the Rules Committee today. And uh, I'll do so in favor of legislation to repeal the Democrats' deeply flawed health care bill. The cornerstone of health care law this bill repeals is the individual mandate. That's a mandate that requires all Americans to either purchase health insurance or pay a fine. This mandate is clearly outside the scope of the enumerated powers the Constitution grants the federal government. In fact, I find four places that I believe Obamacare violates the Constitution in my reading of it. Specifically, the individual mandate is supported by neither the Commerce Clause nor Congress's power to lay and collect taxes. The Commerce power only covers commercial or economic activity. And that is the production, distribution, or consumption of commodities. An individual's decision not to purchase health insurance is not a commercial or economic activity. In fact, it's not an activity. It is a non-economic inactivity. We're going to punish a non-economic inactivity. When you think about a man's home being his castle, the long tradition of old English common law that we've inherited here, and an individual man or woman could sit in their house pay all their taxes in their house and sit there and do nothing and be in violation of a law and have the federal government come and impose a levy of fine against them by using the IRS. It's astonishing in its reach beyond the scope of the Constitution. Not even the Supreme Court's most expansive Commerce Clause cases have intimated the clause allows Congress to regulate non-economic inactivity. Thus, the health care bill's individual mandate is doubly unprecedented. It's without either an historical or a legal precedent. Nor does Congress's power to tax save the individual mandate. Congress cannot impose and cannot impose a penalty. That's a punishment for failure to act and simply rename it as a tax. It can be justified. It cannot be either justified under the taxing power. As President Obama has himself made clear during a television interview, he said, I quote, I absolutely reject the notion, close quote, that the individual mandate is a tax. Simply put, the individual mandate violates Congress's power under both the commerce and taxing clauses of the Constitution. If Congress had the power to impose the health care bill's individual mandate, its power would be unlimited. It could force Americans to engage in any activity it chose, from forcing Americans to purchase cars from General Motors, to exercising every day to stay in shape, to adjusting our diets perhaps, but in such a world, we would not be living under a constitution of enumerated powers. We'd be living instead under a regime of absolute federal control and unlimited mandates. This repeal bill will ensure that the unconstitutional individual mandate never commandeers Americans into purchasing health insurance. Repeal will also ensure that we can go back to the table to enact meaningful medical malpractice reform and end the costly practice of defensive medicine. Defensive medicine costs taxpayers real money as doctors are forced by the threat of lawsuits to conduct tests and prescribe drugs that aren't medically required. They're just to avoid lawsuits. A survey published in the Archives of Internal Medicine found that the vast majority of doctors practice defensive medicine. According to the survey, 
91% of doctors reported believing that physicians order more tests and procedures than needed to protect themselves from malpractice suits. Even President Obama has acknowledged that excessive defensive medicine reinforces our current system. And I'll quote, that's a quote, excessive de defensive medicine reinforces our current system. And I would point out there are estimates that range between 3.5% of our overall health care costs in America, as high as 8.5% of our health care costs in America, are attributed to defensive medicine and the litigation that's associated with medical malpractice. It could run as high as $208 billion a year. We have lower estimates, and I'll address those numbers in a moment. But, but why then do the Democrats' health care bill do nothing to prevent defensive medicine? Why did Democrats choose to enact a health care law that creates more federal rules for doctors without protecting them from lawsuits if they deviate one bit from those rules? That can only produce more litigation and less effective health care. But there are effective means for ending the practice of defensive medicine and reducing the increased expenses that lawsuits add to this country's health care costs. According to the Congressional Budget Office, Republican proposed litigation reforms would save at least $54 billion in health care costs, I think it could be substantially more. But doctors ignore, do, Democrat, Democrats excuse me, ignored Republican proposals in enacting their health care law and even encouraged states not to enforce similar malpractice reforms of their own. There are some models out there in the states. Texas and California would be two that come to mind. This is a major reason why we need to repeal the Democrats' health care law. We need to go back to the drawing board and, among other things, enact meaningful malpractice litigation reform to help improve health care make it more affordable, and save taxpayer money while reducing the federal deficit. Once repeal of this blatantly unconstitutional health care law is accomplished, we can move forward with positive health care reforms, including health care litigation reform. I suggest that we pull Obamacare out by the roots, root and branch, lock, stock, and barrel, eradicate it completely, and leave not one vestige of its DNA left behind because it is a malignant tumor into the spirit of America's vitality and constitutionality. And if it's allowed to have any particle left, it will regrow again and it will metastatize, metastasize like a tumor and grow back and it will consume the liberty and the vigor of the American people. We must pull it out by the roots. This Congress has been elected to do so. Mr. Chairman, I intend to participate in this, a full-throated 100 percent effort in doing so. I appreciate your attention, the opportunity to testify, and I'd be happy to yield to any questions. Thank you very much, Mr. King. Um, so where do you guys stand on this issue, I think is the natural question we need to uh, pose here. Uh, let me say at the outset that um, obviously uh, we want to ensure that every single American has access to quality health insurance and health care. The President of the United States indicated uh, in his first press conference following the uh, election that he believed that uh, this bill is flawed. He said that the 1099 provision that was in there that imposes uh, a burden on small businesses in this country needed to be addressed. Most recently, Judge Henry Hudson in Virginia has determined that the mandate, about which I guess all three of you were speaking, is unconstitutional. And so we have the executive, the President of the United States, referring to this as a flawed bill. We have, obviously, a court decision that has been made and it seems to me that the right thing for us to do is this two-step approach that we are taking. Number one, it is uh, our effort to repeal the measure. And number two, as I said, the measure that I'm introducing, have introduced and have many co-sponsors on, which calls for us to get your committees working to ensure that every single American has access to quality health insurance and health care. Now, I believe that there are five simple steps that need to be taken that would immediately drive the cost of health insurance down. And I think that we should expand medical savings accounts. We should have associated health plans. We should have meaningful lawsuit abuse reform. We should have pooling to deal with pre-existing conditions. And we should do everything that we possibly can to ensure that people can acquire insurance across state lines. Those five simple things most of which are actually supported by President Obama. In every one of those instances, from his State of the Union message, where he talked about lawsuit abuse reform, to his interest in looking at the purchase of insurance across state lines being made available, there has been interest. And if the President hasn't talked about every one of those issues, I know that there are Democrats who have. And so I believe that we have an opportunity to come together in a bipartisan way and we know that there was not bipartisan support for this measure. 
when we saw it in the 111th Congress, but I believe that in the 112th Congress, upon repealing this measure, we can come together, Democrats and Republicans alike, working with the President to ensure that every American has access to quality health insurance by driving those costs down. And so I thank you all for your uh, thoughtful remarks, and uh, uh, I uh, will say that uh, you've come forward with some interesting figures that are obviously uh, going to be challenged by my colleagues on the other side of the aisle. Just this notion that 87 million Americans, as you said, Chairman Upton, will lose their health insurance when, in fact, we're hearing that everyone could keep their, uh, their insurance. The fact that we have this CBO study that has now come out showing that we will see uh, an increase an increase in the deficit of $145 billion when, in fact, if you look at the gimmickry involved, I mean, we're talking about $700 billion in gimmicks, and to me it is incomprehensible to think that putting into place taxes, mandates, and an extraordinarily burdensome structure like this is going to save taxpayer dollars. We know that the taxes alone in this measure are going to exacerbate the economic downturn through which we are struggling today. And so again, I, uh, I thank you all very much for your remarks and uh, appreciate the thoughtful approach. And I assume that I have a commitment from all three of you that when we pass my measure that directs your committees to begin work on an effort to put these measures in place that will decrease the cost of health insurance for Americans, that you're committed to doing that. Absolutely. Absolutely. I, uh, without a doubt, uh, we, we will be embarking on this uh, almost right away, and we will have a product that you will be very proud of, and I would like to think will be bipartisan in terms of what we would like to do uh, to help working families and businesses provide benefits uh, for their, well, thank their you. workers. Both of the other two gentlemen nodded, so I sue, and I know you can't speak for the entire committee, but I, uh, I feel very sanguine that, uh, <laughs> that, uh, that your colleagues on the Judiciary Committee and uh, Chairman Smith will uh, lead an effort there, and I got the great nod from Chairman Klein. So uh, we look forward to working together in a bipartisan way to ensure that we can drive the cost of health insurance down. Mr. Sessions. Thank you very much, Chairman, and uh, welcome to each uh, of you who are here today. Today, with great anticipation, uh, we here in the Rules Committee are uh, looking forward to hearing not only what you have to say, but also our colleagues on the other side of the aisle. During the last few years, this has been an active discussion, and I note there are a number of people in the room today who are back to give us discussion, including the gentleman, Mr. Andrews. Uh, who have given us thoughtful ideas. I'm very pleased to hear that what you're going to do is go and examine, reopen, and make sure that the facts of the case now are better known. Uh, I will tell you that uh, the American people uh, recognize as gasoline nears four, and we've been told five dollars a gallon, that we recognize, or at least group of people that I hang around with recognize that gasoline at four or five dollars a gallon combined with the economy that we have that's that is a drag on jobs and knowing that this health care bill which is a devastator not only for the amount of money it costs but also in the the, the job loss that takes place uh, is slowing our economy chronic unemployment is what we've now had uh, but when you look up and see that gasoline is going to this price because of the economic advantages that are taking place in China and India. There are economies that are booming and the United States is left out of that because we are embroiled in trying to uh, do health care, cap and trade and all these things which diminish our economic base. So it's my hope that we will Think about catching up with the world as the world leader in job creation, innovation. The last thing I'd like to say is I hope that there will be some focus on pharmaceutical companies that I believe uh, have been diminished greatly in their capacity to provide R&D, the advantages to solve and cure problems that exist in the marketplace today that is the promise of 
better utilization of our dollars because we can have a pharmaceutical industry which can cure problems that maybe some doctors cannot do. So I'm very excited about what this new day that has dawned and what it means. And uh, uh, we'll look forward to hearing not only from my colleagues, the gentleman, Mr. Andrews, who is back again, but also my colleagues on the Rules Committee uh, that are Democrats about how we're actually going to go look at this issue, how we're going to dissect it and move forward. So, Mr. Chairman, I, with great anticipation, I appreciate your leadership. Thank you very that. much, uh, Vice Chairman Sessions. And let me uh, call on Mrs. Slaughter and say that uh, we have a quorum call that's just been called uh, on the floor. And so I would encourage members to uh, to uh, record their presence downstairs, and we're going to continue with the hearing. So thank you, good. Mrs. Slaughter. Thank you, Mr. Dryer. Good morning, gentlemen. We're happy to see you. Congratulations on your new posts. Um, I uh, think this is probably one of the first times uh, that I have been able to speak uh, about this. I, I understand your great determination to root it out, root and branch, burn over the ashes and spit on the ground, as far as I can tell. America should tremble. Uh, you do know that the latest polls show that 56% of Americans really like this bill, 13% think it's not strong enough. Uh, and you do understand that the harm you're going to do. But let me ask all three of you, uh, what do you think about holding a hearing to do away with this kind of legislation, something of this magnitude uh, that, frankly, America has not done in, in probably a generation, uh, without holding any hearings in your committee? Any, I'd like to hear from all of you about that. That we find ourselves this morning with an emergency rules committee to get this done so that next week you can vote to undo this with no hearings and no discussion. Let me just say, this is, uh, sort of yep. this is not an emergency meeting. This meeting was announced uh, earlier. So oh. I, I would just like to, like to say, and I appreciate the comments from my, my friend. Yes. Uh, and welcome to your new slot as well. I say that in a, in a mm -hmm. friendly way. Uh, I would just note that our our party leadership, uh, with with virtually everyone behind it uh, of our members, uh, announced uh, last summer. Uh, first of all, there was not a single Republican, as I recall, that voted for the bill uh, last March when That's it true. when it passed by only seven votes, mm -hmm. uh, despite a 78 vote margin by Speaker Pelosi. Uh, we announced uh, in the summer that we would be, if. Uh, we took the majority. We would look for a full repeal. It was part of our pledge uh, that was publicly unveiled in late September, early October. Uh, I would dare say that every one of the uh, new freshman class and, and many of us uh, that, that ran for re-election had this as, as part of our, our platform. Uh, it should come as no surprise. It's uh, no but surprise. we also said repeal and replace. It is so, absolutely like, no surprise. But let me say, oh, you were on the committees, I assume that held over 100 hours of hearings on this bill. We did. and, and So how can you say well, and, and I that would, you had no input? Well, if you attended 100 <laughs> hours of I'd, hearings I'd on this bill. i tell you how we had no input. You uh, didn't. Your amendments were accepted. Maybe. And some of them disappeared uh, between our were, committee and uh, coming to the, the rules last Would the gentlelady year. yield? I won't right now, but what has really stunned me most is I'm knowing from the very beginning that 100 hours of uh, hearings were held, 83 hours of committee markups, uh, House heard from 181 witnesses, Democrat and Republican. 239 amendments were considered in the three committees and 121 adopted. The Democrat caucus spent at least four times doing caucuses to go over this bill uh, section by section, hours at a time. And yet, despite this and the fact that you were in those meetings, with the exception of the Democrat caucus meetings, you continue to say that you had no input on this bill. How can any of the three of you say that if, if with, you would yield with straight for, face? If you would yield yep, for a moment. I'd like to hear from all moment. three of you, certainly. Uh, Chairman Waxman had a 36-23 advantage. Uh, in the markup that we had last summer, uh, unlike most markups where the, the bill is uh, able to be marked up title, title A, Title B, Title C, we could only mm -hmm. do the third title without doing the first two, without uh, any amendments uh, b being... Uh, uh, shown for a 48-hour uh, advance, and not but, until we finish Title III could we go back to Title I or II. But can you really say to the people you represent with straight face, either three of you, I'd like to hear from all well, of you, that you had no input on this bill and you didn't know what was in it? I find that. Uh, thank Ryan, you. I'd love to <clears throat> yeah. hear that. Thank you, uh, Ms. Slaughter. Um, I do find it interesting that in spite of all those uh, 
hours that you're talking about hearings, we still had the, the fascinating occurrence of the speaker saying that we need to pass it and then find out what was in it. I mean, the truth is that Americans didn't know what was in this thing and many others didn't because this legislation was not written in a bipartisan way. The input that we had as Ms. The hearings I'm were sorry. bipartisan, Mr. I'm, Klein, that's what really I'm is. sorry, it's not written it's in a bipartisan. written under the same ways that we write bills in the House, and I'm astonished. That I think that, but there are other things that I want to go on, so we won't yes. dwell on them, but let you can, can, you, can I make you, just one quick point? Yes. Uh, I read a lot of the bill, and, e and I meant to bring it. Well, I hope uh, so. I, and, and it was I, and, up for And months. I read it I on parts months. of it on the, on the House floor. Uh-huh. And I would say it to, to the section that Mr. Klein uh, uh, testified on with regard to the section 1099, mm -hmm. if you read that particular page, page 737 in the enacted bill, you would not have any idea that this was going to require a $600 transaction uh, uh, filing by every business. We can't discuss every jot and tittle. Well, on did you this know bill. that that was in the bill bef before we took it up on the House floor? Uh, absolutely. I, mean, so I think that that was a mistake, and I don't know of a bill we've ever done through this House that didn't need that. But for over a hundred years, Congress has tried to do something about health care in the United States, starting with Teddy Roosevelt. Over a hundred years, we didn't take this on because we're masochists. We didn't take it on because we wanted to have town hall meetings where people were throwing rocks and things at us. We did it because 17% of GDP was taken up with health care, rising every day, and something had to be done. And we were the only industrial country on the face of the earth that did not provide health care for its people. And this, believe me, I went through this in the Clinton administration, and we went through it now. The eight years that you all were in charge, you did absolutely nothing about the cost of health care or any kind of health care bill. Uh, now, and I'll talk about jamming down the throat. I don't know what you'd call this. And by the way, this is an emergency session. It was called last night. It comes under the heading of being an emergency meeting. But we're rushing this through, no doubt about it, despite all the plans. We were all going to wait forever and read it all and, and have all this time. Uh, but you don't have a CBO estimate, do you, of what it would cost if you do what you want to do? I'm sorry, my staff is speaking. Is there a CBO estimate on the on repeal of this bill? Uh, yes, yes, uh, Madam Chair. Uh, and what is Chair, it, please? I've forgotten that. Yes, Mrs. Slaughter, there is. And uh, in fact, it's in your folder. Um, it is uh, out. 200 and, 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 and actually, the, the uh, conclusion right? on uh, page four of the letter is uh, $145 billion. That's billion the first 10 years. $1.2 trillion for the second year. So you, you talk about this being a job killer. Uh, I, I don't know how you can arrive at that. Uh, 935,000 jobs have been added in the health sector, uh, 171,000 just since it's been in, uh, in effect. Um, but one thing, so I'll judge uh, Henry Hudson having been used here. I, I really was so happy to hear that because I've done a little work on this one. Uh, you know that 10 federal judges threw the case out. Two federal judges said it absolutely it's constitutional. You wouldn't read that anywhere, but that's the fact. We get to Judge Hudson. Judge Hudson is a confirmed Republican, says he is. He tried several careers before, and he said, I was just in the right place at the right time, and they made me a judge. He is a co-owner of a consulting firm, a Republican consulting firm, and one of his clients is the Attorney General of the state of Virginia who brought the lawsuit. If there was ever a case in this world that cried out for recusal, that was it. Uh, and I, I, I really, because I have respect for all three of you, it really embarrasses me for you that you would use him uh, as your case, knowing that about the other ten and the and the uh, the two the that, that said it was constitutional. Um, I, I, we are rushing through here, getting ready to do something pretty devastating, I think. With a with lady terrible yield. effect. Yes, I will, Mr. King. We I, haven't I you want to hear from you. all I'd three like of us. So. I certainly do. I appreciate that. I, I just point out that my recollection is that consulting fee between the Attorney General of the State of Virginia and the consulting firm that you referenced that is, uh, I think, um, it is part owner, part invested by Judge Hudson was less than ten thousand dollars, and that they severed that relationship immediately well, when they found out that that well, had taken place. I must tell you, Mr. King, so as far as I'm concerned, a federal judge should not be a part owner in any any way, shape, or form of a Republican consulting firm. 
I mean, I've done, but I think, again, I, our standards have fallen so far. I mean, we even have Supreme Court justices. To complete your question uh, to the three of us that I yes. would like to respond to, and that is that there is no significant tort reform in this Obamacare health care bill. And, and it wasn't jurisdiction then of the Judiciary Committee, so we didn't address those massive hundreds of billions of dollars of costs that are unnecessary in our health care. We can do that in the future. That's one of the reasons why the Judiciary Committee didn't have a legitimate means to have a voice on this bill. And I'm surprised uh, that you would raise the issue about an emergency rules meeting here on this, mm -hmm. given how many times that I have seen the language change from a committee before it went on its way to the floor, even some of my own language on different bills. And we so never I think we're getting to a legitimate process we, here. No, we I'm did grateful not. that we're having a hearing. We and I believe that. that we have a unanimous position on our part of Republicans and a bipartisan position when the bill comes to the floor. I believe there will be significant Democrat votes for this. Everybody understands this bill. We've debated this for a year. I yield back. And let me just, 15 seconds. Our committee, we had eight Republican passed amendments, mm -hmm. and somehow they disappeared be between coming across the street from Independence Avenue to here to being part of the debate. They uh, had nothing uh, to do with the Rules Committee. Well, <laughs> it wasn't here. I don't know, yeah. I don't know what happened, uh, but, the, but, the, but they weren't there. The other thing is we tried actually in our committee to have a tort reform amendment, something that the president told a number of us one-on-one, -on -one, right. that he wanted tort reform as part of this package. We tried to offer, our side tried to offer that amendment in full committee, and we were denied uh, because of the jurisdiction issue. But again, it never came back from the judiciary, so it couldn't even be considered then on the House floor. Well, so table, it tort reform is generally process. a state issue. That's really done by the states. Well, and, but there is $50 million, I believe, right. in this bill to, to The president help. asked yeah. for it. And we tried to do that as well, with the repeal of the McCarran-Ferguson Act, which I'm happy to say almost everybody voted for in the House, uh, which was something really needed to be done. It's been around for years, and it's really very inhibiting. It's a great gift to the insurance industry, and we'd like to get that done. We wanted to do that, the, the uh, uh, medical malpractice along with it. But we were unable to get that, uh, get that done. And I, I would say to you that that really does need attention. The McCarran-Ferguson Act really ought to go. Um, I just find myself flummoxed after 20-something years here um, that, uh, of course, we had this happen with the catastrophic illness bill years ago. Uh, heaven knows how much further ahead we would have been maybe if we'd been able to keep that. Uh, but uh, there's a, I understand, uh, well, again, you, if, and I was here when, when that happened. It, yeah. I don't know that Mr. Klein or Mr. Yeah. King were here then, but that bill passed. I wasn't here. He, yes, you were. I was here when after we repealed it. It had been repealed. It, but, no, I think you were. You we and are, I, I think, were elected in 1986 they, together. Right. That bill passed. People found what was in it. And a year or two later, it was repealed almost overwhelmingly. It was. And my bet is that you... Mr. Dreyer and Mr. Upton voted for the bill and then voted to repeal it. Mm -hmm. At least that's what I did. Yep. I think you were here. We for weren't that. here when the bill came up. Oh, I can remember I looking we at that. But anyway, we'll, we'll I know I look it up. Repeal. <laughs> All right. I don't know where you. But, I, but again, uh, we found out what was in it, like the American would, people would have, like and think, wanted it repealed. The thing that has been so distressing to me is we had no fingerprints. We knew nothing about this bill, which we all know is not true. That we jammed it down the public's throat, which we know is not true. Uh, and if if that was a, a jamming, I don't know what you're going to call this. Uh, we're going to have to come up with maybe we'll come up with an adjective on our side that will be be appropriate to that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mrs. Slaughter. Let me just uh, respond to a couple yes. of uh, comments briefly, and uh, then we'll call on uh, Ms. Fox. And uh, first. Uh, this is technically designated as an emergency meeting for the following reason. We took the oath of office uh, less than 24 hours ago, and uh, the minority was informed of this meeting uh, at the beginning of this week, and today is Thursday, and so from my perspective, the notice clearly was provided, and so that's why I said this is not considered an emergency meeting. And uh, so uh, everyone knew that this was happening, and it has been made very clear. Uh, I want to make sure that every member has gone down to record their presence on the uh, on the quorum call. I have not. I'm going to call on uh, Ms. Fox now and turn over to Vice Chairman uh, Sessions, the gavel. Ms. Fox. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I heard uh, Mrs. Slaughter say um, 
about the catastrophic health care. I was not here when that passed, but it, it may be that her memory on that is not as strong as it might be, and I think her memory on what happened to this legislation may not be as strong as it might be. I've been puzzled uh, constantly at how our colleagues across the aisle have talked about how many hearings were held, how many amendments were offered. I, I just, I got the record uh, on the two bills, and I think it's really important that we correct it, and um, I, I'm not quite sure why my colleagues, uh, the chairman of the various committees, haven't done this, but the bill that passed the House was H.R. 3590. And indeed, there were hearings on that bill, and there were amendments offered on the bill. There were hearings in different committees. However, the bill that finally passed was H.R. 4872, which came from the Senate and had nary a single hearing on it. And I think we have to correct the record, and that every time our colleagues say this, we've got to correct the record because that bill had no hearings, not one. That bill was not allowed to be, well, excuse me, there was one hearing in the Rules Committee. It did not go, well, Mr. McGovern, if you can show me the record, I, I'm not gonna yield time, but when it comes time, I, I invite you to bring to the record the dates and times of those hearings. I would really like to know about those because I have the timeline on that bill, uh, but there were no hearings on it. And it is deceptive of our colleagues to continue to say that. And I think the record has to be clarified on that. And I, I would like to ask us all to do that. And I, I think Mr. Upton wants to add to my comment. Well, I, I do, and, and I, I thank you for for your comments. I, it was the Senate bill that passed. You'll recall when it passed on Christmas Eve morning, uh, there were actually a number of Senate Democrats who said, don't worry, this is, we know that this is not a perfect bill that's going to be fixed when it goes to conference. It never even went to conference. They took the Senate passed bill, how it got an HR number, I don't know, but they then took the Senate passed bill and that was it. No amendments at all when we pass it on the Sunday afternoon a couple of months later. As it reflects from our committee, and I did not serve then on the, on the health subcommittee, it's my understanding that there was one legislative hearing on the House, ended up being the House passed bill, not the Senate bill, and the secretary at the time said something along the lines of we're not permitted to answer direct questions on this bill because we've not read it. And I'm getting nods uh, from my staff that in fact that did transpire. So at the end of the day, it was the Senate bill, not the House. Correct. And really, all of the efforts, and there were hearings on health care, but on the legislative hearing there was only one. Uh, <laughs> it was in essence all for naught because the House passed package, which was passed in the fall of 09, was not part of the final bill that was enacted in March of last year. Well, again, I think we have to make sure the American people understand that our friends on the other side of the aisle are mixing up apples and oranges. And I, I want to ask in the future if we can do that that when comments are made about what bill had hearings, that our colleagues be very explicit that it was H.R. 3590 on which hearings were held and not on the bill which passed, which was H.R. 4872. I do think that's clear. I, I really am pleased that the American people are paying a lot more attention to what's going on in Congress. We've always said over the years that process is dull and nobody wants to hear about the process. But in this case, process is extremely important because it's the process that made the difference in the way this was done. Um, so I, I'm, I'm glad to be able to get this in the record that 
as you, Mr. Upton, you say there was one hearing. One legislative hearing. One legislative on the hearing. Bill. The Rules Committee did deal with the bill here, but Mr. Klein, were there any hearings in the Education Committee? Not, not on the Senate bill, no. Not on the Senate bill that is the bill that passed. Mr. King, would you like to add anything to that? that? I add to this, just, we didn't have jurisdiction, so there were no hearings in the Judiciary Committee. We would have liked to have had them, and liked to have had jurisdiction, and it would have improved the, the final policy. Well, Mr. Chairman, I just want to say, uh, to back up what uh, you and Chairman Dreyer have said, Republicans are very concerned that we have um, affordable health insurance and affordable health care in this country. What passed in this Congress does not provide that to the American people. In fact, what it does is give government control over insurance and health care for the American people. That is not what this republic is about. We are not to give our lives to the government. We don't live in a nanny state. And this repeal needs to be done so that we can get on with putting in common sense reforms related to health insurance and to health care. And I look forward to this action and to what is going to happen after that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you, Mrs. Fox. Uh, I would like to, uh, once again, uh, the chair would like to thank each of the members that are here and the gentleman, Mrs. Fox. We are not in a rush. We are here to openly, forthrightly discuss this subject. And I appreciate you taking the time as necessary, Mrs. Fox. The gentleman, Mr. McGovern, is recognized. Well, thank you. I'm glad to hear that we're not in a rush. But yet, not a single hearing has been held on this repeal package. Not a single one. I mean, we are meeting here today, and you haven't held a single hearing in any of your committees on what you're about to do today. I mean, I think people who are watching this are probably saying to themselves, well, why don't you hold hearings, figure out what the impact is? You may not agree with everything the Democratic uh, uh, bill that passed, but there may be some things that you do. Why not do this methodically and do this in a way that, that makes sense? But instead, we're coming here, we're rushing something to the floor. I mean, this, this is not a, if we, if, whether we do it today or Monday, uh, having a, you know, or, or, or next Thursday or a week from Thursday, doesn't make much difference. But there's not, not a single hearing has been held. And I have a question for the vice chair of the, of the committee, uh, because we've been talking a lot about process. And I, I just want him to correct the record uh, on something that I've, been, uh, that I've read, that uh, a statement from the majority leader, Mr. Cantor, who uh, has said uh, at a press conference that this package that's going to come to the floor next week might come to the floor under a, a restrictive rule or closed rule. Um, Given what Mr. Boehner said yesterday, given what Mr. Dreyer has said here, I, I would like to, the assurance from the vice chair that this will come to the floor under a, an open rule. Um, if you could give me that assurance, that would be, or at least tell me that Mr. Cantor misspoke. That would be helpful. You know, what, what I would say to the gentleman uh, is that what we're attempting to do is not a surprise to the American public nor to any member of Congress that has been reading about the expectations of performance. Uh, this was a promise that was made during the campaign uh, and the election where people would decide of who they would want to be their member of Congress. Uh, I believe that the gentleman, Mr. Cantor, the majority leader uh, of, of the United States Congress, has forthrightly says that he believes that we are going to schedule the hearing today, which we are doing. He believes that we will then have a vote on the rule, and he believes on or about Wednesday allowing the time for dissemination, discussion, and a full vetting of the process uh, for there uh, to be uh, a vote where the American people understood what this was about and every member of Congress knew what they were doing. I, I, right. I, As it relates to whether this will be an open or closed rule, okay. I think the gentleman knows that at the end of this hearing, before we vote on the rule, there will be a discussion about that, and then we will decide that. So Mr. Cantor spoke prematurely. You know what? I believe that the gentleman is entitled to an opinion about what he believes, well, and I will take well, let, the gentleman me, let me at ask, his word. Thank you very much. Let me ask the three gentlemen here. Would you support an open rule uh, for the discussion of this next week? <clears throat> 
Yes, Ms. Klein. Yeah, I thank the gentleman. I think that we have been very clear uh, as a party, the, the majority leader we were just talking about. We believe that we owe to the American people an up or down vote on, on this law. And so I would not support an open rule in this case. I, I would say that the way, as I understand the bill, the bill is rep repeal and replace. This is the first step. Uh, it then directs the, the proper committees to come back and, and talk about how we want to replace it. Uh, that work has not been done. That's where we're going to have the hearings. We're going to have the, the markups, whether it be in the oversight and investigation subcommittee, whether it be in the health subcommittee. Uh, and that will be when the time is, is taken to thoughtfully put together a, a piece of legislation that, in fact, replaces the repeal bill. But on repeal, it ought to be yes or no, knowing so that no, the next step no open is, rule, No open rule, no process to amend. I, I don't think we need an open rule on this now. We'll let the committees then take the action to, Mr. King? to replace it. Uh, Mr. McGovern, I, I'd suggest there's nothing to amend. This is either repeal it or not repeal it, and it's to, as I said, pull it all out by the roots. And, yeah. and I think there's something that's uh, completely left unsaid here, and that is that there's a piece of legislation, H.R. 4872, that passed the House without hearings, as Mrs. Fox said, no, well, that's, that could well, not I, have passed I, I, I this am House I am stunned with a legitimate approach. This is an illegitimate yeah, bill. Am, it didn't I'm have stunned. the support of the majority in this Congress. That I, they I am passed. stunned in light of what Mr. Boehner has said and what Mr. Dreyer has said and what others about an open process that all, all, of, all three of you here are, are saying that we should have a closed rule. I mean, that, that just, it, it, is, it, is really, it is really stunning. And no, and I, and I don't think it is as simple as an up or down vote. And that's one of the, one of the reasons why this is a, kind of a, a travesty here is that, uh, you know, it, it is a complicated issue. Uh, and, um, and quite frankly, you know, I'm looking at, the, I, I was just looking at a, a Kaiser poll that just came out where, quite frankly, when people realize what is in the bill, you know, more and more people do not want it repealed. In fact, only 24% of the people that they polled wanted a, a total repeal. And there are things in this bill that I would think that even Republicans uh, would agree. So this, this notion that we gotta, we're going to go in, we're going to throw everything out and start over again uh, without caring about a CBO score. I mean, we, 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 no one, all of a sudden, you, oh, the campaign's all about reducing deficits and lowering the debt, and yet we have a preliminary CBO score that says this is going to cost uh, a great deal of money to repeal, but that doesn't matter. And no hearings, no hearings, no, there's no, this is not a very, this is not a thoughtful process. And then you're all telling me that you want to close rule, bring it to the floor, no amendments, no input, so much for the open process. There's none. There's Mr. None. McGovern, I, I, I might note, as I have looked at some of the questions by not maybe specifically the Kaiser poll that you're, you're citing now, but other polls, and I would suggest that this is probably uh, the case for the Kaiser poll. When you look at a number of different individual elements, there is strong support for them. No pre-existing conditions uh, can we know, uh, allow for discrimination. Allow for insurance across state lines. Take the President's promise. If you like your health insurance, you can keep it. I think those things most Americans would support. And I would bet that at the end of the day, when we come back with the charge, whether it be the Education and Labor Committee, whether it be the Energy and Commerce Committee, whether it be the Ways and Means Committee, uh, hopefully perhaps the Judiciary Committee as it relates to tort reform, something that the President supports himself, those will be common ground issues that Republicans and Democrats can support, but, something Duffin, that we have, did not see in the process in the last whole, This is all backwards. I mean, you should do the hearings first. You know, and then figure out what makes makes sense, and then do the legislation. Well, what you're doing is the legislation, and then saying, "Oh, don't worry, we'll we'll do well, hearings." I would, and then you issue not a not an alternative. You issue a press release, a statement of principles, uh, quite frankly, which which are already taken care of in in the bill that that, is, that has already been passed. So I mean, it it just it just strikes me as, you know, as unbelievable that after all we heard about openness and about full discussion, that. We are rushing this to the floor. We have an emergency rules committee meeting. Um, we, we, this is going to be brought to the floor, and the majority leader is saying that under a closed process, and you're all agreeing that it should be a closed process. Uh, so where's the where's the openness well, and where's the discussion? And let me let me just say let me let me ask you a, a specific question. You know, some of the health care provisions have already kicked in. Um, you know, I have a lot of senior citizens in my district who uh, have fallen victim to the donut hole. Remember, you guys shoved through a Medicare prescription drug bill that wasn't paid for, that had 
added incredibly to the, uh, to the deficit. And then you allowed this donut hole to be there so that people, when they reach a certain level in terms of their cost of prescription drugs, they have to pay out of pocket expenses. You know, that is being reduced. And I can't tell you how many senior citizens that have told me, you know, I really appreciate that because it is a real burden uh, to, to uh, th this donut hole. Um, I look at the statement of principles, and there's no mention of the donut hole or the Medicare prescription drug bill or any of that kind of stuff. Um, but if you got your way, and we repealed the bill today, and it became law tomorrow, what happens to those senior citizens who are beginning to get relief from the donut hole? Do they get a tax increase? Two, two things I'd like to say. First of all, if, if the repeal bill does pass next week, it's not effective immediately because the Senate hasn't taken it up and neither has the President signed it. So we have a good number of time between when we can actually come back and report a bill that allows it to be replaced. Second, uh, and I don't know the Massachusetts plan as I do know the Michigan plan. I, I get from, from the start, the Michigan plan had at least, uh, Michigan seniors had at least three plans among the 30-some that they could pick and choose from. Remember, it was individual choice where there was no donut hole. And in addition, seniors, low-income seniors, did not have a donor hole. There were provisions in the Medicare Part D program when it passed that provided the subsidy so that they did not have a donut hole. Well, there are a lot of people. So all for the one that is concerned about the cost, in the donut hole. That's it's a real issue. No, I, it's a real issue, and you're going to repeal it. Well, that'll be something it. that we take look, up and consider as we look at the replacement part yeah. uh, of the bill down the road. Well, look, at, I, I appreciate you, you being here. Uh, and at first, when I, when I heard about all this, I, I was kind of, I thought it was unbelievable that this was the first item that you were going to take up and that you were going to do it in such a closed and restrictive way. But on the other hand, I've been thinking about it. And you know what? It's, it's actually a good thing that uh, you're here. And it's actually a good thing that you're bringing this issue up because I think uh, the American people uh, uh, will have an opportunity right at the outset of this new Congress to see the clear differences between Democrats and Republicans. Well, the gentleman yield. If I could finish my statement, sure. Mr. Oh, okay. Chairman. Democrats believe that uh, insurance companies should be prohibited from discriminating on the basis of pre-existing pre conditions. Republicans do not. No. Uh, uh, Democrats, excuse me, sir, Democrats, with the gentleman yield, that's, that, that's simply not, not true. true. You know what? You, when you, you, um, you, you, opposed, you opposed the bill. Democrats it was in our alternatives. That, that, that we should close the donut hole and reduce prescription drug prices for our seniors. Republicans do not. Democrats believe that young people should be allowed to remain on their parents' health insurance until they're 26. Republicans do not. I, I got to tell you, I can't tell you how many people, how many parents have come up to me and s said how grateful they are that they can keep their kids on their insurance until they're 26. It is a big deal. It is a big deal for a lot of parents all throughout this country. Um, Democrats believe that we should provide tax breaks to small businesses and subsidies to low-income Americans to help them pay for health insurance. Uh, for their workers and their families. Republicans do not. You know, for, for 80 years, uh, Americans of both political parties have talked about the need to address health care. In the last Congress, we actually did it. Uh, we held dozens of hearings and markups, and to, to Dr. Fox's uh, uh, issue that she raised, you know, um, the fact that the bill that we voted on here was not exactly the same bill that we introduced uh, at the outset in, in, in the House, um, I mean, that, the legislative process, that's the way legislative process works. I mean, when, when, a, when a bill goes to a conference committee and comes back, it's different from the original bill we, we, we voted on here. But we, we actually did something. We listened to hundreds of witnesses, uh, expert witnesses in, in the Congress. Uh, we considered hundreds of amendments. Uh, the bill was passed, notwithstanding incredible obstructionism by the Republicans, uh, on, on the floor of the House and the Senate. And now, in the first order of legislative business, the Republicans want to take that work and just toss it in the trash. And how many hearings have you held on the impact of repeal? Zero. How many markups have you had? Zero. Uh, and, um, you know, and, and most shockingly to me, given all the rhetoric that we have heard, again, from the new speaker, and from the new speaker, uh, from the majority leader, from everybody about this new open process, how many amendments? That's what, you're, that's what you're advocating. Um, you know, look, uh, instead of a thoughtful, reasoned legisla legislative language to address this, you provide us with a press release. Go, these, are, these are our goals. You know, let's take care of everybody. But no details. No details. 
You fought the Patients' Bill of Rights. The Republicans fought the enactment of the Patients' Bill of Rights for as long as I've been here. On all the issues to protect consumers, uh, and to, uh, you've been on the other side. And here we are, you know, I mean, I'm sure the insurance companies are thrilled that you're here talking about repeal. But I think, um, I think this is, I think this, is, this issue here defines the differences between the two parties. And, I, and so is, is, is kind of, on one hand, as frustrated as I am is that you're trying to undo something that helps a lot of my constituents and helps people all across the country. I'm actually kind of glad that you're showing your hand up front. I mean, there is a clear difference here. And, um, and I look forward to fighting you on this. Gentlemen, because I think you're on the wrong side of history. I yield to the I chairman. thank my friend for yielding. And let me say, uh, I, I wondered if my friend was here when I uh, offered my opening remarks. Um, I, I think I may have been a little bit late. Okay, I, I think that you were here, actually, when I offered my opening remarks, during which I spoke specifically about our commitment to five specific proposals that would deal with the issue of driving the cost of health insurance down. And they included a number of the provisions that my friend has made in his written statement that he has there. And I also think it's important to note, as we talk about this process, that last summer, as Mr. Upton said, there was a commitment that was made. That commitment was made was that we would immediately have an up or down vote on repeal of the measure that was signed in March. That commitment was made last summer before the election. And so it should come as absolutely no surprise. Now let me say about the process. Let me yeah. say about the process. It was very clear also that we said that if we were to come to majority, we would have a more open process. It has been uh, less than 24 hours since we've taken the oath of office. We indicated that this measure would be considered immediately. And I have introduced HRES 9, which calls on these committees that have jurisdiction to immediately proceed with dealing with the five issues that we've talked about and other ways to ensure that the needs that we all share must be met are in fact met. And so I, I will just say that the gentleman points to a number of issues that we want to deal with in a bipartisan way, which was not done in the 111th Congress. Well, I, I thank I, my friend I, for I, well, I thank the gentleman for his comments. Uh, a, a couple of things. First of all, um, yeah, it's been less than 24 hours, and uh, it's been pretty restrictive. You know, emergency rules committee meeting. Um, well, the you, 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 that, you, I don't know you, if you heard what I, I, what I, I said what on said, that. We, it, it, at the beginning of this yeah. week, at the beginning of this week, we informed the membership of this committee, minority and majority, that we would in right. fact be holding this meeting, and we are acting as expeditiously right. as possible we, because we believe that this issue you. needs to be addressed. And we have, and we have, the three gentlemen before us advocating for a piece of legislation that has had no hearings. Nobody's had any input, Republican or Democrat. And you're all advocating for a closed process to bring it up on the floor. So, yeah, no, you've been in for 24 hours and already you've broken your promise. Uh, so, you know, I don't, I'm not sure what that means for the rest of the session, but, you know, we'll, we'll wait and see. We'll just wait and see. Yeah, and I'm, I'm looking forward to that. The other thing is, uh, you know, again, for the, for the checks that have gone out uh, on the, with, you know, to, to help the people deal with the donut hole, um, are you going to ask them to send the money back? I mean, is that, is that the way you envision this? I mean, is, would you ask these senior citizens to forego it, or would, would, they, would, it, would, would they retroactively have to send back the money that, uh, that they got to help offset the cost of their drugs? Um, how, how do you, how, Mr. King, uh, how, Mr. Do you, how do you see this working? Mr. McGovern, having uh, drafted the legislation to repeal Obamacare and the dawn in the middle of the night after it had passed that night on March 21st or whatever that date was. I contemplated a lot of these things throughout the summer as I was gathering signatures on the discharge petition, bipartisan signatures on the discharge petition that reached 173. A lot of questions came up and that was one of them. And drafting this repeal legislation is one of them on how it does affect those things that would come to a halt. As Chairman Upton said, it can't be anticipated because the timing of the repeal can't be predicted. But what the legislation contemplates, as I understand this and as I looked into it, is that when and if the president should sign the repeal legislation, then things come to a halt as of that moment. So, so we can't really back. lead this thing far enough to make this prediction. So there wouldn't be, but in my hope. view, a call to go back right. and gather any of those funds that have been distributed. But that would also mean that the, the, the way the, the bill is written is that the relief in the donor hole get, gets bigger and bigger as years go by. So the relief would stop. 
The bill is written so that all things stop at the oh, moment of its so enactment. It would, it, so the, the, that would stop. But that does not mean that there wouldn't be replacements in place right. to address that subject matter written well, by and, a responsible and why, Congress. And, that, and what's, what's curious is I'm looking at the, you know, your, your press release on the statement of principles. It doesn't mention anything about the donut hole. I'm just curious. You, you know, you mention a lot of other things, but you don't mention that. I mean, why? Well, Mr. McGovern, you've, uh, you've identified about four popular components that uh, can be potentially defended within this entire 2,500-page bill. And that's where the focus of this discussion has yeah. been, and I've listened to the points that you've delivered here, and I'd just suggest in summary that uh, and it, rather than you know, putting an agenda before Republicans, I would say that Republicans are for a constitutional bill that is fiscally responsible that protects the patient's rights, relates, patient's relationship with the doctors, and that allows for free markets and constitutional, not an unconstitutional right. socialized medicine bill, which was what I, I, I see. Pre I appreciate your comments, Mr. King, but basically what you've given me is a, is a sound bite. Uh, and what we hear is you're saying, let's repeal this bill. We don't have a replacement. Trust us. Mr. Dreyer is introducing legislation asking you to look into this. You know, but there's no replacement. There's no specifics. There's nothing. So here we are. Close pro beginning the process, close process. And I, think, I, and I think if you got your wish, um, a lot of people would be hurt by it. Will I, the gentleman yield? I'm happy to yield. Oh, thank you. I, this is another argument that I've made for a long time. And uh, I have resisted the idea of putting repeal and replace together. Because if you do that, that interrupts the process of having an actually clean process where all members of this Congress can weigh in. If, let's just say, leadership presented a replacement bill that was attached at the hip as a Siamese twin to the repeal bill, then that list of components that Mr. Dreyer listed in the opening statement, there would be members in this Congress that would say, well, there are five things on Mr. Dreyer's proposal. I don't like one of them, or I want another one. And the list gets so long, you end up with another backroom deal. We want to do replacement in a legitimate process through the gentlemen's committees so that actually legislation can be built with the wisdom of the new freshman class coupled with the experience of the members of this Congress. That's why replacement can't be part of the well, I, I appreciate it, but I'll, I'll just close by saying this is not a legitimate process. This is an illegitimate process. Um, you know, no hearings, nothing. And we're going to the floor under a closed process. That's, that's, that's not the way this should be done. I yield back my time. Thank you very much, Mr. McGovern. Mr. Nugent. Thank you. Mr. Hastings. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And um, I thank you and our colleagues on the uh, committee for um, uh, your patience with regard uh, to time and in this matter today. I especially am um, grateful for our, our witnesses and our colleagues uh, uh, that are here to testify and apologize to them if um, in the next few minutes I spend um, uh, time uh, inordinate uh, with uh, what uh, some might consider to be particularly uh, important uh, because all of our matters are important and they have just as many important things to say. I associate myself with the remarks of uh, Ms. Slaughter, and I associate myself with the uh, remarks of Mr. McGovern. Um, I do believe that we're embarking uh, down a path uh, that will ultimately redound um, uh, to our detriment, and I wish to correct just a, a few things along the way. Mr. King, obviously you and I, as our friends and ideological opposites, um, have fundamental disagreements on um, uh, what can and should be done. Footnote right there. Ms. Slaughter pointed out something to me last night uh, that you all need to get rid of uh, in my judgment. She didn't say that. I'm saying in my judgment something you need to get rid of. Every member in this um, uh, chamber right now um, was elected, and the Constitution um, immediately establishes a Congress made up of a House and a Senate. I don't then need any other provision other than that I got elected to legislate. And so when you all start, and I'll be among the first perhaps to test you in court, when you start down the path that you're not going to receive my proposed legislation, because I didn't cite to a specific amendment in the United States Constitution, which I revere and you revere, um, uh, then I'm going to tell you that I cite to the fact that I got elected and I'm going to move on and then we'll go to court 
and see whether or not this junk y'all are talking about is going to stand up. Uh, but that's for another day. Um, if I heard you correctly, Mr. King, then it is that we probably shouldn't have legislated health care in the first place because we didn't have the constitutional power to do so. Now, I don't want to put words in your mouth. You tell me what you meant. Um, Mr. Hastings, I believe that this bill that is the law of the land today that's set before us to, and proposed to be repealed completely violates the Constitution in probably four different categories. The most obvious one is the, it violates the Commerce Clause. And it, there, are, there have always been babies born with our, the Interstate Commerce Clause. There have always been babies born within the states who lived, breathed, and died without crossing state lines and without accessing any health care whatsoever, let alone purchasing health insurance. They would be compelled to buy insurance underneath this policy, expanding the Commerce Clause to a point beyond the imagination of the Founding Fathers or any legitimate reading of the Commerce Clause. And so under those conditions, this violation of the Commerce Clause, if it's allowed to stand, does allow the federal government to direct every activity of our lives. That's the most egregious violation. I believe it also violates the Equal Protection Clause of the Constitution, where, and that, as far as I know, has not been litigated at this point. It has not. And uh, Florida would be a state that's aware of that. There were special provisions set up under the Medicare Advantage that allowed some of the people in Florida to keep their, Medi Med their and Advantage California policies. And some other And so I would argue that that violates the Equal Protection Clause in the same way that the formerly in the bill Cornhusker kickback violated the Equal Protection Clause. I would argue that there are not the enumerated powers to grant Congress the authority to pass legislation like this, and I believe that it violates the Tenth Amendment of the Constitution. This is a states' rights issue. That's where I stand, okay. and I hope that we're able to resolve this through the litigation process, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't leave the resolution of this to the courts because in the end, as you know, the Constitution you have in your hand well, puts the, the power in the people. Well, whether, and we're the people's house. Whether you leave it to the courts or not, the simple fact of the matter is it's on a path uh, to the United States Supreme Court. And certain provisions, whether your repeal were to be successful or not, um, and certain provisions as they exist are likely to be tested in court. Uh, the chair referred uh, to Judge Hudson's uh, decision. Um, uh, there are two other federal decisions that are in disagreement with Judge Hudson's decision, and the chair notably did not uh, uh, reference those uh, decisions. So the courts are going to be in conflict in their interpretation, just as you and I are. I don't think this violates the Commerce Clause at all. I don't think it violates Article I, Section 8 of, uh, of the Constitution. And I do read the Constitution to mean uh, when you say promote the general welfare on um, uh, that uh, matters of this consequence and countless others come under that heading and therefore i can't ignore um uh, some facts let me turn to but, but would the uh, gentleman yield on uh, that point sure. I, I just i just think it's important that we understand that the the language in the constitution that says promote the general welfare means the general welfare of the United States, not the general welfare of the individual population within the United well, States. Where, 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 the, where the powers derive from in the Constitution? The people. Indeed. But the general welfare of the United States is the, the condition by which we can, we can achieve our own success and happiness, not we'll, impose it upon us by the federal government. We'll, we'll continue but, to law, uh, conduct our law school seminar and, 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 I, and I may I also ask if you would be willing to respond to the point that I made that about interstate commerce, about a baby born within a state that accesses no health care, crosses no state lines, lives and dies, how would they be covered under an interstate commerce clause in the federal government? Yeah, I, I think uh, the legislation as proposed did exactly what you said, and that is uh, to look out for all Americans, and that would be that child that didn't cross on our state lines as well. What you would have, the Commerce Clause, be read to mean that insurance companies, for example, can cross state lines. That's uh, one of your mantras, uh, so that they can sell across state lines. And it will leave a state like mine and a district like mine and Debbie Wasserman Schultz and Kathy Casters and Dan Webster's and Nugent's districts, where we have high incidences of uh, retired persons. Um, and people, lots of them in Debbie's and my district, over 80, 
uh, that would be left uninsured because we've seen it on automobile insurance. We've seen it on wind insurance. When we had hurricanes, insurance companies go elsewhere. And I'm not mad with them. They have a right to pursue their bottom line. But they will cherry pick and therein lies yet another Commerce Clause the gentleman yield. of flaw. I'm not going to yield now because I do have a number of questions and I don't want to take all of the time of my colleagues. Last night, a dear friend of mine and someone that Debbie Wasserman Schultz knows and Kathy Castor does as well, and I don't know whether my colleagues, um, uh, uh, Mr. Webster and Mr. Nugent, knew Catherine Kelly. But Catherine um, uh, died last night. She supported me in 1992, and she did so for the reason that I made a speech in West Palm Beach that she attended. And I advocated universal health care. And she came up to me. I didn't know her from anybody. And she said, you know something, young man? I'm going to support you because I believe in universal health care, too. Among the premises that I sought office in 1992 had to do with establishing universal health care. And um, uh, I had as a subset uh, the great need that we had and have in this nation uh, for people uh, to live in adequate housing, uh, followed closely, of course, as all of us do, by the need to educate our children. Catherine had good health care because she was wealthy. Her husband had good health care uh, for uh, the same reason. She labored in nursing care in a variety of forms for the last two years of her life. I last communicated with her six months ago when she had uh, undergone inhalation uh, or therapy. I don't know what her medical bills were, and it's not my business. I'm pretty sure that they were rather considerable. But I do know this, that Catherine would have given her last dime to ensure that the least of us in this great America would have the same opportunities that she did as she exited life. Um, and toward that end, uh, that's just a slight memorial uh, to the loss of a great American, as many of us have had, who advocated um, uh, for more than what we did uh, in the measure uh, that was passed in the last session of Congress. Now then, for 48 years, I've had good health care. I began my practice with a lawyer that allowed that both of us understood that one of us could die, and we wanted the other and his or her family to be protected. And so what we did was we got a buy and sell agreement and had and insurance specialists come in and set up, even in our poverty days, all uh, plans for us. I then went on to become a state judge, and I had Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida, good health care. I went on to be a federal judge. I had good health care. I was thrown off the federal bench, and I had enough money to buy Blue Cross Blue Shield again. And then came here, and guess what? I still have Blue Cross Blue Shield of Florida, and I have good health care. I come at this from the standpoint of I'm all right. My mama had good health care, not because of what she could afford, but she had an only son who could afford to provide for her, as I did uh, before she died. She had Medicare, and Medicare helped an awful lot, but it did not pay the thousands of dollars of bills um, uh, for home health care and a number of other measures along those lines. Now, some of our colleagues, uh, specifically, a couple of them are in the room. Um, uh, Representative Welch, um, Eshu, uh, Ms. Caps, I didn't see her here yet. Uh, yeah, there's Lois Jane uh, Harmon and Jan Schakowsky. I saw her over there, and Bruce ba uh, Braley, and several of us are co-sponsors of legislation that they have order, uh, uh, offered uh, that would include um, uh, the elimination of lifetime limits, the coverage of individuals up to 26, the requirement that individuals not be denied pre-existing conditions, and the requirement that preventive care be provided free of charge, including the provision that recently took effect providing preventive uh, services for seniors. Um, Mr. Upton, do you deem it unreasonable 
that that measure could go forward and then the things that you and the resolution as offered by the chair or could be undertaken? Well, let me, let me just say, uh, particularly as I look at the very talented and thoughtful members on the Energy and Commerce Committee, many of them who you just cited uh, and I consider as my dear friends, uh, as we look at uh, a bill to replace uh, the repeal of this bill, uh, that that certainly would be considered uh, in the full and open debate before the, not only the health subcommittee, but the full committee as well. Uh, something that I would note did not happen in the passage of the House bill because they skipped the health subcommittee. It went directly to the full committee. Uh, but I would think that Mrs. Capps, who is on, uh, you are on health, right? Well, you haven't decided actually that the uh, uh, ranking member Waxman, I don't think has decided yet who the ranking member is or, or the membership of that uh, subcommittee, and we're in the uh, process of doing that now on the Republican side. Uh, but I would think that under the fair and open process that we're going to have, that that would be an amendment that would be offered, and, and we'll, we'll see what happens. But I, I think that the, you, there'll, there'll be do debate. Do you think it should be made in order? Well, uh, uh, yeah, in committee, ab absolutely, uh, that's going uh, to happen. Well, it's we have that be, opportunity. not going to be stifled, and I would note that a number, if not all of those provisions, at least most of them were, in fact, in Chairman Dreyer's statement of things that he would support. So McCain. as as a basis of what how we would replace this bill, mm -hmm. uh, I think that those are certainly building blocks that many, most right. of those, if not all. Then reclaiming my time, where is the data that you all have reflecting that what has passed and what is the law of the land as we continue the debate on repeal? And you style or uh, your repeal uh, measure, sort of a, a stab at the legislation. You, you call it job killing. I forget the exact name. But it's, it's the repeal of patient protection and affordable, what is it called? Job killing something or another. But the job killing part uh, continues to stick out at me. Where, 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 where have the jobs been killed? Where, where, where did you see we'll be glad to get We'll be glad to get you that evidence for the record before the day is out. All right, then do that. And will you also get for me the jobs that were made as a result well, of the it, it, I would note that in my testimony, I talked about the, the nearly 400,000 jobs that Speaker Pelosi said would come out, come about almost automatically. I, I know that the 15,000 jobs that are in the bill for the IRS, I don't think they've come yet, but I've... I've not seen a great number of jobs uh, to the 400,000. I've seen that the a great predicted. number of loss that you can attribute Ooh. to the health care. You all told Coming. us, you all told us back when this bill passed that the sky was going to fall. Well, it didn't. It did. And we still are alive and well. That's why we and take the tunnel talk, now? You talk in here as if the American public, all of them, are in agreement with everything that you say. There are many things not to like in this bill, and there are things to like in this bill. And there are many people in America who like a lot of this bill, and determining who likes it the most and who likes it the least is um, of something that I gather that all of us can do. But let's go to the neutral, and I asked about this in last night's Rules Committee hearing, the neutral CBO process. And Mr. Chairman, I'm going to ask um, uh, that the January 6th um, uh, reference from Doug El Elmendorf of the Congressional Budget Office uh, be made uh, a part of this record. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I only wish to read one paragraph. CBO has not yet developed a detailed estimate of the budgetary impact of repealing that legislation. And that's the question that I raised last night by us going forward without having a, CBA, a CBO score. Although it is working with the staff of the Joint Committee on Taxation to complete such an estimate, in the near future, because congressional deliberations on HR 2 could begin very soon, CBO is providing in this letter a less detailed preliminary analysis of that legislation. CBO and JCT estimated that the March 10th health care legislation would reduce budget deficits over the 2010-2019 period and in subsequent years. Consequently, we expect that repealing that legislation would increase budget deficits. 
Now, a lot of talk goes on around here about budget deficits. Do you all agree that the repeal of this legislation will increase budget deficits? Mr. King, you don't. CBO is wrong. Gentleman would yield. I just, I'm just starting a list and I've only begun to go on through it, but this legislation has, the legislation that's set to be repealed before this new 112th Congress, of which I think the sky actually did fall uh, on the four people here, it has tax increases in it that are calculated into the funding that you're discussing, and it has a $532 billion cut to Medicare services in the country that's also calculated in there. I don't know all the assumptions of CBO. I know those two things. So I think that needs to be taken into account rather than just wave the paper. So you are on the 10 years tax benefits, six years uh, uh, tax hikes, six years um, uh, benefits that uh, Cantor wrongly asserts. Um, and if you look at the charts that CBO utilizes, you will find um, uh, that that estimate is wrong. Again, the, in, in, to show you what you're getting ready to do and why you should listen to Mr. McGovern and Ms. Slaughter and me and Mr. Polis, I'm sure, when he talks. Let's, let's tell you what you're getting ready to do um, uh, in my state. I want Mr. Webster and Mr. Nugent, um, uh, and Ms. Wasserman Schultz and Ms. Castor to pay particular attention. Without this Affordable Health Care Act, what we will have is 83,300 young adults will lose their insurance coverage. More than 8.7 million residents of Florida with private insurance cover coverage would suddenly find themselves vulnerable again to having lifetime limits placed on how much insurance companies will spend on their health. Nearly 1.1 million people in Florida alone are at risk of losing their insurance. Nearly 1 million residents of Florida would not know if they are receiving value for their health insurance premium dollars as insurers in the state would no longer be required to spend at least 80 to 85 percent of premium dollars on health care rather than CEO salaries, bonuses, and corporate profits. New insurance plans would no longer be required to cover recommended preventive services like mammograms and flu shots without cost sharing. Nearly 3.2 million seniors in Florida would have Medicare coverage or be forced to enter copay. Nearly 3.2 million seniors in Florida who have Medicare coverage would have to pay extra if they want to stay healthy by getting checkups regularly. 182,672 Medicare patients would see significantly higher prescription drug costs, and you all stand accused repeatedly of not filling the donut hole, this legislation starts by filling 50% of it and could benefit those persons who are my constituents uh, that are in that donut hole, and now you would repeal it and say we start all over again. I don't know when it is you propose to put it back where it is now, but I gather you do intend. Florida would not receive additional resources to crack down on unreasonable insurance premium increases. Florida would not receive additional funds to plan for a health insurance exchange. Maybe they won't have to. They just will have lost the money that was provided if you all decide not to have one. Florida would not receive funds to support a co consumer assistance program, and 190 employers would not, 190 employers would not be receiving help um, uh, from the early retiree insurance. Let's don't stop there. Let's go nationwide. 142,000, again, um, in the donut hole in my state. 293 already signed up pre-existing condition insurance situation. The million dollar crackdown that I, I pointed out to you, that has already been set forth. Let's talk about grants in the state of Florida alone, and this is true in all of your states. Let's just talk about grants. Already, already, 26 million plus dollars in therapeutic discovery project programs and tax credit grants have been allocated. Other grants, a million and seven uh, uh, for demonstration projects to address health professionals' workforce needs. 3.4 million for tribal maternal infant and early child. This is already done. 
500,000 for aging and disability resource centers, 1.4 million for Medicare improvements for patients and providers, 2.1 million to strengthen public health infrastructure to improve health outcomes, 5.4 million in communities putting prevention to work grant awards. Mr. Chairman, I'm so glad you put cameras in the courtroom or uh, in the uh, here rules room. 600,000 to build epidemiology, and I'll get that word right, laboratory and health information systems capacity. 1.3 million, very much needed in Florida for HIV prevention and public health fund activities where we have already seen cutoffs that are causing people not to be able to get drugs to keep them alive. $3 million to implement the National Background Check Program for long-term health workers. $6.7 million for the Primary Care Residency Expansion Program. $2.1 million for advanced nursing education. $600,000 to expand physician's assistant training. $14.5 million to support capital development and health centers. $1.4 million for Medicare improvements. And I'll spare you the national details. Suffice it to say that they mirror what's happening in Florida. But what I want you to tell me is, if you are successful, and you're not going to be, but if you were successful, other than passing it here in the House of Representatives, which is your prerogative, and it goes to the Senate, and if you were fortunate enough to get senators crazy enough to sign on to this and send it to the president, and he caved, what would you say to all of those people, and how would we get that money back, and how would that not be a loss to the federal government? Well, again, as Mr. King said uh, earlier, no one's talking about taking away money that's already been, that's already been, the checks that have already been cut. Uh, and I hope Kathleen and, Sebelius hears that. She could get into a lot of check well, business. Well, <laughs> uh, but we, we are committed, all of us here, as well as uh, Dave Camp, uh, Chairman of the Ways and Means Committee, to come back with a plan that replaces the repeal. Uh, there are uh, most... Most members of Congress do support reform of health care. The question is, do you want the reform that passed uh, without amendment, we just took the Senate bill last, last year, was ramrodded do uh, down our throats, or do you want to come back and look at an open process where we can look at common ground to actually make improvements to the current system, as Chairman Dreyer indicated in his opening statement? That's where those of us here at this table today stand ready and prepared to move forward. Well, I think you will repeal in a manner that will hurt America's middle class and eliminate millions of American jobs in spite of what you say. And I believe that it explodes the um, federal deficit. It certainly does by the announced and already scored CBO score of at least $143 um, billion dollars. And I believe that there will be millions of people that would be affected um, uh, by this. Um, I would like to, at this time, yield um, uh, to the ranking member, Ms. Lord. I thank the gentleman for yielding. I thought that you asked a very uh, interesting and important question earlier in your enlightening testimony about how many jobs had been created since this health care bill went into effect. Uh, private employers since that time have added 935,000 jobs to their payrolls, and the health sector has added an additional 171,000 jobs. That's uh, for a job killer bill. Uh, it's not doing its job very well, is it? Not at all. Thank you, Madam Ms. Slaughter. And before I yield, Mr. Chairman, particularly for the members and young people all in this audience in the Rules Committee today, as you heard me say, those of you that were in the room, for 48 years I've had good insurance. I don't know how many of you have had good, bad, or indifferent insurance, but I would ask any member in here who has had insurance in the last 20 years, and if you have had it continuously for the last 20 years, as I have and as the chairman has, and others in the room may have. If you have had that insurance and you did not choose to increase your deductible or choose to have extracted from it benefits that you may have derived, one that they didn't get straight until just recently, for example, is dental care. One that they need to get on with is long-term and therapeutic of, uh, care 
uh, for individuals. But in the last 20 years, how many of you have had your insurance, health insurance, go down? Raise your hand. The point that I wish to make is health insurance was going up before this measure. I rather suspect that if we are not careful, health insurance will continue to go up if we let the insurance company bandits, and you tell them that's what I said they are, get away with this. Does the gentleman yield back? Yes, I do. Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. Mr. Woodall. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I appreciate the opportunity to, to be here today. This was a discussion that uh, I had throughout the, the past year, and, and one of the, in the spirit of full disclosure, I'm a co-sponsor of, of H, uh, HR2, a proud co-sponsor of HR2. Uh, down in the 7th District of Georgia, before March 30th of 2010, uh, we used to talk about solutions. We were talking about uh, health care costs uh, rising, as they have been over, over decades. Uh, we were talking about health care access. Uh, we were talking about some of the solutions that Republicans put in place in 1996 at the federal level uh, for, federal, uh, for federal plans. But the moment, uh, but the moment Obamacare passed on, on was signed into law on March 30, 2010, that discussion stopped. No more were we talking about uh, solutions. We were talking about repeal. Uh, my constituents were so alarmed, so disturbed by the, by the takeaway of freedom they had in their health care decisions and the takeaway of uh, the, the increase in, in, in tax dollars they were expending, uh, the entire discussion of productive solutions was completely uh, subsumed uh, by this new discussion of, of repeal and, and trying to get back to a, a level of status quo that we could again begin to find solutions from. I'd like to ask each you, I think I've heard you, you say, that you're committed to going back to that place where we were, that earnest search uh, for solutions, whether it be medical malpractice uh, uh, solutions, or whether it be access solutions, or, or whether it be uh, further ERISA uh, reforms. Is that, is that an accurate reflection of, of your, your commitment here today, not just your hope and your dream, but your commitment here today? That's a commitment of all of us. We made that clear from the very beginning. As, <clears throat> as the debate went on for months and months and went through the campaign, it became clearer, I think, to, to us here and we certainly were hearing from constituents in our districts and from people throwing rocks at town hall meetings and, and so forth that uh, Ms. Slaughter brought up, that they didn't like this legislation. It's not that they didn't want the old status quo, they wanted improvements, but they didn't like what, what we are calling Obamacare. It's job-killing legislation. I talked to small businesses in round tables and one-on-one, -on -one, and they told me they're not making decisions to hire. They're looking at this law. They're looking at the absurd provisions that I outlined in my opening comments, where if you're sitting around 50 employees, you're making decisions to not hire. That, those are not the kind of decisions that we want our business to be making. We want them to put Americans back to work. So we believe that you can get a better solution if you can clean the table of this job-killing, flawed legislation and then go forward and start taking steps, some of which have been outlined and discussed here today, that will help lower the cost of health care and allow people to have affordable insurance. So we have a commitment, and I think... Uh, Chairman Dreyer has a resolution that will, in fact, address, uh, direct us to take that up. Well, I very much, uh, I very much appreciate that. That's Mr. King. Uh, thank you, Mr. Woodall. I, in response to that, I, I wanted to express uh, how we view this going forward. I just think it's universal among Republicans that we want to make improvements in the health care policy once we get down to the foundation that you referenced in your statement. And uh, I was one of a number of authors that joined together to, to draft and establish a Declaration of Health Care Independence. We put it right on a document that looks like the Declaration of Independence. It has at least 100 signatures of the members of the 111th Congress. We took that document out and read it alongside Mr. Dreyer's resolution on going forward. It's consistent with Mr. Dreyer's resolution. So not only do we intend to follow down through those lines, we have 100 members of the 111th Congress that have signed a document that's consistent with that. And I would just add another point to this, that uh, I would submit that I don't think it's necessary for us to go forward with a comprehensive reform or repeat replace bill. Uh, I think we can do a lot of these changes individually, one at a time, stand alone, so the American people can hear the debate, weigh in on it one at a time, and not have to make a decision on a long package. But that'll be a decision that's perhaps made by others, but I wanted to make that point. Thank you. The, uh, 
uh, one of my commitments uh, was to work to bring the simplest bills possible to the floor, and I'm thankful to the uh, to the uh, chairman of the rules committee for for bringing this very simple this very simple one line one page uh, piece of legislation to the floor. I was struck by Mr. Hastings' list of all the things that uh, the Obamacare legislation was going to to do for Florida. And I confess, even though we're neighbors across the border, uh, Mr. Hastings, I'm I'm not aware of all that it does for Florida. Well, I am now after that educational after that educational bit. Uh, but we in Georgia are involved in a lawsuit. Uh, in, in to overturn Obamacare. And as a, as a strong states' rights uh, proponent, uh, we're not giving up on health care in Georgia. We have tremendous solutions going on in our state legislature, tremendous programs going on in our state legislature, but our state uh, has decided that, that, uh, that this piece of legislation is, is restrictive as opposed to uh, something that encourages uh, uh, oversight. Do you all see what uh, your solutions that will come forward down the road is as something that uh, we in a in a state's rights uh, location a place where we think we have our own good ideas that will en will encourage us or do you see more federal solutions in store mr woodall i know that as as we look at the replacement side of health care as well as looking at the many individual trouble spots in the existing bill that did pass uh, last last uh winter i'm going to be asking the governors uh, to be very actively uh, engaged with our committee and subcommittee, that they come and tell us precisely what is happening in their state of Georgia or Florida or Michigan or California or New Jersey, New York, et cetera. I want the governors to weigh in uh, in terms of the, the new burdens and how they're going to pay for the additional costs. One of the things that has not been mentioned today, of course, is the requirement that states take up or expand the Medicaid rolls uh, up to 133 percent of the poverty. And I, though I don't know tremendously uh, about your background, I know that states like mine, which has a, a big deficit issue and does not and will not raise taxes, all of a sudden they're going to, because Medicaid is a, a plan that has always been shared between the federal government and the states, how are the states going to cover uh, these, these uh, additional costs during these very difficult economic times. Again, my state, uh, 12, 13, 14 percent unemployment over the last three years. How are we going to do that? I want the governors to come tell us uh, exactly what these new burdens are going to do to their states. And I, as one that also supports states' rights, I think that's a very important integral part of where this Congress goes in terms of looking at legislation to replace the bill that I do predict will be repealed, at least in the House, next week. Mr. Woodall, would you yield just a moment? Be happy to yield, Mr. Hastings. Yeah. Did your research too, but won't go into the litany that I did. But just to help you along, 43,500 young adults in Georgia will lose their insurance. Five million residents of Georgia with private insurance will be vulnerable. Uh, again, 387,000 people in Georgia are at risk of losing their insurance. And 380,000 residents of Georgia would not know if they are receiving value because of um, all those um, well, issues. Reclaiming could, my time, Mr. Hastings. Go on and on. Re reclaiming my time. I know that you could. I wanted. I wanted to be preemptive. I'm. I'm grateful for that. And and I have. I don't doubt those figures in the in the least. And that's one of the things that's uh, great about coming from the the great state of Georgia. Uh, I've talked to some of those young people uh, who are now getting uh, what free insurance on their on their parents' policies. Uh, that was insurance that they were paying for. Uh, two years ago that they're now getting for free uh, today. And there, we can, there are smart folks in Georgia. I say I want to hire the best and the brightest Georgians I can find, but I, I can't get them up here because the best and the brightest Georgians want to stay in Georgia. And they know that when they get added to their parents' policy, they're not getting something for free. They're getting something they paid for two years ago, and now it's on the backs of somebody else. And i got to tell you, for all the regional distinctions we may have in this country, Georgians don't want to ride on the backs of anybody. We have one of your former colleagues, Nathan Deal, as our new governor, and we can solve our health care problems all by ourselves. And with all due respect to the very bright minds here at this table, uh, we're looking for them to help Governor Deal solved these problems, not to mandate solutions upon us, and I appreciate your commitment and, to do that. And Mr. Woodall, as you look at that specific provision, I would note that that was in the Republican proposal uh, that most Republicans voted for in the last Congress, uh, the idea that, that children up to the age of 25, I, I know uh, in essence the same, would qualify under their parents' plan. 
there. I tremendously appreciate uh, uh, that commitment, and of all the things I've heard on health care over the past uh, nine months, uh, today has been the most encouraging. So I, I thank you all, and I yield back. Mr. Thank you very much, Mr. Well, Mr. Paulus. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I appreciate your initial outline of the uh, five areas uh, for improvement. I think there's ample ground for uh, bipartisan cooperation on some of those, certainly with regard to the 1099 fix. Now, uh, we did bring that forward last July uh, on a suspension. I supported it, unfortunately. Uh, it did die with, with uh, insufficient support from the other side of the aisle. So we're glad to see that now there is support for that. I know there's obviously an issue of how to pay for it. Uh, with regard to elements of the bill that uh, could be conceived as um, uh, destroying jobs, I think that's a critical piece to fix. The President is on board with fixing that. I've also consistently supported competition across state lines, and I'm, I'm hopeful that there might be some opportunity to work together with regard uh, to that. Now, I understand, uh, having heard why this is coming so quickly, I think uh, there was a commitment made. This should happen soon upon the start of the new Congress. Uh, I, you know, I, maybe that's a week or two weeks or three weeks. It's probably not a month or two months or three months, but it's sometime uh, soon. I'm, I'm glad we're able to receive a preliminary Congressional Budget Office score. Now, obviously, there's a little bit of a leap of trust here when you're telling us, well, don't worry, some of the good things we're going to find a way to, to do, and I'll get into House Resolution 9 uh, in a moment. But the one piece that I think I'm, I'm some really shocked and surprised is not part of this, because even if we act quickly, uh, is the offsets uh, for the $230 billion that this uh, would increase the deficit over, over 10 years. So uh, my question is, first, A, why does this not include offsets? So this is a deficit-neutral bill. And two, do we have your commitment, if this bill passes, for your committees to identify where this $230 billion is coming from so that this does not increase the deficit? I, I just let me answer the the second part of that. Uh, I know that our committee uh, is going to be looking at, uh, and uh, as I have sat down with a, a couple of the members of the administration uh, in in the new year, uh, and as I've talked to them a little bit about the budget that they're going to be proposing now in, in mid February, we're going to be looking in every department and agency to look look for savings. Uh, uh, I, th I thought uh, that the president's proposal was very reasonable in terms of a pay freeze uh, for all, uh, a COLA freeze, I should say, uh, for all new, for all federal employees uh, over the next two years. I think maybe in the past uh, some of those proposals may have been offered as a former member of the uh, of a Republican administration who worked at OMB. Uh, often I know some of those budget requests that come up, particularly when it's a different party, uh, would be dead on arrival. Uh, we're going to be looking at all of the president's proposals to, to save money, and, and I've instructed uh, members on, on my side, on the Republican side, to in fact go visit the agencies and see where we can find budget savings, and we'll, we'll see where they, t they total up. Hey, I I think, uh, you know, we are, I welcome that. Those of us who care a lot about the deficit welcome that. I, I, I worry that as an initial out-of-the-gate bill, uh, we have what is uh, really the most expensive one-page bill in the history of Congress. We have a $230 billion bill as a one-page bill. Uh, the first $230 billion you identify in savings, and I'm hopeful and I wish you well, we're going to come up with ideas too, will basically just go to pay for this bill. I mean, the money above that will then go to reduce the deficit and, and fund any other programs that you're looking to fund. Uh, we certainly wish you well in that regard. I just wish that is part of this initial effort, consistent with uh, CutGo and consistent with the rules package, there was an offset uh, with regard to this. But we'll, we will wish you well. And of course, just keep in mind that the first $230 billion in cuts that you come up with is simply to pay for this one-page bill. Above and beyond that, uh, we uh, have to make a dent in the, uh, in the deficit. Um, I also wanted to bring up kind of you know what we are going to replace this with. I was just looking at House Resolution 9. And um, I guess, you know, there's, there's a number of things in there that have broad bipartisan support. I mean, providing people with pre-existing conditions access to affordable health care coverage, that's something that we accomplish in this bill, and we look forward to other ways of accomplishing that. Preserving a patient's ability to keep their health care plan, lowering health care premiums, one that we feel very strongly about, which is increasing the number of insured Americans. I'm very happy that, that that's in there. That's something that uh, we feel very strongly about. The, uh, 
Uh, one a short, very shortcoming in the resolution, though, and I'll, I guess I'll address this to, to our chairman if, if he um, doesn't mind answer, is why uh, these are all or conditions rather than and conditions. After 11, the instructions of the committee, it says eliminate duplicative government programs and wasteful spending, right. and then or, which therefore applies to all of them, do not accelerate the insolvency of entitlement programs. So the gentleman yield on that. I'm I, I will in, a, in just a moment. I'll I'm going to yield to you. Why that is. The, the um, so so the worry obviously is that one of them, for instance, is protected doctor-patient right. relationship. So technically, well, let me, they could say we pass we we protect the doctor-patient relationship. That's all we accomplish. Let me let me just explain. Sure. And I thank my friend for yielding. Um, as we see, we have three committees represented here. There is a fourth committee, the Ways and Means Committee. Many of these items fall under the jurisdiction of different committees, and that's the reason that OR was used, because some items relating to tort reform obviously will be addressed by the Judiciary Committee and not by the Education and Workforce and the Energy and Commerce Committee. And so that's the reason that OR is there. And so it is uh, assumed that all of these items uh, plus are going to be addressed and any other, yep. any other proposal. I mean, in, in, in introducing... Uh, HRES 9, it was my goal to ensure that we explore every possible way to ensure that we can drive the cost of health insurance down for every American. I thank my friend for yielding. Thank you. And I would, I would simply suggest uh, an alternate instruction that gave the appropriate areas of jurisdiction instructions to the appropriate committee. So instructed the Ways and Means Committee A, B, and C. Instructed the Judiciary Committee A. Instructed the Education and Labor Committee, you know, D, E, and F. Uh, it would be possible to accomplish that, uh, which would give more peace of mind and I think uh, let people know a little bit more explicitly that these were and conditions rather than just one of the above satisfying. Well, if the gentleman further yield, the mm -hmm. first paragraph actually says, uh, House legislation proposing changes to existing law within each committee's jurisdiction with provisions yeah. that. And so that. That part is fine, but the problem is they're all or, 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 so compliance right. and that's one because, of that, And that is because... Yeah items fall within the jurisdiction of different committees, and that's, that's the reason. Obviously, uh, well, the issues that are, as I said, tort reform is not going to be addressed by Mr. Klein's committee, and that's the reason the OR is there. Well, we certainly look forward to seeing the legislative result of right. these instructions, right. which is obviously where the rubber meets the road, but it wouldn't... I think common sense here obviously prevails, and I know that my friend does not I, believe that we are I would just, going to if come I forward might with a measure that interject would in one a, of these items. And I would note that Chairman Emeritus Dingle uh, from the Energy and Commerce is here. We would be glad to have that jurisdiction with the Energy and Commerce if yeah. you'd like to... To, to do that. No, no, no. The, the, the key element is that, respectively, each committee and, will do all of the areas try. indicated under and the their gentleman further, let me, let me just say that this is the language that the parliamentarian right. provided to sure. us in drafting HRES 9, and uh, it's clearly understood that these are all items that will be addressed. Thank you for clarifying that. Um, with regard to it has been tossed around, the, the language uh, – job killing, and I think in the opening remarks, I think it was both Mr. Klein and Mr. Upton addressed... It's referring the, to the title of the bill. Isn't that the title of the bill? It, it is. <laughs> uh, I think there, both of you hit upon, or one of you hit upon, I can't recall which, the, the employer mandate. Which one of you referred to that? I think it was Mr. Klein. Um, now, you know, I think we all value, you know, intellectual consistency and honesty. So my question with regard to the employer mandate, uh, Mr. Klein, is, is the employer mandate... Um, so high as to discourage employment, or is it, in fact, so low as to encourage companies to drop coverage? It is, it's going to be a choice. You're, you're posing the correct, the question actually correctly. It's going to be a choice that businesses are going to look at. My, the example that I've been talking about is you're, you're a small business sitting at 49 or 50. You're going to look at the cost of going from 50 to 51 and there the costs are very high to do that. It's going to cost you over $40,000. So you make a decision to not hire that additional person. Well, That's to, a job-killing decision. To, to be clear, most, most companies of 50 employees already have benefits. I was a small businessman before I came here. Companies had 7 people, 12 people, 15 people. They had that to begin with. So you're referring to companies that employ 49 people and don't provide benefits to their employees that are affected on the margin. Um, with regard to companies that are 70 people, 80 people, 100 people. They may, they may not be providing the, the insurance exactly as dictated by the health care law. They may be providing some. We've seen already the examples where you had these uh, mini-med programs 
that part of the 222 waivers that Secretary Sebelius has already had to give to businesses. And to be clear, again, not at levels exactly indicated by law, but rather at minimal levels indicated by law. Obviously, uh, that is a minimal package that would be required in most uh, benefits programs that people receive exceed that already. It's simply not just checking a box and saying, by the way, we provide, you know, 50 bucks of coverage, and that, that, that is in no means a meaningful form of coverage. What all of this is about is reducing cost shifting that occurs in the economy, which is very inefficient with regard to how we pay for health care. Um, this is not a principle that is in any way, shape, or form contrary to the free market. What it is is a way of correcting for a market failure, and that is namely the problem of people mooching off of others, me making the personal decision. Somebody talked about, again, this mandate, I think it was Mr. King, and saying, why is it anybody else's business? I'm in my uh, castle or, or house, as it may be, and I choose not to be uh, have health care. Uh, why does that I impact anybody else? Uh, it, it, it does because if you have a heart attack and call 911, you're picked up by an ambulance, they bring you to a hospital, they operate on you if you need it, and guess what? Somebody pays for that. The costs of treating you are foisted onto somebody else, and therefore it becomes somebody else's business, that other person that you're paying more for that other person. Now, if you truly had a system where you didn't have that cost shifting, if you let that person die at the hospital or not even be picked up, that would be one thing, but we don't have that. We have a laws that require that if you have an emergency condition, the hospital is actually required to treat that. So um, I would ask, yeah, that? Mr. King, why uh, this is a, you know, why this is at all inconsistent with this concept of it in fact being somebody else's business who then is forced to pay for that person in the castle. Well, and the answer is because it's my statement is consistent with the Constitution. I'm making the point, and I and I said specifically that there have always been and likely always be babies that were born, lived, and died within the jurisdictions of the individual states who never cross a state line, access no health care, and therefore do not impact interstate commerce. Therefore, to compel someone who fits that category to buy an insurance policy cannot be yep. defined as is within the confines of the Interstate Commerce Clause. And Mr. Hastings didn't answer that. He devolved into policy and politics, but not the Constitution. Well, my challenge to you, Mr. No King, is you find that, you question, find that baby, that's why you, Judge find, you find that upheld. human being that has never accessed health care. And I will revise Sorry, my I'm opinion. only simplex. Can I? Uh, every human being in this country uh, has access to health care, even those who have religious objections to certain kinds of health care still access access uh, health care. It is uh, impossible uh, to, to live without access to health care uh, uh, in this country. It happens country. all the time. Uh, what's that? It happens all the time. It happens all It's happened forever in this country and in every country in the well, world. You find the baby that was not born to a uh, at a hospital or with a midwife uh, who did not receive inoculations. You, you find that baby and identify them, and I'll be happy to, to have that I hate that to tell discussion. you, but they show up in garbage cans around this country, sir. Uh, well, I sure hope not, uh, and, and, and it, it, that, that's a, that's, a, I, you, you show, show me, show me the, where somebody doesn't interact with health care, and we'll, we'll continue that discussion. Uh, I wanted to get back to the, the job, so-called, so-called job killing piece, uh, with regard to the, the employer mandate and my discussion with Mr., Mr. Klein. Um, I had asked initially, you know, because I've heard, again, arguments out of both sides of people's mouths that, A, the employer mandate is so onerous. Uh, that it will discourage employment, and B, that it is in fact so marginal and low that people will just drop coverage. Um, I asked you to clarify which one of those were true. Um, you didn't answer that directly, but you pointed to companies on the margin, going from 49 or 50, that the small subset of companies that perhaps don't already have benefits for their employees that might be impacted for this. Um, so I ask, is your concern about the job killing focused exclusively then in that small subset of companies that have 47, 48, 49 people, or are you also, do you also have concerns about the 100, 200 person company? Uh, and if so, I revise my initial question no, no, about I'm, whether you think it's too high or too low. It's not so much a question of too high or too low. We've used a voluntary system in this country for providing health care employers. It's something they choose to do. They choose to, to provide health care as an incentive to hire or retain employees. And we believe that that's their choice, and they ought to be able to choose to provide health care or not provide health care based on what is best for their business and not because Congress mandated that they had to provide that coverage. Yeah. And again, uh, this is my answer to that, and I'll, I'll be uh, completing my remarks after, after this as well. It's similar to my initial answer to... Uh, Mr. King, in my discussion with Mr. King, that this is not a decision made in isolation. Effectively, you have companies 
companies of great size that do not provide health care benefits to their employees, they are effectively passing the burden of providing those costs on to others, sometimes on to counties and states, sometimes on to other private employers who have to pay more for the insurance premiums for their employees because the costs of shifting for the un uh, uncovered have been shifted onto them. So this is simply a matter of finding the proper cost allocation in an economy so everybody pays their fair share. Uh, a concept and a uh, concept of individual responsibility that I think is consistent with Republican ideals as well as Democratic ideals, and one that we hope to reach through this health care reform. And we certainly welcome uh, ideas from both sides of the aisle and look forward to work working with you to better accomplish economically what, uh, what we need to. Again, uh, I think that the main piece missing from this initial uh, bill is uh, the offsets. Uh, we look forward to discuss finding out what the offsets are. Of course, keeping in mind that the first set of offsets you come up with are merely paying for a very expensive one-page bill. And we certainly look forward to working with you where we have common ground on the elements included in House Resolution 9. And I'm, I'm very glad to receive the clarification that the intent is for all of these things to be accomplished because uh, any one of them uh, would, uh, would be far from a silver bullet. And uh, we certainly have our work cut out for us and we look forward to working with you in this regard. And I yield back to balance. Thank you very much, Mr. Mr. Polis. Mr. Webster. I just have one question, Mr. Chair. Uh, that is, when the um, CBO scores a bill, do they take into account any other uh, uh, taxes or other fees or costs that would be generated other than those that would affect the federal budget and the federal deficit? If, if I... If I may, the, the CBO, and we've had this discussion at great length as we were going through this, the CBO scores the legislation as it sits in front of them. They don't take into account outside considerations. One of the great disagreements that we had during the debate leading up to the bill's passage was that in order for the CBO score to balance and meet the president's requirements, you had to assume that doctors were gonna take a 21% cut in their Medicare reimbursement when every single member of Congress knew that wasn't going to happen. And yet to get the numbers to balance, you had to assume that and CBO had to score it that way even though they knew, as did every member of Congress, that that wasn't gonna happen. They score, and, and we've talked about them being the, uh, the judge on the field or the referee on the field, they do a good job of scoring what's in front of them but they do not, nor are they allowed to go and, and speculate on other things. I would, I would just uh, note as well that the, uh, the Budget Committee Republicans, uh, in their analysis, figured that it would actually increase the deficit by more than $700 billion over 10 years. And uh, when, when you looked at uh, some of the things that the CBO did, of course, or that the bill did, it increased taxes over 10 years, but most of the benefits don't kick in uh, except for the six years of that 10-year window. So a better reflection of the score, and you'll remember that the president said he didn't want to do anything if it was going to increase the deficit. Well, instead of maybe looking at a 10-year window, maybe we ought to look at a 15-year window or a 20-year window to determine the full cost of the American taxpayer. And that, that's really what I wanted to discuss, and that is, after 10 years, our state, Florida, their FMAT for Medicaid funding goes back to the way it was pre-recession. Um, and, and a huge chunk of that cost gets distributed to the state in such a way that it will take a doubling. We don't have an income tax, we have a sales tax. It will take a doubling of our sales tax just to cover that portion of the bill. That's not any, in any way, rec um, in, in any part of the CBO's score of a particular piece of legislation. So, so the overall cost to the local and state governments, which is going to soar in year 11, I assume, uh, is not reflected in any of this. Would the gentleman correct? yield on that point? Yes. I thank my friend for yielding. And let me just say, uh, first of all, I appreciate his very thoughtful remarks. Uh, we have, uh, obviously, in response to the CBO uh, letter that was just received, uh, have uh, a response that's been put together by the Budget Committee pointing to the fact that there is $2.7 trillion, $2.7 trillion in additional spending 
that is included in this measure. And uh, I'm going to ask uh, unanimous consent to place in the uh, record this uh, analysis that has been done, uh, because if you look at the added fees and taxes that are imposed, it is very obvious that we are, uh, you know, again, it's to me incomprehensible to believe that somehow this massive expansion of the federal government and its mandates and dictates is going to end up being a cost saving, and I think that this uh, study shows that. And I thank my friend well, for the gentleman, gentleman, without, gentleman. Without, without, without objection. Without objection, I'm going to uh, place this uh, in the record. Is there objection? Uh, would you, so you, you'd like to reserve the right to object, or so you'd like to reserve the right to object, and in so doing, I will say, and I, no. Okay, well, you reserve the right to object to do that, and I will happy, happily give you a copy. And there's no objection. If not, the uh, the uh, budget committee's report will appear in the record. Will the, will the gentleman yield? Thank you for yielding, Mr. Webster. Yes. Will the gentleman yield for just a? Yes. I, I think what what I, what really I find disturbing about this exchange right now is that we're being informed that uh, basically there'll be no more neutral uh, budget uh, uh, group of experts anymore. The CBO, for whatever reason, if you don't like it, you, you're going to toss it aside. But basically all the budget numbers that we're going to base our legislation on is going to be made up by Republicans on the House Budget Committee. The gentleman would and yield. I find that very, very, very disturbing. The would the gentleman yield to me on yes. that point? I think that if we look at the opening day rules package, that was offered yesterday, one of the things that we have found here yeah. is that if you take the six-year versus the 10-year window for consideration of this measure, we have dramatic tax increases. And as you go to the out years, that's the reason we made this change, is we want to project, we want, I thank my friend for yielding, we want to project, we want to project be, to 20 and 30 years beyond so that we can't all of a sudden say we're going to have savings early on and then have an explosion an explosion of spending in the out years that exacerbates the deficit problem. I, I think what I, you're doing I is politi my, politicizing my, the budget Mr. process, and I think that's a, a very big mistake. No, I just had a question we're, we're, about the me, fact that... Let me that, just say, uh, we're, trying to make it, we're trying to make it more accurate and accountable, and I thank my friend for yielding. Yes. The gentleman no, Yes, I do. I, I thank the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Webster. And there's a missing point here. We're talking about this scoring and the number of uh, 230 or so billion dollars. Um, and I know that uh, we've had discussions in previous Congresses about dynamically scored. I don't propose to put a number on a dynamically scored impact of this repeal bill, but I think it will be significant and tremendous. And we're talking about the, the damage to the freedom and the vitality of Americans here. I, I am one who started a business with nothing. And I know the psychology of fearing government regulations, primarily federal regulations, but also state regulations. And if you're looking at Obamacare hanging over your head and you are a hesitant potential budding entrepreneur, you are always less likely to enter into and starting a business than you would be otherwise. So it isn't just the businesses that come to 49 employees and decide not to expand to 50 or 51. It's the businesses that will never be formed if we don't repeal this bill. And that's a point that can't be quantified by a CBO score. It can be quantified by the judgment of people who have actually started businesses and written paychecks. I thank you, and I yield back. Well, Mr. Chairman, all I wanted to know was uh, what the score was, and I found out what the score is. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Well, you're going to continue to find out what the score is here in uh, years to come, uh, and it's uh, always a challenge, Mr. Webster. Thank you very much. Gentlemen, thank you very much for being here. Appreciate your patience and, uh, and forbearance as we've gone through this process, and we look forward to uh, considering this, uh, the rule on this measure on the House floor. First, I'd like to call the Dean of the House, uh, Mr. Dingell, uh, forward, uh, and... Uh, I'd like to actually call a number of members who are on the Energy and Commerce Committee, but I'd first like to ask the dean have uh, that spot right there, Peter. I know you've been here. Uh, we have uh, we have other members. We have other members. Uh, we have other members of the Energy and Commerce Committee here. Mr. Andrews is here, and I'd like to have uh, as many members of the Energy and Commerce Committee as we possibly can come forward. We've got if you could pull some seats up to the table. Uh, we have uh, wh who are the other members of the uh, of the Commerce Committee who are here. Why don't, why don't the, and uh, Ms. Capps, we're proceeding with the Energy and Commerce Committee. So let me just say that uh, what we'll do is, is uh, I'm sorry? Well, what I'd like to do is, is, at this point, at this point, I'd like to call up members of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Mr. Chairman, if you would consider yes. 
Um, our leadership had asked a number of members to introduce the concepts behind these amendments. Then the individual members offering the amendments could speak. Okay. If the chairman well, would indulge us. Let me, just say, let me just say that we have our witness list, and your name is not included on the witness list uh, at all that was submitted to us. And uh, the, the list that was submitted to us has us going to the Energy and Commerce Committee and then to the Education and the Workforce Committee. And that's the, the list that's been provided to minority and majority members as well. We have the Dean of the House here. And when I saw him come in, I wanted to go to him first, as well as the other members of the committee uh, who were listed here. So, I mean, with all due respect, I mean, that's the, there was no request made of, of this committee uh, for what you're requesting, and I want to show deference to the dean of the house. We certainly be guided by the ranking member's decision. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I was just curious as to, you're saying that Mr. Andrews will not be able to testify? Because we've always let members testify when they came up to the committee. Well, Madam Chair, I'm not denying any member the opportunity to testify. What I'm that, saying I is thought that, that was what I heard you were saying. No, I, Mr. Andrews okay, let me restate it again. Let, let, let me restate it again. All okay. right. Okay, Mrs. Slaughter, I will state this again. The Dean of the House came in, and according to the witness list that we have mm -hmm. here that was submitted to you before we, uh, you know, as we put this together, uh, we have Committee on Energy and Commerce. You see that? And the Dean of the House that. is I, John Dingell. Look, I and John Dingell is here. I've been and up what here many I've, what years what with I've you, said, and I what, I, what, I've, what? what I've said is, is that what we're going to do now is we're going to hear from members of the Energy yes. and Commerce Committee. Is Mr. Mr. Andrews is not, a member? is not a member of the Energy and but Commerce Mr. Committee. Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yes. As I understand, the amendments have multiple authors that are from multiple committees. Right. And I think I don't quite And then we're going to hear from every single one who wants what? to hear But let, let me ask you this question. The first amendment on my list, I know about yours, deals with the re repeal of protection. Let, for let me just explain the way the Rules Committee works here, Mr. Andrews. Well, may I tell you how the Rules Committee works? Does the Rules works? Committee um, silence members may, who are trying to ask May I, may I explain to you how the Rules Committee is working here well, and it, always has and worked? And will the chairman entertain a question once he's done? We go through committees of jurisdiction. And the lead committee of jurisdiction happens to be the Energy and Commerce Committee. John Dingell is the Dean of the House, the Chairman Emeritus of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and I have decided as Chairman of this committee that I want to recognize the Chairman Emeritus of the Energy and Commerce Committee as well as the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee who reported this measure out. We are going to hear from any member of this House mm -hmm. who wants to testify on this. And now, if a request had been made by your leadership to me before this structure had been into place, I would have clearly considered that. And so I'd now like to call on Mr. Dingle, the Dean of the House. Uh, uh, let, me, let me, I'm not going to go through the list. You can consult with the minority members. You can yes. consult with the minority members if you'd like to see that. And so I'd like to call on Mr. Dingle and the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Mr. Dingle. Mr. Chairman, I thank you for your courtesy to me. I'm very happy to hear from my good friend, Mr. Andrews. He I thank was you. a very valuable member of this institution. He I, was I, one of those who uh, was very active in the, in the authoring of the legislation. As you know, Mr. Chairman, I am one who has worked on this for a long time. I'm one of the authors of the legislation, as, as was my dad. I found the discussions before this committee to be most interesting and useful, and it's my hope that, that they would be replicated on the floor and perhaps replicated in hearings which we could have so that, uh, other, so that the committees would have a chance to bring their respective expertise and responsibilities under their jurisdiction uh, to bear on the legislation so that we could have a better product. I would note that the Committee on Commerce uh, and others have had as many as 79 bipartisan hearings on the legislation which is uh, being repealed by H.R. 2, and testimonies of better than 181 witnesses and hours and hours and hours of hearings. Uh, in contrast, I note H.R. 2 was written in the dark of the night without a single committee hearing and without going through proper legislative channels. There's a question as to whether or not it, in fact, does do the things which have been announced by Speaker Boehner when he said we need to stop writing bills in the Speaker's office and let members of Congress be legislators again. He went on to say that the process starts in the committees, and of course, I would love to see that happen. Uh, because I believe that there are many misunderstandings about this legislation, which I think that proper hearings could correct. The title of the bill shows that um, there is some misunderstanding of, of, of what the legislation uh, being introduced in H.R. 2, in fact, does. Uh, it calls it uh, the Repealing the Job-Killing Health Care Law Act. 
Uh, and yet studies show us that four million more jobs will be created than would be created without reform. That's something that I think we ought to uh, address. The Congressional Budget Office, a nonpartisan entity, found that the health care reform reduces a deficit by $143 billion in the first 10 years alone and would reduce the deficit by more than a trillion dollars in the next decade. HR2 would, would, according to CBO, increase the deficit and add to the already troubling task of reducing our skyrocketing deficit, as well as addressing the skyrocketing increase in the costs of health care in this country. Uh, it would also return, HR2 would also return us to the very regrettable situation where we saw that we had a sick and a non-functioning non health care system in this country. Of course, one of the interesting things is it would abolish some $40 billion in tax credits to small businesses that provide health coverage for their employees. Tax credits that are already being utilized by small businesses across the country. I note this violates the majority's pledge not to raise taxes in the 112th Congress. Uh, repealing the Affordable Care Act would once again put American seniors in a position of having to choose between life-saving prescriptions or groceries by opening the prescription drug gap. The last time the, the, the majority was in charge, they created this, this uh, drug gap, forcing thousands of seniors to pay full prices for prescription drugs, something which many could not afford. The Affordable Care Act has already begun closing this gap, uh, first offering a rebate to seniors in the gap, and now by giving people in the gap a 50% discount on brand name drugs. Because of that statute, the Affordable Care Act, the gap will be completely closed by the end of the decade. Now, I would hope that this committee would address some important questions. Uh, what is it about health care that the uh, new majority wants to repeal so much? Is it pre preventing insurance companies from denying coverage based on pre-existing conditions, source of terror to our people? Is it, is it demanding oversight and accountability of insurance companies' premium increases? Is it preventing insurance companies from placing arbitrary limits on coverage? Or perhaps is it allowing young adults to stay on their parents' plans until age 26? I would note that there are a number of amendments uh, proposed by my colleagues who are here at the table with me and others. And I would hope that the majority will keep its promise of openness and will allow not only the offering of these amendments, but will allow us to proceed in the regular order by having this kind of legislation of vast complexity and of great controversy to be heard before the committees in a proper uh, way, subject to whatever necessary limitations may be required to assure that the committees act expeditiously to present the legislation to the House for proper consideration after having heard from people who have real concerns with regard to what the legislation will do, and also having a, a, a good understanding of what it is the legislation does to people and so that we, when we go home to answer the questions of our people, we'll be able to say, we have had a responsible consideration of this legislation, something which has enabled us to present the people of this country with not only the best legislation, but all the answers to the questions which might surround it. I uh, ask unanimous consent to insert the balance of my statement in the record, and I thank you, Mr. Chairman, and members of the committee, for your courtesy to me. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Dingle. Mrs. Eshoo. Let me just let me just uh, let me just uh, explain that uh, it's it's my intention to follow regular order for consideration of this measure uh, under the House rules, which is the way it would be handled on the House floor by seniority and by committees of jurisdiction. I look forward to hearing from Mr. Andrews, and because we have these different committees of jurisdiction, and we've had so many members who've been waiting for a long period of time. Mr. Weiner is a member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and I'm going to be calling on him to testify. And when we're completed with the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, again, your name is not on the list as a witness. There was no request made for you to be a witness. Mrs. Slaughter has just informed me that now there are several amendments that you all have and that people want to testify together on that. I'd like to be flexible with that and allow you to come and join uh, other members. But the structure that we have right now under regular order of the House is for us to hear from members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, and then we proceed to uh, the uh, Committee on Education and the Workforce following that. And that's pretty much the list of witnesses we have from those two committees. We have Mr. Conyers. I don't know if he's going to be here on the, uh, on the Judiciary Committee. 
So that's the intention that I have as far as proceeding. We Mr. have a Chairman. full day ahead of us. Yes, Mr. Chairman. You know, I, I, and I appreciate the, um, your comments, but, you know, I think the practice over the last four years anyway has been that uh, while we try to follow uh, the witness list in terms of committee of jurisdiction, when there are amendments that you know, multiple people or sponsors of. Yeah, let me just, let me just say, up. I was happy to yield, but so, let me just explain what, what has happened right. here. As you know, the room is filled with colleagues right. of ours who are from the committees of jurisdiction. And Mr. Welch has been here since uh, I arrived at uh, about 9.45 this morning. And I will say that I believe out of respect to the members who have prime jurisdiction and have obviously been waiting to come before this committee, that we should recognize them. And so it's my intention to follow the rules of the House when it comes to testimony at this juncture. And the rules are to recognize by seniority the committees of jurisdiction. And I have just done that by beginning with the Chairman Emeritus. The next ranking member is uh, Ms. Eshoo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. And a uh, special warm welcome to the new members of Congress, the new members of this committee. Uh, I appreciate the time that, uh, uh, and the opportunity to speak on a very important amendment that I'm offering to maintain the provision in the Patient Protection and Affordable Care Act, uh, which protects individuals and families when it comes to caps on our health insurance policies. Uh, I've been here since about 10 a.m., and uh, what I'm struck with in all of this is, as painful as it is, um, coming out of a campaign and the rhetoric that takes place in campaigns that when we get here, we have to deal with specifics and uh, not the generalizations that we all make in a campaign. And the specifics are the very specifics that people deal with in their day-to-day -day lives, your constituents and mine as well. Uh, more than half of all existing private health insurance policies in our country had in place, in fine print, a lifetime limit on benefits. I first introduced legislation uh, on this issue in 1996, and I named the bill after the wonderfully optimistic Christopher Reeve, who championed this issue because of what happened in his life and mirrored what happens in the lives of your constituents as well as mine. It was an uphill battle to get people to understand uh, the harrowing experiences of those who had hit the cap, uh, as well as the basic notion that buried in the fine print of health insurance policies was language that essentially cut people off from benefits once the ceiling was hit. Uh, frankly, most people were not aware that this fine print existed in their insurance policies. It was a surprise to them. We all know that medical costs have continued to climb, actually skyrocket over the years. And caps on insurance plans basically stayed the same. Insurers often set the cap between one, two, up to $3 million, which sounds high, but may not cover the cost of a baby born with a disability, adults with chronic diseases, those who struggle with a sudden illness, or as Christopher Reeve experienced, a tragic accident. It was an equestrian accident uh, that um, uh, caused his uh, uh, paralyzation. Today, almost everyone knows about the implications of a lifetime cap. Once a patient hits the cap, they're immediately dropped from their plan, regardless of their medical situation. Cancer patients, these are all our constituents. I don't think there's a congressional district in the country that doesn't uh, have uh, uh, constituents that have these um, uh, occurrences in their lives. Um, cancer patients in the middle of chemotherapy or teenage hemophiliacs in need of expensive blood clotting medications can be re released from their insurer without any real hope of funding uh, or finding another plan that's going to cover them. That's why this legislation that you are repealing, which contains the removal of this cap, is essential for you to address. We hold in the palm of our hand the lives 
of every human being in this country. It matters not what their party registration is. And so this is something that we all need to deal with. There was a specific purpose as to why it was placed in the act. And so I'm asking the majority and the minority to see to it that this amendment is made in order. Understand that effective September 23rd of last year, the lifetime caps were eliminated. I think that was a step in the right direction for our country. We all speak of the perfection of this union. Go to those patients, your constituents, in your district, and they will confirm that. It has brought more perfection to their lives. I think we need to move forward and not backward. I think that we need to pay attention to the details and not just simply the rhetoric uh, that goes on in campaigns. As appropriate as that is in campaigns, we need to deal with that. There's something else that I'm asking the members to keep in mind of the committee that this not only has overwhelming public support, but it actually saves the government money. Medicare and Medicaid do not impose caps on the sickest and the most costly patients. They are those that uh, are moved into those programs, and they will be, if this is repealed, uh, is going to increase the burdens of these public health insurance programs. When we buy insurance to protect us, and when we buy insurance to protect us when we need it most, uh, not to be dumped when it becomes inconvenient. So this amendment will continue to honor the protection against lifetime caps in the Affordable Health Care Act. And I really urge all members, regardless of your party registration, um, to think of this as a nonpartisan issue. It's why we put it in the bill. We put it in the bill because of the experience of the lives of our constituents. So I thank you for your time and uh, urge you to, uh, uh, to consider making amendments uh, possible to this bill. Because uh, if in fact there is a repeal of this, and I didn't hear the chairman, and maybe he wants to address this in his list of principles, that the limit on lifetime caps, you didn't, I didn't hear you speak to that. And I haven't heard others uh, speak to it either. This is absolutely critical. And, um, well, thank you very much for that. Let me just say, uh, I appreciate your testimony, and uh, I, I want to hear from the other witnesses from the Energy and Commerce Committee. But the, the fact is, uh, obviously, in HRES 9, I am calling for everything to be addressed and you will have an opportunity uh, when this comes to your committee to obviously raise this, and I hope very much uh, that it is adequately addressed. Ms. Well, Shikowsky. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I, I hope in your leadership position oh, okay. that Ms. you then, will... Then Ms. Caps, uh, your name was not on the list. No, Ms. Caps, and then Ms. Ms. Caps. Chairman Dreyer, Chairman Dreyer uh, Ranking Member Slaughter, and... Members of the Rules Committee, and I apologize particularly to the new members who my back is turned to. Actually, most of them have already left, so. <laughs> right? Well, I do appreciate uh, the opportunity to appear before you today to support a series of amendments being discussed today with the strong hope that these be made in order for the floor debate of the Republican bill to repeal the, the Affordable Care Act. I strongly support the many efforts of my colleagues who are fighting to retain many important provisions of this law. I want to speak today to endorse a specific group of amendments that will ensure that the critical consumer protections included in the health insurance reform will be preserved even today. Critical benefits that this repeal would take away from the millions of Americans who need it most and many of whom are already enjoying and having their lives improved dramatically by the passage of the law and, and the provisions that are already in effect. This includes key provisions in the Patient's Bill of Rights that will allow individuals with pre-existing conditions to get health insurance. The elimination of lifetime and annual limits on care, which my colleague has uh, 
really d endorsed so well. Regulations allowing young adults to stay on their parents' plan until they are 26. Many of our constituents have already taken advantage of that. And new provisions allowing for free preventive care for all Americans, including seniors. Cost-saving device, uh, taxpayer-saving uh, device. Uh, most of these provisions are already in effect. And now, uh, um, as I mentioned, most of our constituents, many of our constituents are enjoying the benefits. Across the country and in my own district, I've witnessed how parents have been given peace of mind that their children um, will not be, go uninsured just because they graduated from high school. Seniors have received much needed financial assistance to pay for prescription drugs when they reach the dreaded donut hole and are now permitted a free physical exam each year, saving taxpayer dollars. Women no longer need to worry about insurance company abuses considering their gender a pre-existing condition and how all Americans are now eligible for preventive screenings like mammograms and colonoscopies for free but also, again, saving taxpayer dollars, helping their pocketbook and improving their health. Those who are sick have be received even more benefits. A diagnosis no longer brings with it the fear that you will be dropped from your plan. Lifetime coverage limits. Fine print, as that was explained, that can thrust a family into bankruptcy if someone gets cancer or another serious ailment. These are now a thing of the past. And because the law bans insurance companies from denying those with pre-existing conditions and rescissions, Individuals who need it the most will no longer be dropped from their plans or denied coverage because they are sick and our constituents are realizing this and realizing the benefits. I'm here today supporting these specific provisions, not just because my background as a nurse has shown me the importance of these critical reforms, but to speak for those who did not have a chance to voice their opinions in a single committee hearing on this misguided legislation. Perhaps my constituents, and I'll now specify the strong family of Santa Barbara, put it best. When asked what the health insurance reform law means, means to them, this is what they said. It means we no longer have to lose sleep worrying about heading for bankruptcy when we hit that lifetime cap on our health insurance policy and become immediately uninsurable due to our daughter's pre-existing terminal illness. To take away the security that the Affordable Care Act has given this particular family without a single committee hearing or markup, without hearing the millions of other stories like theirs across this country, is an irresponsible political stunt. These amendments are critical today to all Americans, and I urge you to make them in order for an up or down vote on the floor of the House of Representatives. Thank you, and I welcome any questions you that you much, might Mr. have. Gabs. Mr. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm here as a proud member of the Energy and Commerce Committee and the Health Subcommittee that worked very hard to include language providing tools to ensure that health insurance premiums are reasonable and that individual consumers and businesses get value for their premium dollar by ensuring that at least 80% of those dollars are actually spent on medical care. I'm offering two uh, amendments, uh, along, one along with Representative Tierney, and another with Representative Sutton and Lee, Jackson Lee that are of combined importance. They would not permit insurance companies to spend an unlimited amount of premium dollars on company profits um, and non-medical care like CEO pay or unreasonably increase a family's premium without any justification. These provisions are especially critical for Illinois and 25 other states that currently lack authority to review rates prevent unjustified rates, or even require that insurance companies disclose the justification for rates. The Affordable Care Act, for the first time, requires transparency in rates and gives the tools needed to help limit annual health insurance premiums while reducing health care costs for families and small businesses. Beginning this year, health plans must rebate the difference between minimum medical loss ratios and actual spending on health care. If those standards had been in place in 2009, six of the largest for-profit insurers would have been required to refund $1.9 billion for spending too much on profits, CEO pay, and administration. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to put all of my uh, testimony in. Thank you. Record, absolutely. Um, this repeal effort would take away safeguards that protect all Americans from insurance company abuses. It would take us back to the time when insurance companies held all the cards, 
when they decided who wanted who they wanted to insure, what coverage they would provide, and at what price. Giving insurers that power will help them earn enormous profits, but it would be devastating for the rest of America. The biology class at Maine South High School in Park Ridge understands the dangers of keeping the insurance industry in control, as this repeal bill would do. They wrote me, quote, it isn't fair that currently the different health insurance companies are charging so much for coverage. The companies also charge more depending on age, gender, history of health, pre-existing conditions, and sometimes they won't cover you at all, unquote. And all of us have heard from our constituents, families, and business owners asking for help in preventing rising and unwarranted premium increases. Adrian from Wilmette told me that her 63-year-old husband, Alan, had not met the deductible on his assurance health care policy in the past three years. The policy had a $4,000 deductible, then goes to 50-50 cost sharing until the next $2,500 is met. Last year, Alan paid nearly $3,500 a quarter. That's almost $14,000 a year. When he received his renewable notice, he learned that his premium would increase to almost $4,200 a quarter almost $17,000 a year. This is an insured person. These are out-of-pocket costs. There's no excuse for this egregious rate, rate hike. Carol, who works in the Human Services Resource Department for a small firm in Chicago, shared with me that they received notice in September that their premiums would increase 18% per employee. She said she spoke with their insurance broker several times about the increase and was told there's no way around it. Carmen from Skokie called to tell me she's a small business owner who has Blue Cross Blue Shield of Illinois for all her employees, but had to cancel it when the premiums got too expensive. And John, who also has Blue Cross Blue Shield, told me at the train station that his company's premiums were going to increase by 30%. They incre the insurance companies have increased rates by double-digit percentages over the last several years, one of the reasons why we needed reform in the, in, in the first place. These situations are particularly frustrating when there's no justification for increase other than corporate greed. From 2000 to 2008, premiums for families in employer-sponsored plans rose 97% and 90% for individuals. During the same period, private insurers' payments to providers rose only 72%, medical inflation by 29%, and overall inflation by 21%. Clearly, the increases are based on costs other than medical inflation, wages, or general inflation. The Affordable Care Act forces the insurance industry to report information regarding premiums and expenditures for major medical health insurance plans and requires them to publicly justify the reason for unreasonable premium increases, for all premium increases. It gives insurance departments new analytical terms, tools. It improves transparency and provides in, invaluable information to help educate all of our constituents. Repealing health care would mean that Illinois and the rest of the states would no longer have access to resources to review proposed health insurance premium increases and hold insurance companies accountable for, accessible, for excessive, unjustified, or unfairly discriminatory rate increases. Thus, the reason for the amendments that I have had the honor to co-sponsor with several of my colleagues. I thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Shikowsky. Let me just uh, announce what it, uh, is our intention as far as proceeding here, because we have so many uh, members who are here. We plan to go through, by seniority, those members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, uh, as I said. And these names are just now coming in to us that have been submitted. And uh, a couple of members have added their names uh, to the list. And then we will proceed with the Education and the Workforce uh, Committee. We had uh, already heard from the, uh, from the chairman there. And so it's our intention now to proceed. And please let me know uh, to go to Mr. Inslee, then Mr. Weiner, and Mr. Matheson, Ms. Castor, Mr. Murphy, and then Mr. Welch. And then we'll proceed with the Committee on Education and the Workforce. Mr. Inslee, excuse me, Mr. Braley, uh, Mr. Braley's name is not on the list, but I'm ha and, uh, a member of the committee, or the committee, then we'll, we'll put your name down by seniority, and we'll look forward to hearing from you as well. Mr. Inslee. Thank you, Mr. Braley is a great member of the committee. I just want Good. that on the record, if I can. I'm sure he thank is. Thank you, he is indeed. Uh, thank you, this is a new year, and uh, I want to have my comments in the spirit of the new year and the new year's resolution that we heard from uh, new speaker Boehner yesterday. 
Uh, there's a couple defects I'd like to have an opportunity to remedy in the bill, one of which is that this bill, as currently drafted, would strip uh, our young people of the ability to be insured uh, through age 25 in their homes. We know these young people, our kids, are having a real hard time. We've got 15% unemployment of this group, and it's, we want to keep them insured. And as this bill is drafted right now, it would strip them of that insurance. Second, as we've learned, it would create $230 billion of deficit spending. And we want to remedy that, and I have two amendments that will remedy both of those issues. Now, here's what I want to make. I want to ask the Rules Committee to allow these to go to the floor. It's in the spirit of a New Year's uh, resolution, which some of us make. And the New Year's resolution I heard from the speaker yesterday is that, number one, we're going to have a new way of doing business. We're going to be open, we're not going to have closed rules. That's the first. And the second is we're not going to do this deficit-busting activity that has hurt the fiscal condition of the United States. And yet, within 22 minutes of him announcing those New Year's resolutions, we hear there's going to be a closed rule. We're going to break that resolution, and we're going to break the resolution by creating another $230 billion of deficit spending, which this bill would do if, if our amendment is not added to this bill. Now, as far as I could tell, that would set a new record for shortness of life of a New Year's resolution in American history. It would be 22 minutes breaking the previous record held by Mr. Fielding Mellish of Queens, New York, who promised not to eat cheeseburgers and only went 45 minutes. We, we, we need, I, I love Queens and I love Mr. Fielding Mellish as well. In any event, we do hope that we will, chance, we do hope that we will abide by this new uh, idea of openness and fiscal responsibility, and I hope you allow these to be considered and not defer. And, and I've, I've heard some of the comments that, you know, we're going to fix these things later on and some other bill later on, but that's kind of like going up to a guy in crutches and kicking the crutches out from beneath him and tell him, we'll get, we'll get you some crutches some later date that you may or may not do. That, that's not good enough for the people who need insurance right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Mr. Weiner. Yeah, we want to use that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Chairman, many of my colleagues uh, are offering amendments dealing with the substance of the, uh, the Health Care Act we passed and the, the problems it would cause if they were repealed. But I want to try to address a, a, an amendment that I and Ms. Van Hollen are going to be offering addresses, I think, the crux of the agenda of the new Congress, and that is the idea that we need to reduce deficits and reduce costs. Not only for the federal taxpayers, but also for state and local taxpayers, and of course for citizens and families in their homes. Um, our amendment is a simple one. It simply says that the costs that will be incurred have to be paid for in the bill. This is a classic pay as you go or cut as you go, whatever you're using this year. It says that if you want to take an action, whether it's to pass a law, whether it's to change a law, amend the law, that it should be fully paid for. It's something that I have heard repeatedly articulated by my Republican colleagues, and frankly, those of us on the Democratic side have already articulated in the form of the pay-as-to-go rules that were set up. Now, I do need to ask for unanimous consent that my amendment be amended because this morning, the number went from $143 billion that this bill would cost. It went up to $230 billion, according to the CBO estimates. And just for my, my newer colleagues, and frankly, all of us should be reminded, why repealing this law costs money. First, it costs money to the taxpayers because the uninsured and those that are underinsured wind up getting health care. This is not a bill that provides them with health care. It's simply a bill that says how we're going to pay for health care and what the standards shall be. So when people are uninsured and they go into hospital emergency rooms and get care, it costs all of us a lot more money to pay for those costs because frankly, ladies and gentlemen, the bill fairy doesn't come in and pay for those costs. We all wind up doing it. So the basic structure of this law says, you know what? It's actually less expensive for us to provide a subsidy for the uninsured to buy insurance than it is for us to keep paying for them in the hospital emergency rooms. So when you repeal this act, what do you do? You basically say those protections will no longer be there. We're going to revert to paying for people when they come to hospital emergency rooms. That costs the taxpayers money. This saves money for families in a different way. When there are more people who are insured, just like in automobile insurance where everyone is insured, it allows insurance companies using free market principles to aggregate their costs over a greater universe of people, 
all of our costs come down. That's not me saying it. That's the insurance industry saying it, and that is the CBO saying it. So you've got to make up that cost somewhere. And then there's the cost to our states and localities, and this is the important thing that I think my colleagues need to understand. You can say all you want where we're going to slash this bill and leave it to the states, but what winds up happening is if someone gets hit by a bus who's uninsured in a small town or in a big city in the United States, and they wind up going to a hospital and emergency rooms to get paid for, very often those costs fall largely on state and local taxpayers. So this insurance, this, this structure of our bill would protect those state in, uh, and local insurance costs, costs. So now a city like mine, eight billion dollars we pay for the uninsured and the underinsured. This bill kicks in, that dramatically goes down. It's not me saying it, it's the Congressional Budget Office. So what, this, what the, the amendment says is, is a simple one. It says, you may agree with some of my colleagues here about the individual things. You may believe that they're good or that they're bad. But however you believe, you should back up your vote with an actual pay for it to say, this is how we're going to pay for the bill. And let me just say in one concluding, um, and, uh, concluding thing, you know, it, the, uh, my, um, I'm asking unanimous consent that on line 9, $143 billion be struck and $230 billion be inserted. But that's just the tip of the iceberg. According to the CBO, we will save one half of 1% of GDP almost in perpetuity because of the new effect of this bill. That is $1.2 trillion. $1.2 trillion of savings that are arriving from this bill. And I'll make one final point, and if I neglect it, to offer congratulations to you, Mr. Dreyer. Uh, congratulations on taking over this, this committee again. I have heard a lot of talk about the government takeover of health care. Let me make it very clear, because this is said so often, I think we sometimes forget what this bill does. This bill takes government taxpayer money and gives it to a private entity, the insurance companies. It's taking our money and giving people subsidies so they can buy insurance. It's the opposite of a government takeover. And by the way, just the same way, Medicare is in a government takeover because you still have your individual doctors and your payments. It's only a matter of how that money gets processed. So I believe that if you are sincere about cutting costs, you will have to vote, allow this amendment to be in order, and you'd have to vote in favor of it. And by the way, I think it's the reasonable, consistent thing to do. $233 billion is what it's going to cost you to repeal this over 10 years. That, by the way, is $200 billion more than you've committed to save in this entire Congress. And I thank you to members of the committee, particularly my friend, Mr. Sessions. Thank you uh, very much, Mr. Weiner. And I noticed you uh, did not seize the opportunity to comment on Queens at all or cheese. I don't. I, 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 all, I, which I, thought you I never fight with people smaller than me, Mr. Chairman. Uh, our, our, next, our next witness is Mr. Matheson. Mr. Matheson. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know you've got a big agenda, and I will be brief. Yes, we do. Thank you. Um, I have an amendment that really adds another item to the list of instructions in <coughs> HRES 9, the instructions of the committees if they're going to look at changing things. Um, just a few weeks ago, Congress voted overwhelmingly in a bipartisan way to avoid a 25% cut in Medicare payments. This is the sustainable growth rate issue that we are all more than familiar with as members of Congress over the years. We're also all familiar that the problem is, is Congress keeps doing one-time fixes but doesn't address the underlying problem, which is a flawed formula that does not reflect uh, the true growth in health care costs from providing health care to people. And so I would, uh, my amendment's very simple, and I'll just read uh, a two-sentence description to make uh, sure everyone understands this. My amendment simply adds another goal of the instructions of the committees that tells the committees they should also include a permanent fix to what is now the flawed SGR formula as part of any replacement legislation that goes forward. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I told you I'd be brief. I think that pretty much explains it, and I'll yield back my time. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Matheson. Ms. Castor, former member of this committee, we're very happy to have you back. And thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations to you thank on you. Uh, thank you. having the gavel. And I'd thank like you. to congratulate my new colleagues from Florida, Richard Nugent and Daniel Webster, who are uh, new members of the Rules Committee. And of course, we're very happy to have them. Regards been to, uh, you very well to our Dean, uh, Alcee Hastings from Florida. Thank you for being uh, I, I'm glad that we have new Floridians here because the Affordable Care and Patient Protection Act is already helping millions of families and seniors in Florida and all across this country. Uh, as the Republican majority works to repeal these important consumer protections, 
that the health care law provides. Uh, today, I'm offering an, offering an amendment that will ensure that Americans will not lose these critical protections created by the Affordable Care Act that ends insurance company discrimination against, based upon a pre-existing condition. Because as you are aware, the Affordable Care Act outlawed the worst abuses by the health insurance industry. And it instituted these vital consumer protections for families and individuals. Specifically, the new health care law says that insurance companies cannot refuse coverage or certain medical services because someone has cancer, or they have diabetes, or they have asthma, or they have uh, some other grave diagnosis. This is the bedrock of our patient Bill of Rights, ending insurance company discrimination of citizens with pre-existing medical conditions. And we throw that term out a lot, don't we? Pre-existing medical condition. But if you all would pause and think for a moment of a family member, a neighbor, someone that you go to church with that has cancer, that has HIV, that has received a diagnosis maybe in the past few weeks, maybe that has had cancer and is in remission, but has struggled with those insurance companies to try to get the medical care that they need. In, in my hometown, I think of a woman I met that works at the community college named Sharon Williams. Uh, Sharon was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 21. And upon that diagnosis, she went down the list of covered health services uh, and diagnosis th for her health insurance. And you know what? Breast cancer wasn't on it. It wasn't on the list, even though she had insurance. She said, after her diagnosis, they showed me a list of different types of diseases uh, that the health insurance company covered, but there was no breast cancer. And I remember becoming really, really angry, and I said, look, I have something growing inside of me that's going to kill me. Somebody help me. She went home, closed her blinds, and cried herself to sleep. She felt hopeless with nowhere to turn. She didn't eat and was only a step away from throwing in the towel. She said no one would cover me. I went, she went uncovered with health insurance for 10 years after that breast cancer diagnosis. She fought through it, and she's in remission now. But she said she felt like damaged goods. And she looked for, a, for another plan to cover her, but there was no plan out there that would cover her. She became more frightened of not having insurance co coverage than the cancer. Uh, but after the passage of the Affordable Care Act, Sharon cheered. We were together a few days after President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act into law. And she said, in front of a lot of TV cameras, this health care reform bill is very, very important. It's dear to my heart because I have a pre-existing condition, and there are millions of people out there all across America that have pre-existing conditions that are being denied even as we speak. And it's just not right. And you know, there are also thousands of children, of American children who are childhood cancer survivors, uh, or they have other conditions, who now have insurance coverage because of the Affordable Care Act. And I ask you all, don't repeal it. Don't take away their insurance coverage now. Our new law has now outlawed the discrimination uh, the health insurance companies had instituted based upon those, the kids having, having cancer or, or asthma or diabetes. One is a student that attends the University of West Florida who was dropped after... Uh, she had AML leukemia. Uh, she lives on her own and completely supports herself. So she, she said to me, of course I panicked uh, after her diagnosis. With me going to the oncologist for my blood work and checkups, I could be charged a ton for co-pays and out-of-pocket costs. With me being dropped, I feared that I wouldn't be able to find another insurance company to pick me up. But thanks to the new law, my mother's Health insurance has accepted me, even with my cancer being a pre-existing condition. Another student, college student in Florida, Sarah, Sarah Woodbury, says, 
I'm a leukemia survivor, a daughter, a student, and a citizen of the United States of America, and I have multiple checkups to make sure I stay free from cancer. And because I have several lasting medical conditions from my cancer treatment, my mother was denied several times of insurance for me when she tried to switch. And the quotes they did give her to cover me were impossible to afford. But now, with our new law, she said, I'm very glad to hear that child survivors of cancer are given a chance to stay covered by insurance regardless of their medical history. No person who has fought or is fighting cancer should be denied anything since simply because of the cancer. Cancer takes so much from so many undeserving people. Why should insurance companies have the right to deny them insurance or a chance at an affordable plan? After all, no child asks to be plagued by cancer. So committee members, be, before the Democratic-led Congress passed and President Obama signed the Affordable Care Act last year, if you had a cancer diagnosis or you were in remission or you have a heart condition, believe it or not, if you had been a victim of domestic violence in eight states, some, some insurance companies called that a pre-existing condition. If you had any of those conditions, you were often denied care. Well, we finally changed that. And I implore this Republican majority, don't go back. Don't, don't repeal these important consumer protections. Our sh children shouldn't be penalized uh, because they were born with a heart, heart condition or leukemia. They need access to the very best doctors and the very best care, and that's what the Affordable Care Act does for our children and will soon do for all adults. Mr. Chairman, there are people like this all across America. I'm certain you know many of them back home in your district. We need to maintain this vital protection, these vital protections created by the Act. If you repeal the Affordable Care Act, you will be sanctioning that type of discrimination again. If you repeal the Affordable Care Act, you will add to the instability of the workforce. Just when we've given them an economic lifeline, you will snatch it away through repeal of the Affordable Care Act. If you repeal the Affordable Care Act, you will explode the deficit. Now we know to the tune of $230 billion. If you repeal the Affordable Care Act, you will demonstrate an affinity to the health insurance companies over the interest of the American people and our families. So I urge you to support this amendment that bars insurance company discrimination of people with pre-existing medical conditions. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ms. Castro. We're delighted to uh, head before the Rules Committee again. Uh, appreciate your testimony. Gentlemen, Mr. Mark, please let Thank you, Mr. Sessions, and uh, appreciate the opportunity to testify before you today. Let me associate myself first with uh, the remarks of uh, my good friend, Ms. Castor, um, and her amendment. Um, you know, I think of a story from a gentleman in uh, my district in northwestern Connecticut, and uh, I met him at his door sometime uh, uh, in the end of uh, 2009. Uh, he told me a story that unfortunately is all too familiar. Um, he had uh, gotten injured, and due to his injury, he was no longer able to work, and due to the fact that he was no longer able to work, he lost his health care. Uh, and he was faced with the same situation that countless families are faced with uh, all across this country and all across uh, my district, that the illness um, that they contract then leads to the loss of their health care, that then leads to the devastation of their family. And what this family was finally confronted with was a pretty simple choice. Uh, they either had to stop making the mortgage payments on the house that they had grew up in, or they had to go to the one savings account that they had, which was their son's college savings account. Now they sat down as a family and they made an awful decision. And that decision, in consultation with their son, was to go and exhaust the college savings account. Their son decided that he'd just postpone college, that he'd go and work and hopefully someday go and get an education. Now that's an awful outcome, both from a position of conscience as the most uh, respected and most powerful, most affluent country in the world, but also from an economic perspective as well. Postponing that child's education hurts our economy as well. And the fact that that situation is replayed over and over and over again, leading to lost productivity and lost productivity in our economy, speaks to the importance of Ms. Castor's amendment. The amendment that I'd like to offer today, Thompson speaks to another problem in our current healthcare system. Now, unfortunately, it's not just so simple that we can correct the ills of our healthcare system by addressing those that don't have healthcare. We've got problems with people that do have health care today, in particular their lack of access to primary care doctors. 
Now, this part of the healthcare reform bill doesn't get talked a lot about because sometimes um, the, the devastating problems that confront that family in Torrington, Connecticut are the ones that hit the front pages. Um, but I'm offering an amendment today that would say simply that before this repeal goes forward, that the Office of Management and Budget, in consultation with CBO, would have to certify that the repeal does not undermine access to primary care in this nation. Because we've got to make sure that we get health care to those families that don't have it through no fault of their own. We've got to make sure that once they get health care, they have access to doctors. So let me briefly describe what's at stake for primary care if this repeal goes forward. First, under this law, primary care practitioners receive a 10% Medicare payment bonus for the next five years, and Medicaid reimbursement rates go up to Medicare levels. This would be a dramatic downward adjustment in reimbursement levels for primary care physicians right now who don't make enough to make ends meet uh, all too often. Repealing this law will take $11 billion away from community health care centers that for years have been supported by both Democrats and Republicans that are doing so much to extend primary care to residents in both rural and suburban areas. Repealing this health care reform law would also take away critical support from the National Health Service Corps, one of our nation's most successful workforce programs, and it would repeal and eliminate other critical, other critical enhancements to the primary care workforce system, including training slots to train primary care residents. Uh, repealing this law not only takes away the one answer we have for that guy in Torrington, Connecticut, who has lost everything that his family has built up to just try to take care of an injury, but it also takes away the one hope that we have to get primary care resources to people who right now have insurance and people who we hope will get it. Um, uh, Mr. Chairman, the committee, I hope that you would make uh, this amendment in order as well as the others that are being offered by members of the Energy and Commerce Committee. Ms. Murphy, thank you so very much. Uh, the Mr. Chairman, uh, Congressman is Henry Cuellar was here early this morning and had to leave, but he asked that I mention that for the record, that he was here to speak on the pre-existing uh, conditions amendment. And uh, I, hopefully he will be able to return later. I appreciate the gentlewoman extending that courtesy on behalf of the gentleman from Texas, and thank you. Uh, before I recognize the gentleman, Mr. Welsh, I will recognize Mr. that, Braley's that me. excuse me, I'm sorry? Uh, Mr. Braley has a slight, he has a little more seniority than me. Uh, you know, the, uh, I know the gentleman quite well. Uh, I, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to recognize the gentleman in just a second. Mr. Chairman, excuse uh, me, I'm sorry. Mr. Murphy looks like he's about to leave, and I wanted to ask him a question. I apologize for interrupting you. I, 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 I so appreciate I, 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 the, uh, the uh, chair would like to give notice that as a result of evidently the gentleman leaving, that if there are questions for Mr. Murphy at this time, we would extend those very quickly as a request from the gentlewoman from uh, North Carolina. You, you, you know what, if there's somebody that has to leave and we'd like to modify what we're doing at this time, we're trying to take our time, meticulously work through this. I will uh, listen to the gentleman from Massachusetts and agree with him. The gentlewoman from North Carolina is recognized for the purpose of uh, a discussion. Mr. With the Chairman, if he's not about to leave and is going to stay, then I'm happy to wait till later. Is that good? Gentleman's going to stay. Gentleman's going to stay. If I could, before I recognize Mr. Welch, I appreciate the gentleman from Massachusetts. I'd like to acknowledge uh, Mr. Pallone is here and that Mr. Pallone will follow uh, Mr. Welch, and then we will go directly to Mr. Braley. A uh, gentleman, Mr. Welch is recognized. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, it's uh, wonderful to be here in the Rules Committee. You know, I want to acknowledge uh, all of you, but especially you, uh, your, your team campaigned very effectively. Uh, now the question, now the challenge is whether you can govern responsibly. And this decision that this rules committee makes is going to set the template for the entire 112th Congress. And the questions before you were basically three. The first question is whether on the promise of fiscal responsibility and implementation of the cut-go rule that is replacing our pay-go rule, you'll apply that when the evidence from the impartial referee is that repeal your proposal for health care will add $230 billion to the deficit. And from where I sit, the promises that you have made impel you 
to come up with an offset for that $230 billion. Second, you've made uh, promises uh, after criticizing uh, the way uh, our Congress uh, was run that there will be open rules, that there'll be an allowance for debate on important questions. There is no more important question, uh, more intimate to the American people than how their health care will be delivered and how they'll have access to that health care. And we are seeking, all of us, and the amendment I'm going to propose uh, is co-sponsored by 65 of my colleagues, and 65 of us have co-sponsored uh, Ms. Castor's amendment, Mr. Murphy's, Schakowsky's, Ms. Eshoo's. We are going to ask for the opportunity for a yes or no vote, up or down. Now, I listened to Mr. Woodall uh, and followed your campaign some, and I know everything you said, you had the backing, obviously, of your people. But I campaign too, and the people I represent want me to defend some of the provisions that are helping the middle class in this legislation. And I believe that my constituents, as your constituents, are entitled to know where you stand, where I stand, and the way we tell them, the way we're accountable, is that when the roll is called on the specific, the specific question about repealing access to health care for people up to age 26, about taking away the lifetime caps, that if you have one opinion and I have another opinion, we state that publicly by our vote, and then our voters are allowed to decide whether they agree with you or they agree with me. And that's the way it should work. But this is the first opportunity for you to follow through and allow us to be accountable to our constituents. The third question is this. Is the first bill passed by the Republican Congress on health care going to take away some specific hard fought achievements for the middle class of America. And a number of the amendments you're hearing, this is not about political rhetoric, it's about the reality of policy that affects real people, as you've heard, real families and real businesses. And please understand, you've made criticisms, some of your criticisms I think many of us at this table agree with. We do know that this has to be a work in progress. This is a multi-trillion dollar challenge for this country. So anyone who says that we have to improve this, you have all of us at this table in agreement with you and hoping somehow, some way, we can find a way to work together to improve it. But why would we, in the quest to improve it, destroy things that are now actively making a difference for people and they're depending on it? I'm going to talk about preventive care. I got off the phone this morning with Tom Eubner, who is the CEO of the Rutland Community Regional Medical Center. And I said, Mr. Eubner, what does it mean to you? And he was a close call on whether he wanted this bill to pass. He was one of my local hospital folks. I paid a lot of attention to him because he was in the real world, not the abstract world of what this policy was. And I said, what is the implication to you and to the work you're doing, your hospital, if we repeal the access to prevent free preventive care. And what he said, and I'm going to quote, if we are serious about bending the cost curve, we need to prevent disease and we need to manage disease and we, ha we have to have free preventive care in order to do that. People come into that facility with breast cancer because they couldn't afford to get a screening in time. People come in with advanced diabetes because they couldn't get a simple test. Now, you know this as much as I know this. I'm not telling you anything you're not aware of. But what this Congress did last year is we passed legislation that give our citizens the right to get that test. And why? With all of the dis disagreements among us, with all of the different people that we represent, why would we take away from Tom Eubner in the, Re the Rutland Regional Medical Center, this tool that they need to make our folks healthy. I spoke to Dr. Neil Hyman, the UVM uh, College of Met uh, uh, University of Vermont College of Medicine. He told me that colon cancer screenings are absolutely essential to early detection of cancer. Again, I'm not telling you anything you don't know, but just this week, 
he saw, this week, he saw a 64-year-old patient who could not afford to receive regular screenings. By the way, those are free to him now. Like many others, he was waiting to qualify for Medicare. 64, he needed another year. He waited too long. Now, instead of catching that disease in its early stages, this Vermonter is suffering from metata metatastic colon cancer. This is real. The decision that you are making is real. This is not campaign rhetoric. You know, you won the campaign. And you were effective in your, in your arguments. But you're making a real decision. You are part of the United States Congress. And the policies that we make are not about campaign rhetoric. It's not about the next election. It's about what's going to happen to the Rutland Regional Medical Center. It's going to, what's going to happen to this Vermonter who now has metatastic cancer, colon cancer that could have been detected. There are simple things in this bill that are important to the people you represent and the important to the people I represent, and it is absolutely unnecessary to take those securities away from the middle class of this country. Thank you. Mr. Walsh, thank you very much. Uh, earlier in the uh, day, when we began around 10 o'clock, there was a big discussion of exactly the items that you bring up. Right. And in fact, the uh, Committee chairman or their representatives who were here this morning said the purpose of this bill is to also then make sure that we work through these issues very carefully. This is literally a one-page bill, starts the process. We intend to do that. I, and just like Mrs. Castor has noted, I'm not like unlike any other person on right. this dais or any other member of the chair, or even the people who are attending this hearing today. I have a Down syndrome son. I'm mm -hmm. very aware, acutely right. aware of, of uh, the need that we have, whether it be an intellectual or mental disability or physical disability, that we do the right thing. I can assure you, not just because I know you well, we're going to have a full hearing on this. It will be my hope that there will be, uh, as what was suggested, an up or down vote. It's my hope that that will happen too. And I believe as a part of this new majority, senior member, uh, <coughs> but I'll insist upon that also. So I appreciate the gentleman being here, his friendship, not Thank only you. that he's extended to me, perhaps that I extend to him on a regular basis through a friendship. Uh, I respect your testimony today and that which you have done. And I appreciate that very much. Uh, I now would like to uh, recognize, if I can, the gentleman, Mr. Braley, if he would uh, choose to uh, come and find a chair. I'm sorry, Mr. Plone. I had previously oh, I, said, excuse me, Mr. Plone. I'm actually enjoying listening. To oh, you are? Well, you know, sometimes I enjoy listening to myself, too, uh, but very rarely do I want to uh, take back something I said, and the gentleman, Mr. Plone, is recognized. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the members of the committee. I see we have some new members. I, I said to some of them before, I didn't know whether I should congratulate the new members or it's say my condolences, but in any case, uh, welcome to the Rules Committee, if I could say that. Um, I wanted to address the issue of um, Medicare solvency with the amendment that I've brought before you today. Um, you know, look, I think that this bill is so important um, because of patient protections, because of the universal coverage, because of the fact that we're significantly cutting the deficit, and there's so many reasons which I'm sure you've heard from today about why it shouldn't be repealed. But another reason is the solvency issue. Many of you, you know, we hear in the media, uh, and we know, in fact, that, uh, uh, that uh, the life of the Medicare Trust Fund, the ability to pay out, uh, is, not, uh, is limited. And one of the things that the, the bill does that you're seeking to repeal is it extends uh, the life of the trust fund. It extends, if it, it postpones the day of reckoning uh, when uh, we, would, we would face the solvency issue. Uh, and it does that primarily by uh, basically uh, doing things more efficiently. If I could mention specifically some of the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Welsh, Mr. Braley, uh, Ms. Castor, and others, I'm probably making a mistake mentioning people by name, but I know specifically that there were many provisions put in that bill uh, that dealt with doing things better, more efficiency, uh, in terms of not only helping people, uh, but also in terms of saving money. And so what we have is that according to the Medicare actuary, the, the Affordable Care Act 
added 12 years of solvency to the Medicare trust fund. And if you repeal it, uh, I think it's very fiscally irresponsible because it accelerates the insolvency of the Medicare trust fund to 2017, just six years away. Now, the problem is uh, if, if that deadline moves closer, which it would under repeal, uh, what would you do? Well, my fear would be, of course, that uh, you'd end up having to cut services to seniors and benefits to seniors, which is the last thing uh, that I think should happen given the promise and the contract, if you will, that we made uh, with seniors when we started the Medicare program and had them start paying into it when they, when they, would much, when they were much younger. Um, so basically, um, if you look at my amendment, uh, it guarantees that repeal cannot go forward unless the Office of Management and Budget, in consultation with the Congressional Budget Office, certifies that repeal will not shorten the life of the Medicare Trust Fund. If OMB reports back that repeal would shorten the life of the Trust Fund, this amendment would stop repeal from happening. I think it's very important. I think the solvency issue is a very important issue. I'd also ask, Mr. Chairman, if I could uh, ask unanimous consent to enter into the record a letter from the Leadership Council of Aging Organizations. It's a coalition representing nearly 60 million seniors. Uh, we received it today. Without objection, the uh, letter will be included. And in that record. also addresses the solvency issue as well as some of, of, of the other issues. And I would urge you really uh, to not go ahead with this repeal uh, for so many reasons, uh, but certainly the Medicare solvency uh, is, is one of the major issues uh, that, the, that the repeal would uh, uh, make worse. Thank you. Mr. Pallone, thank you very much, and I appreciate you once again uh, testifying for the Rules Committee. Uh, I got used to your testimony throughout the years on uh, this important issue, and I appreciate hearing from you today. I'd now like to find a way to uh, make room for the gentleman from Iowa, Mr. Braley, uh, on this uh, energy and commerce. Uh, you know what, uh, Anthony, if you'll be, get on the bottom, I'm sure, I'm sure they don't mind stepping on you, but I uh, appreciate the uh, offer there. The gentleman, Mr. Braley, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and I appreciate all the comments that have been made today. I also want to spend some time to put a human face on the repeal of the health care legislation that was passed and talk about what the consequences are without addressing the consumer protection provisions included in the Welch amendments that we've talked about earlier. I want you all to take a look at this picture. This is a young man named Tucker Wright who lives in Malcolm, Iowa, and he is the face of the health care repeal bill. Because Tucker is four years old in this picture, but two years ago, he was diagnosed with liver cancer before his second birthday. He had two-thirds of his liver removed, and he faces a lifetime of uncertain medical care. Now, what makes Tucker the poster child for a health care repeal is that his parents accumulated over $30,000 in uninsured medical expenses, even though they had the best health insurance they could get in the state of Iowa. Both of his parents were working full time. And the, his parents have had to hold fundraisers to pay off those uninsured expenses. But what's more of a problem is Tucker's father, Brett, just started a brand new job. That's him right here in this picture. He couldn't start that job until January 1st of this year because if he had and had applied for insurance with his new employer, Tucker would have been denied coverage because of pre existing conditions. Hmm. Now, what will happen is if you repeal the health care bill that we passed without addressing these concerns, and then you defer till later addressing the problems we've been talking about, here's what's going to happen. His current insurance company will send out a letter of rescission because there's no longer any justification for keeping him on that policy once the ban on pre-existing conditions is removed, which will happen when the repeal becomes law. And that rescission practice was also prohibited by the health care bill that we passed because of widespread abuses of insurance companies terminating people's coverage without any legitimate legal basis. And that's why we held multiple hearings on the health subcommittee. We talked about this earlier, eight days of hearings, 90 witnesses, five days of markups with amendments offered on both sides and accepted in just one subcommittee. So to suggest that this process was not transparent when it was the most debated, discussed, talked about, written about bill probably in the last 25 years of this Congress is not an accurate reflection of what happened. So when you think about voting on these amendments, 
remember Tucker Wright and what's going to happen to him and his family because that is the practical face of what we're talking about. And I appreciated the chairman's comments about his son. We've had very many conversations about that, and I hope you and your family had a wonderful holiday season. Uh, Mr. Braley, thank you very much, and for not only sharing the story with us, but bringing the beautiful pictures uh, of this family, and I appreciate that a lot. This, in my opinion, uh, clears out what I would call the Energy and Commerce Committee. Mm -hmm. Mr. Moore, if, you, if you'd like to come back up, Ms. Braley, if you want to stay for questions, that'd be fine. Ms. Blum, if you want to take a seat. But we would now like to uh, extend ourselves to these questions uh, of this panel. The gentleman, Mrs. Box, is recognized. I have... Just um, a couple of questions of Mr. Murphy. In, um, in the conversation or in the testimony that you gave, you talked about the family um, uh, running out of money to pay for their insurance, except that they had a savings account, uh, which they went into. Um, what would have been the alternative, Mr. Murphy, um, or who would have paid for that insurance if they had had that um, savings account? Who do you think should have paid for their insurance at that stage? Should they not have used their savings account to pay their legitimate expenses? Well, Ms. Fox, the idea of insurance is that we all bear some responsibility to help people who have gotten injured or have contracted a disease like cancer or something even potentially more expensive. Uh, and so uh, the idea th that insurance is conceived upon is that uh, whether it be through a government-sponsored program like Medicare or through a private program through an insurance company, that we all pay the cost of someone who has gotten sick or someone who has gotten injured. Uh, and so uh, whether they were able to get uh, a potentially subsidized insurance plan through the government, whether they were uh, able to qualify for a program like Medicaid, uh, the concept uh, I think that we've developed in this nation is that we all bear some communal responsibility to take care of our neighbors when they get sick or injured. Ms. Fox, can I add something to that also? No, no, I, I think thank you, Mr. Weiner. Oh. No, thank you. No, thanks. Um, I get that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, you're newly married. You're treated well at home, young man. So you think? You t you've confirmed. Gentlewoman's recognized still. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just was really struck. I've been struck all morning by the use of the term free. Free preventive care, free tests, free this and free that. Um, and your comment about communal uh, responsibility. Um, I do think we bear responsibilities for our neighbors. I have always felt that way. Uh, and certainly, I, I do feel that way. And we've shared others, uh, many of us, that we understand the faces of health care and the challenges that are there for us. I have a member of my family who has had very serious cancer twice, a very close member to me. And I know how important it is to stay on the insurance that that person has. It's very critical in this day and time. But I, I do think it very important that we understand ourselves that somebody pays. You may say that things are free. The, yes, there's free preventive care. Yes, there are free tests designed in this legislation. But somebody's paying for that. And so a choice is being made here. And in the family that you described, they had assets. And yet you implied that they shouldn't have used their assets to pay for their own responsibility and that someone else should have paid for that. And I, I just wanted to point out that as long as we have assets that we have accrued individually, I see that as our responsibility. And that's what I think has made our government great and our country great is that we understand individual responsibility and we do not rely on the government to take care of us when we have the wherewithal to do that. And that's all I wanted to point out, Mr. Murphy. I, I think, again, the implication that we don't have individual responsibility 
is something that is very concerning to me as a member of Congress as to hear someone in this Congress promote that idea that we don't have individual responsibility. So I just wanted to make it clear whether you were implying that it was somebody else's responsibility to pay their insurance or whether it was their responsibility. Well, listen, this, this is obviously a much broader philosophical debate to have here, uh, Representative Fox. But, um, you know, listen, I have responsibility of what I have control over. Um, and I certainly accept the premise of individual responsibility so far as I can control my actions in order to control the ramifications of those actions. In this case, as in the case of all of the instances that you've heard today, those families had no control over whether their loved one, their four-year-old child contracted cancer. They had no control over whether they contracted a disease or had an injury. And so the idea of personal responsibility for illness uh, is something that I think is very different than the traditional notion of personal responsibility for finances uh, or for individual response or individual decisions that a lot of our constituents uh, think about. My, maybe our constituents disagree on this. Um, my constituents don't believe that you should have to exhaust all of your assets, your college savings account, your home, everything that you've accumulated over your life in order to take care of a sick loved one. And that's not personal responsibility to them. They had no ability to control whether or not they got that injury, no ability to decide whether or not their child got cancer. Uh, and so I don't think there's anything dirty or pejorative about the word communal in the sense that when one of our loved ones, our neighbor gets sick, that we should have some responsibility to take care of them. Uh, that's what insurance is. That's what I think that this legislation builds uh, upon. And my last point, Ms. Fox, would be that um, the first place they would go would be that college savings account. But that wouldn't cover all of their costs. Eventually, they'd go on to the public's cost. Eventually, they'd show up to the emergency room with no money in their pocket. Once they went through the savings account, once they sold their house, once that family was out on the street, eventually, they'd show up to the emergency room with no way to pay. And then it's all of our cost. And, and, and that's a result that repeal would have that has consequences, not just for that one family, but has consequences for the entire federal budget. Thank you. Mr. Chair, if, can I, if I could have you hold just for a moment, please. The chair would like to remind members that we are on a one vote uh, at this time, and we are going to continue with this hearing. There may be those among you who have not spoken yet who would wish to go down and vote, knowing that we will quickly get to you. At this time, I would wish to recognize the gentleman, Mr. Polis, for a question. Gentlemen's recognized. You answered my question before I asked it, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. You know, uh, bright minds sometimes exist in the same room. Mr. Uh, the gentleman, Mr. McGovern, is recognized. Yeah, I, I just want to clarify something. I, I'm sorry that Dr. Fox left, but uh, we're not talking about free, anything free here. I mean, people pay their, their health care premiums, um, so we're not talking about free. What, we, what we're, trying to, we're talking about is eliminating co-payments and deductible, deductibles for preventative care so that people utilize preventative care uh, more often and more regularly. Uh, my wife works with the Prevent Cancer Foundation. She always says that, uh, you know, no one should ever die of colon cancer in this country. Uh, but we should encourage people to get their checkups um, because, you know, if someone's caught early, then it could be dealt with. And quite frankly, it's not only better for the person, it's cheaper. Exactly. It doesn't cost as much, you know, to, to get a colonoscopy versus, you know, full-blown colon cancer. Um, you know, we're all pretty lucky here in Congress. We all have health care. We get to take advantage of preventative uh, care, regular checkups. You know, I mean, I went for a regular checkup in, uh, in September. They found a, a nodule on my thyroid. It turned out to be thyroid cancer. Um, I went and got it taken care of. Prognosis, absolutely excellent. But if I had neglected that, if I didn't go for the regular checkup and I waited until, you know, I felt some terrible pain, you know, it might have been a lot more complicated. Uh, so, we're, we, you know, I, I, I think it's important that we're, we clarify here, we're not talking about giving people something for nothing, uh, or we're not saying that people shouldn't take responsibility. I think Mr. Murphy explained it really quite well. Um, I also, um, also want to thank this panel uh, for also talk, some, talking about real people. Um, that when you repeal this stuff, it does, it, it's not a, this is not just rhetoric, it's, it's real people. Uh, that are behind all of these words. I, I have a. I was looking through some of my emails and letters. I had a, a, a mother from Holden, Massachusetts, 
She writes, thanks for the health care bill. My son is covered by my insurance for the cancer he got right after he graduated from college. He would not have been covered if the bill did not pass. How is that a bad thing? <laughs> and I appreciate Mr. Dreyer's kind of press release of a bill that he put together. It's not a replacement. It's just, it's just concepts. But if you vote for this repeal, you are voting to repeal um, the provisions that ban insurance companies from discriminating against people for pre-existing conditions. You're voting against allowing parents to keep their kids on their insurance until they're 26. You're voting against all the preventative care measures. I mean, and people are going to be impacted by this. The, the whole issue of the donut hole, the senior citizens, I have tons of letters from senior citizens who are benefiting from the relief in the donut hole. You're, you're, going, to, you're, going, to, you're going to thrust a new tax on senior citizens. Um, and if you all, and if, you, if everybody's, all my friends on the Republican side say, well, we were all for all that. If you're for all of it, then don't repeal it. You know, if there are specifics in the bill that you don't like, then go after those. But a wholesale repeal, you know, I think is, is, a, is a move backward. Now, Mr. Weiner, you, you were about to Well, I, I just wanted, I, I think Ms. Fox unwittingly made a point that many of us often forget. The scenario that Mr. Murphy describes where people have personal savings and then spend it is why we have nearly as many bankruptcies, even in this economy, attributable to health care costs than there are to people losing their job. So the scenario that Ms. Fox lays out, well, shouldn't they pay their own money? Well, that's happening at such an alarming rate in this country that people are, are throwing up in bankruptcy. And I just want to make one final point. You know, Ms. Fox, Ms. Fox does something very, that's common in this debate, confusing insurance with health care. You know, what happens is if someone doesn't have health care or becomes bankrupt and goes into Mr. Murphy's scenario where they wind up in a hospital emergency room, Ms. Fox's constituents pay the bill. Right. M Mr. Woodall's constituents pay the bill. Mr. Mr. Nugent's constituents pay the bill. That's who we're talking about. So it's not a function of, you know, it's kind of like Buddhism. It's not whether we'll have change, but what kind of a change we're going to have. It's not whether we're going to have health care costs. It's how we keep them as low as possible, how we get people as much coverage as they can in the private insurance market to aggregate the cost over as many people as possible. Because the choice is Mr. Murphy's family goes into a hospital emergency room, poorer for it. They have a daughter who doesn't have the care, and we pay the bill. It is not as if we're going to stop providing health care once you repeal this Health Care Reform Act. We're just going to be passing the bills at much higher rates, according to the CBO, than we were before to all of our constituents. I don't see that that's particularly valuable, which is why, by the way, we have my new freshman colleagues who are on the Federal Employees Health Benefit Plan, who are on Medicare, and who, God willing, will never be on Medicaid, but who probably will when they become senior citizens in nursing home care, because it's the only program that really provides it. So I think we've got to get out of this idea that somehow, as I said earlier, the bill fairy is going to come down and pay these bills if we somehow repeal this. No, it's going to be all of our constituents through their state and local taxes, through their federal taxes and through their out-of-pocket expenses who are going to pay these added costs. No, and, I, and I appreciate that, Mr. Weiner, because I think a lot of people don't realize that um, the cost of uncompensated care in our system um, adds considerably to the overall cost of health care for all of us. We pay more when we go to the hospital. We pay more, you know, for, you know, for everything. So um, I appreciate very much your comments, and I appreciate all of you being here. Thank the gentleman for his question. Gentleman, right now. In fact, I am going to come over to Mr. Nugent at this time. I yielded to the gentleman to see what kind of question he wanted. I appreciate that. You, you are doing great, and, if, and I hope you voted. I did. You did. The gentleman, gentleman is appreciated. The gentleman, Mr. Nugent, is recognized for question of the Energy and Commerce Committee members that are still present at this time. The gentleman, the gentleman is recognized, Mr. Nugent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to thank uh, all of you for your input today. It's, you know, as, as a new member of Congress, and particularly as a non-legislator up to this point, uh, it, is, uh, it is different, and I will tell you refreshing, though, to hear arguments on both sides. Uh, you know, that's really what the American people have been clamoring for. Uh, it's one of the reasons I got elected. People want to hear from their representatives about what they want out of this Congress. I think that the Republican majority that is in place is here because of the mandate of the public that felt left out, whether rightfully so or not. The perception is that things were done in Congress with the exclusion of the American people. 
I will tell you that I represent over almost a million people within my district. Almost a quarter of them are retirees. But across the board, what I heard in the eight plus counties that I cover was that they were upset with the fact that the federal government was mandating things within their life that they feel they're very comfortable and have the ability to take care of on their own. I believe they're concerned about, and I hear this all the time, about federal intrusion into their lives. I hear it from businesses. You know, I listen to the issues that have come up, particularly uh, some of the amendments that have been put in place, or you're asking to be put in place. I don't think that you've heard a disagreement on the Republican side in regards to existing pre-existing conditions. I have a niece that has a pre-existing condition who was happy day of her life, found out she was pregnant. Two weeks later, she found out she had breast cancer. If she leaves her employment, that's going to be an issue for her as a pre-existing condition. So I will tell you from the Republican side, at least for this person, is that it is important to us. It, you know, we're not demons. We really care, just as you do, about the American public. I think we just have different ways maybe to get to the same location. And so what I ask is that, you know, I support the repeal. Because I believe that we do need to start with a fresh piece of paper and all of us get together in regards to what's important to us and to the people that we represent. I had a clear mandate that the people want us to repeal this. But I truly believe that what they really want, not only the repeal, but they really want to see a replacement, something that has been thoughtfully, thoughtfully brought to the table to, to help more people, uh, particularly in instances where they feel like they have some input into the process. Would the gentleman yield? I will. Um, you made a very good point about your experience running and the feedback you got. We've heard a lot of expression today on the Republican side about support for some of the amendment topics that we are submitting to the committee, which are already in the existing bill. Are you aware of any efforts made by the Republicans in Congress between 2000 and 2006 when they controlled the House, the Senate, and the White House to address these conditions? I'm not. So I guess that's why some of us are a little bit skeptical about the level of commitment if we repeal this bill today or next week when it comes up on the floor for a vote, that there will be that same level of commitment to address these in a meaningful way. Well, I mean, I can't speak for, for everyone. I can only speak for myself. Uh, to me, you know, the issues are clear. Uh, we have an issue in America in regards to affordable health care. As an employer, I will tell you this, that what I will pay for insurance to get through my employer, not through the house, will be almost, it'll cost me $9,000 more a year. But I'm going to remain with that because I believe it's the right thing to do. Because I think that when you have Americans that are struggling, why should I? Why should I get a cost savings because I've just got elected to the United States House of Representatives? That's the reality of it. And so when we talk about reducing health care costs, I think that we really need to talk about reducing health care costs. When I talked to physicians, physicians throughout my district, and we talked about, you know, I said, listen, you guys were obviously for this bill because the AMA was behind it. And the physicians looked at me and said, Rich, they only represent less than 15% of the current physicians in America. They don't represent the position on health care as it relates to doctors every day. And so, you know, I look at those experts and I listen to them and I listen to the constituents that elected me that have an overwhelming desire to repeal this health care bill. But all I can tell you is this, I want to do the right thing. I ran on that and I truly believe doing the right thing is looking at those things that were presented in Chairman Dreyer's bill are the right steps in the right direction. Could I ask the gentleman to yield also? Sure. I, 
just wanted to go back to what you said in the beginning, and I, I think you sounded very reasonable when you were saying, look, there are certain patient protections and other things in this bill or that you guys are bringing up in your amendments that I, that I think are good. What I'm hearing from my constituents is that, you know, we had two years of this debate, we passed this bill, and now let this bill unfold. You know, some of the patient protections have already kicked in. More things kicked in uh, on January 1st, uh, you know, like the 50% uh, the uh, um, benefit under, for prescription drugs if you, if you fall into the donut hole. And what they're basically saying is, you know, let it run its course. If, if there are, we can certainly have hearings. I, I uh, chaired the uh, health subcommittee um, in the last Congress. We had so many hearings. We can certainly have hearings where we talk about, uh, you know, the various issues as they unfold. And if changes need to be made on a bipartisan basis, we can do that. But the problem is if you just repeal it outright, you've eliminated all the things that we're mentioning today that are important. <coughs> And I think it makes a lot more sense, and this is what I'm hearing from my constituents, they'd rather that this bill moves forward because there's a lot of really good things in it. And then we can, you know, we can have the oversight hearings. We can meet in Energy and Commerce or the Health Subcommittee and talk about, you know, how it's going, whether the regulations are, you know, what they're supposed to be. Seems to me that's a lot more reasonable approach than just saying, okay, repeal. Everybody loses all these patient protections and everything else, and then we start from the beginning. That's my only plea. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Um, I wish to make it very clear um, uh, to my fellow Floridian, uh, Mr. Nugent, that I don't uh, question it at all. Um, uh, the reports that he just identified um, uh, from um, his physician, friend or friends, and his constituents who, in his judgment, the majority are uh, opposed um, uh, to the present uh, law on health care. I was born in Altamont Springs, Mr. Newton, no. yeah. 74 years ago. Um, like the job you hold, I have become friends with Democrats and Republicans in Broward County. Uh, that um, uh, were sheriff, including the now sheriff, who is Republican. Among the more critical things along the um, uh, years that they had to deal with uh, was as they increased uh, employees in the various capacities, from the jails to the line officers, what they found was health insurance um, uh, was a particularly significant uh, issue. I want to go back just briefly, since many of our colleagues were not in here when I did this previous. I asked the question of uh, the persons that were seated in the room at the time, and I repeat, unless you increased your deductible or chose to not have certain measures um, uh, provided in your insurance policy. <clears throat> Is there anyone in here that has had insurance for two decades or more that have ever had their insurance go down in cost? If so, raise your hand. The simple fact of the matter is nobody has had the cost to go down. Now, we have, as um, uh, Congressman Nugent said, a serious affordable uh, health problem, a uh, health care problem and health care delivery problem. <coughs> uh, and there's no question about that. I have different friends than you, evidently, that are physicians, almost universally. And I could call names and won't bother, but almost universally, my friends that are physicians, hospital officials, nurses, um, 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 uh, people in the technical fields that are training, um, uh, uh, the people at the teaching hospitals um, at Jackson and now at uh, Florida Atlantic University, all of them favored this measure and all of them felt that we didn't go far enough. And therein lies a part of the rub 
And so Mr. you Mr. Hastings, will you yield for just one of moment? Of course I, I think and there's a lot of confusion going on in the room right now, and I see that there are a number of members who've come in and people are coming and going. Obviously, this has been a management challenge for us. Uh, we are going by the uh, standard rules of the House in our proceedings here, and that is we are going by committee and recognizing members by seniority. And I believe that that is the, the fairest way for us to deal with this. Uh, the names have been submitted to us, uh, and now we, we continue to have lots of people uh, coming into the room. Uh, my friend Ms. Edwards is not on the list at all here, and so everyone is going to be recognized. And so I, I want to make it clear that we want to hear from every member, but I just will say that it's our intention when we complete the members of the uh, Energy and Commerce Committee's testimony, uh, the, the witnesses we have listed here, and please contact our staff if you're in the room and we don't have it right. I mean, George Miller, Rob Andrews, Lynn Woolsey, John Tierney, Raul Grijalva, and Paul Tonko are the names on the list from the Committee on Education and the Workforce. Then we will go to the uh, Committee on the Judiciary Committee. Uh, we've heard from uh, Mr. King, from uh, Mr. Conyers, and Ms. Jackson Lee are on that list. And then from the Committee on Ways and Means, we have Mr. Levin's name. We've just been submitted. Thank you. Let me... We've just gotten uh, several other names here of members who would like to testify. And so after we go through those committees, then we will get to, we've got Gwen Moore, Bill Owens, uh, Shelley Pingree, Lujan Payne, Fudge Scott, Songus, da uh, Susan Davis, I guess, Nadler, Larson, Baldwin, Waltz, Inslee. We heard from Inslee already. Uh, maybe he wants to come back. Sanchez, Spear, and uh, Van Hollen, Peters, Courtney, Bishop, Heinrich Thompson, Danny Davis, Yvonne Clark, Pasquale, Wasserman Schultz, Cuellar, and Yarmouth. And so that's the list that has been submitted to us. Not hasn't been submitted to the Rules Committee, and and uh, and we, uh, you know, I mean, what we do is is we proceed, especially when we have a group like this. We want everyone is going to be able to be heard, but I'm just telling you that we go by committee and uh, by seniority on that committee, which is the, the standard operating procedure for the rules of the House. And so if I've not called your name, if you, our, staff, if you, our staff will get in touch with you and we will put you on the list to make sure that every single member has an opportunity to be heard. So excuse me and thank you for yielding, oh, no Mr. Problem. Hastings. Thank you, no, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, I ask all unanimous consent uh, that a statement that I had prepared be made. Uh, Without objection, of course, thank the gentleman's you. statement will be made. Thank you very much. Returning um, uh, to my colleague, Mr. Nugent, who says that it would be helpful if we have a fresh piece of paper, his words, and that we start over again. Well, there are many things in this measure to like and to dislike, and um, it would seem to me um, uh, that uh, uh, this speedy um, uh, uh, answer to um, uh, my Republican friends, um, uh, constituents who they feel or uh, want them to address this um, is, is at least ignoring uh, certain aspects of what could transpire if we were to take the time to hear from people who have benefited, to hear from uh, the folk who are providing the regulations, to hear from the administration uh, as to whether or not any of their uh, views have uh, changed. All of these things could be done. And yet we proceed apace um, uh, to um, um, have a $230 billion uh, measure, if it were to be made law, blow a hole already in a whole blown budget. And I find that anathema and just can't understand how it is that we're in the position that we're in. Let me quote three people, um, one, and I do not know two of them. Timothy Jost, who is a professor at Washington and Lee University, says, of course the Republicans are too cowardly to hold hearings on what repeal would mean for the American people. But even though Americans are often misinformed by the Republican media, they're not stupid. The Republicans will come to regret this political ploy. Douglas Koopman, another professor from Calvin uh, College, I quote what is attributed to him. House Republicans should be careful. 
If House Democrats lost their majority in November 2010 by passing health care reform, rather than focusing on jobs and the economy, it doesn't really make sense for House Republicans to mirror their obsession with health care. It seems more like petty politics, taking away the favorite, quote, toy, unquote, of your adversary, rather than focusing on the key issues of the moment, which are still the economy and the budget. Now, the other one I take a prerogative because he is my good friend. And he, too, is quoted in this same uh, journal uh, today. And that's um, uh, uh, Congressman Robert Andrews uh, from New Jersey. He may say this and words similar, um, but I'm taking the prerogative of saying what he said. The Republicans are working on the wrong problem. The public wants the economy to be fixed and a focus on job creation. Repeal of health reform is a diversion. It is a political symbol rather than a legitimate effort to solve a problem. I have two criticisms. One, they're working on the wrong problem. People want employment. Second, they're casting a symbolic vote. Then they're going to start thinking about what to do about health care and that is headed in the wrong direction. Now, I agree thoroughly um, uh, with Robert, and the proof is in the pudding. If I were to put the question to any of uh, uh, our Republican colleagues here, when is it? They say, oh, we're going to hold some hearings. Oh, don't, don't, don't worry about that little part, the lifetime uh, uh, benefits. Uh, we, we're going to get to that. The question is when and why now do what it is that you're doing. And also, uh, 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 all of us enrolled in the Federal Employees Health Insurance Program, I am, and does the government pay a larger uh, portion of our health insurance? Uh, and the answer to that is yes. And maybe, Mr. Pallone, or uh, some of you would talk about your thoughts about members of Congress publicly disclosing this fact so voters will understand the hypocrisy of our Republicans on health care. And there's a whole lot of uh, hypocrisy um, uh, that has been in progress during uh, this election, not the least of which to come in here without a score, knowing full well that there's going to be an increase in the deficit and yet be the deficit hawks that they claim. Somewhere along the line, the rubber has to hit the road. And all of us, as I said yesterday, need to understand the dynamic of sacrifice. And everybody in here, every one of our constituents, no matter their persuasion, are going to have to sacrifice in order for us to achieve what is necessary in this economy. I can't tell you all on that side how many times some of us argue to our leadership that we are letting health care suck up all the air out of this place and that we should be talking about jobs. We spent time on it over and over and over again, formed a task force. Joe, you were there, a couple of people. We met regularly about jobs, 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 and we still did health care and got our hat handed to us. And I'm sure the American public must be awfully confused. They thought that we had at least put some of this to rest and would try to fix what their, the problems may exist. And here we are back here again at the outset of these proceedings, at the second day of the 112th Congress, and what's sucking up the air? Health care. Something is wrong with this picture. Mr. Pallone, did you have a reaction? I, I'm just uh, going to say what I said to Mr. Nugent before, which is uh, I, what I'm hearing from my constituents is exactly that. You know, where you should be focusing on jobs and the economy. And, um, you know, that's why I said to Mr. Nugent before, look, there's no reason to do this now. I mean, if you, as the, as the various provisions unfold over the next few years, we can certainly have some hearings on it. And, and you know, just like we do oversight on any bill, and if, if there have to be some changes, then uh, we can do it on a bipartisan basis. But to start off the Congress with a, a repeal of health care, uh, you know, people want us to move on, and that's exactly what I hear from my constituents. Now, I heard Mr. Nugent, I hope I'm not misunderstanding, but I think you said that you're not taking the, uh, 
the uh, the federal health insurance through. The, uh, did I misunderstand that? No, that's correct. On that, that is what you said. But I and, and that's commendable if that's what you want to do because I assume you're going to vote for repeal. But I would agree with you, uh, Mr. Hastings, that I think that anyone who votes for repeal should also follow Mr. Nugent's example and not and not take the health insurance themselves because the one of the purposes of this. Uh, of the legislation was to provide near universal health care and to cover everyone. And of course, you know, the way the bill is written, members of Congress will, you know, go into the exchange. That was also in the bill. We're not going to be treated any differently. Uh, and if you're going to say that you want to repeal uh, and you want to throw this thing out, then you should be fully prepared not to take uh, the health insurance yourself uh, and not have the federal government pay for it, in my opinion. Um, the other thing I was going to say, too, is that, you know, when you talk about jobs, I mean, I, I don't want to focus on that because I, I think we shouldn't be dealing with this repeal at all. But the bottom line is this legislation that they're seeking to repeal creates a lot of jobs. I mean, as you cover everyone and, you ha and everyone has to get, uh, you know, has, goes and sees their own doctor or goes to a clinic, uh, you're creating a lot of jobs in the health profession itself, not just doctors, but home health aides. Uh, you know, money's going to community health centers, new community health centers are being built. I mean, I dare to use the word because I know my Republicans don't like to hear the word stimulus, but this bill actually is, even though it saves money and reduces the deficit, it also has a tremendous stimulus impact on the economy. And I don't think we should forget that. So again, the repeal in this case is actually going to uh, not only uh, take away from the discussion of the issue of the economy, but actually... Uh, uh, eliminate jobs, which is exactly the opposite of what we should be doing. So I yield back to the gentleman. And if any of you have, have private colleges and all other colleges, one of the fastest growing areas that we can be assured of in our economy is of the health care field. And for those of us from Florida that have as many seniors as we have, um, it's impossible to believe that seniors don't understand the dynamics of uh, a great need uh, to have Medicare, Medicaid, and the associated uh, sustainability uh, for their uh, 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 life circumstances that uh, they find themselves in. And no, every one of them is not um, uh, living in the villages. Some of them live in, that is in my district, in Century Village, and are barely holding on, and are the people that have to make the distinction between food and medicine. And I think that's ludicrous for a great country like ours to have anybody in this country, anywhere in this country, in the position of having to choose between medicine and food. I yield back. Thank you very much, Mr. Hastings. Uh, let me just say <clears throat> that Mr. Markey has joined us. Before we proceed with questions, if you could briefly, we've, again, or we're dealing with a bit of a challenge here. In fact, I was just reminded that since the Democrats haven't even put the committee structure together yet, we have members here, and we're not even sure on which committees they sit, especially uh, newer members who might be in the room. So, Mr. Markey, if, if you'd like to <clears throat> offer your thoughts. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. I have been on the Energy and Commerce Committee for 35 years. Uh, so you qualify to be here? I think uh, so, yes, at this yes, uh, particular yeah. okay. point and in time. It, no rumor of your removal from the committee as we... I, I remember, no. I remember uh, Kyle Albert and Gerald Ford, uh, whose uh, names will only be mentioned this one time uh, mm -hmm. in this room, okay, just good. so that I can establish my longevity. But uh, <clears throat> I, I want to also make it relevant to uh, today. Uh, I'd uh, like to recognize, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for recognizing me. I would like to recognize uh, Congressman Deutsch and Congressman Boswell for uh, joining with me and in introducing this important amendment, uh, and also co-sponsored by Representative Conyers, Jackson, DeLauro, Doyle, Ellison, Van Hollen, Baldwin, and Johnson. As Americans continue to struggle through the worst economy since the Great Depression, our seniors are among the hardest hit. Medicare is a promise to our seniors that says essentially that in retirement, after years of hard work, you will have access to high quality health care and the medications you need to stay healthy. There's currently a gaping hole in that promise, the so-called donut hole, that leaves millions of seniors paying thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs for their prescription drugs. Seniors 
who reach this coverage gap are often forced into gut-wrenching choices which prescription to fill, which pills to cut in half or to skip altogether. We've heard real-life accounts from seniors across the country who find themselves unable to pay for the prescription drugs they depend upon to live. The health care law in place is already helping these seniors afford their medications and stay out of the hospital, improving quality of life and saving Medicare uh, money. Our amendment is quite simple. It preserves the provision of the new health care law that closes the coverage gap in Medicare for grandma uh, so that she can have affordable prescription drugs. So all we're really asking is to protect grandma here from repealing a provision that is now providing her uh, with help for prescription drugs. And I think that's the least we can do for grandma is to carve out an exception for her uh, to this bill that you're going to repeal everything. Uh, it preserves those provisions that provide grandma free preventative care, like cancer screenings as well, so that seniors, so that grandma, as she's getting older, can go in and get those free screenings. But don't take that benefit away from grandma. She's got it right now. And she can go in and use it. But please don't vote to not allow at least an amendment to preserve those protections for her. And it also preserves the provisions that fight fraud and abuse in Medicare, protecting the integrity of the program against people who try to bilk the system for services that they never provided. Last year, as a result of this part of the health Massachusetts and four million more across America received a $250 rebate in order to help pay for their prescription drugs. That went to grandma. And I just don't think we should repeal it, to be honest with you. I think it really helps her, and it's a gap in the coverage. And beginning this year, thanks to the new law, those who hit that coverage gap will be eligible for a 50% discount on drugs purchased in the donut hole. This is a major life-saving provision for millions of senior citizens, for our grandma. And let's just carve that part out. If you put this amendment in order, I'm sure it will pass on the House floor. Without our amendment, those discounts will disappear. The $250 prescription drug rebate provided to seniors last year would be repaid, would have to be repaid. Seniors would no longer be eligible for free preventative care that keeps them healthy and out of the emergency room. The gap in seniors' prescription drug coverage would reopen once again. Seniors would face thousands of dollars in out-of-pocket costs to get the medications they need. Our amendment would ensure that an effective lifeline that's already working for our seniors is not severed. I ask that you make this amendment in order so that we can debate it on the House floor. Uh, I thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much, Slaughter. Mark, you appreciate it. And let's uh, go to the sessions. Next, we have questions. Then, Mr. Polis. And, uh, I'll yield my time. Mr. Polis. Uh, first, I have uh, two unanimous consent requests. First, unanimous consent for statement from uh, Mr. Jerry Connolly of Virginia. Without objection, it will appear in the record. Uh, secondly, a modification to the Wiener Amendment, striking line nine, replacing 143 million with 230 million. Without objection, the change of Thank you. Uh, and unfortunately, they're both absent, but I'll still make these remarks. I wanted to congratulate uh, Mr. Webster on the fastest ever ascension to the chairmanship of the Rules Committee. I want the record to show that Mr. Webster did get to chair the Rules Committee uh, for a period of time. When I, when I walked into the room, I was a little stunned, I have to do yeah. <laughs> well, I, I noticed everyone was still here, so I mean, he's been here for less than 24 hours. In, in particular, as you know, Mr. Chairman, I occupied that, that very seat for two years, and I never got to, I never got to chair the Rules Committee. Uh, and uh, I have to say I'm professionally jealous of Mr. Webster. Well, well, <laughs> and I wouldn't have gotten to chair last, the last uh, session either, I assure you. But uh, in any event, I think that is something for the history book. So I just wanted to uh, commend Mr. Webster on that uh, medi meteoric rise. Um, I, uh, I also... Yield. Um, I, I'll yield for a moment, sure. By the way, he was shocked and stunned also. <laughs> sure he was. Um, I want to uh, briefly talk about the pre-existing condition piece uh, with uh, Mr. Pallone and Mr. Markey. Um, there has been general sympathy, I think, from, from both sides of the aisle about what do we do for people for whom it's not their own fault and are denied insurance, whether it's cancer or, or some other condition. Um, 
clearly the getting them into the risk pool and enabling them to access insurance is a goal of health insurance reform, a goal of health care reform. In fact, it's the reason that there is some sort of mandate on the other side. It's a, it's a flip side of the same equation. Uh, if you don't have a mandate and you prevent discrimination on pre-existing conditions, many people would rationally wait until they're ill and then acquire insurance. So I wanted to ask, um, is that, uh, is that you, you see that as part and parcel, or is it possible to just accomplish this pre-existing condition piece without the mandate? Well, if the gentleman would yield, I, th I think that that's an important point, and it also goes to what uh, I wanted to respond early to Ms. Fox, and, and I know she had to go vote. But, you know, we found as we were having hearings and as we spend all the time in the Health Subcommittee and Energy and Commerce on the floor, that this is one package. In other words, you, you, st you can't really start taking out the individual pieces of it. Otherwise, to some extent, it falls apart. And, and a lot of it goes to, to the funding. In other words, you know, when, when she was talking about uh, preventative services being free, and I, I don't want to, uh, you know, misinterpret what you said, but I, I, the, the whole point was that if, if prevent the reason why we, we got rid of the, um, the copay uh, for preventative services because we knew that there were seniors who would not go to see a doctor if they had to pay the 20 percent and that if they went to see the doctor even though it would cost the federal government that 20 percent we would save money because they wouldn't get sick and have to get and we'd have to pay for their emergency room care or when they had a much more a worse disease and i think the same thing is true here in other words you can't you start taking um, uh, if, if you don't have the mandate and you don't have everybody in the insurance pool, we know that the, the cost of premiums goes down as the pool gets larger. And the reason the insurance companies discriminate and don't want people with pre-existing conditions is because they cost more. So the whole point is if you put everybody in, then it, the cost comes down for the, for the person uh, you know, who has the pre-existing condition. Um, and, you know, you get preventative care, so hopefully you don't get sick and end up with a, a, a bad health condition. I mean, it, it's just all part and part. So, it's one whole. You can't... So what you're saying is if, if, if we just did the pre-existing piece uh, and I'm healthy, there's no reason for me to be insured. I would just exactly. wait until I got sick and to then get you're, insurance. Exactly. And, 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 and my point is that the, if, you, if you... You have to include everyone. That's why you have the mandate. The whole concept of insurance is the more people you include, the more likely it is that the cost goes down for the individual. And, and, you know, the government's already paying, you know, going back to what Ms. Fox said before, government's already paying for Medicare and Medicare and S-CHIP and Veterans Care and all these other things. It's not like, you know, we're all covered privately. And so we in this bill came up with ways of saving money for government programs, you know, whether it's Medicare, you know, like the thing uh, on the co-pays. Uh, we're trying to save money. That's why, you know, when I talked about my amendment on solvency, that's why we're postponing the day of reckoning and the day when we become insolvent so, so much into the future because we're saving money. And, and we're doing that across the board. I don't think you can separate these things. Thank you. And, uh, you know, I also want to focus on the, the fiscal responsibility piece. I do support Mr. Weiner's amendment and hope that it's made in order. Or, you know, uh, failing some sort of certification process that this won't increase the deficit, it would be really great to see what these offsetting cuts are. Uh, and I know that uh, the chairman, uh, Chairman Upton, responded, well, they'll, they'll work on some and, and, and maybe uh, come before us. But uh, everything we decide in policy is a matter of trade-offs. We would all love to have our cake and eat it, too. Wouldn't that be wonderful? We'd all love free health care and no taxes, quite frankly. Uh, but when you have a one-paid spending bill of $230 billion, you have to weigh that against where the cuts and or tax increases are coming from. And with the party uh, in the majority, I understand they would be cuts. But at least let's see what those... $230 billion in cuts would be, and weigh them with the desire uh, to repeal a bill that they happen to find uh, undesirable. So uh, I will be uh, assuming that this uh, bill, if this bill does pass the House, this one-page $230 billion spending bill, uh, I will certainly be looking forward to ideas to offset this. And the first $230 billion in cuts that are located by the majority party, uh, I will consider as having uh, effectively paid for uh, the very first uh, legislative move of this party, uh, which is to uh, have a, enact a one-page $230 billion spending bill. And we'll look forward to what those trade-offs are. Once we have that other side of the equation, and I hope it takes a matter of weeks or months and not years to get there to that $230 billion figure, then we can have a discussion. This is what the trade-off is. Uh, and, and do we want to 
have repealed uh, health care reform uh, and enacted $230 billion in deficit spending in the process? Or do we want to make these cuts to other programs, whether it's defense or education or uh, Medicare or wherever else that money is found? And I will very much look forward to having that discussion of weighing both sides of that equation uh, when those cuts are presented to us. And I certainly wish that could have been now, so that could be weighed. But uh, I will expect them uh, as soon as possible. And I'll yield to Mr. McGovern. Yeah, I, I just want to make a point. Uh, uh, I appreciate Mr. Markey coming and talking about, I think, a very important provision in the health care bill, which is the provision that closes the donor hole. Because a lot of seniors get caught into that donor hole and have to pay a lot of out-of-pocket out of expenses. And if they can't afford it, they sometimes go without. And this bill would not only repeal that provision, but in the, in the statement of principles that Mr. Dreyer has introduced of all the things that they're going to hold hearings on, uh, the donor hole and the Medicaid prescription drug issue is not even mentioned. So uh, none of the committees are even instructed to even look into this issue. So you repeal it, it's gone. And based on their statement of principles, they have no intention of bringing it up. So um, I just wanted to make that point because I think, um, you know, this this idea that you know we're gonna we'll we'll, we'll fix everything in the future uh, doesn't have a lot of doesn't have a lot of merit when even their own set of principles that even mention this issue which is which is a big issue I thank the gentleman let me just uh, finish by saying that again I think that uh, this full repeal uh, is um, uh, an overreaction because there are many elements of what has been passed that I think there's strong support for from both parties. Again, going back to the pre-existing condition piece, uh, I think it was mentioned in the chairman's opening remarks that high-risk pools, larger pools would be one way of dealing with that. Well, that is underway. That's where we are today. So at the very uh, least, why isn't it just a repeal of the next stage? Why are you also abolishing in this bill Today's high-risk pools, which are the we saw as intermediary step, perhaps some of you see that as the final step, but why repeal it all together? I would see, uh, if you believe it's the final step, make it the final step, rather than go backwards in time to make it even harder uh, for people with any type of pre-existing condition to access insurance, and I'd like to yield back. I appreciate the uh, gentleman uh, just to kind of answer a question from the leadership of this House. The facts of the case is the gentleman, Mr. Plone, even spoke of certain areas have a huge impact on other areas and it is embedded throughout the bill and it is a very intricate process and the Republican leadership does understand that and that is why what we're trying to suggest and then do is that what we will do is come and meticulously work through this bill where we can make sure, as you heard the gentleman, Mr. Dreyer, talk about, there are still very much priorities that the Republican Party does have that are consensus ideas. It was what we felt like was impossible to come in and dissect certain areas out because there were sections that were embedded together. The gentleman does make good points. We're attempting to thoughtfully, as we are today, to take as much time as necessary, recognizing we've been in since 10 o'clock a.m. this morning, that we are going to take the time and meticulously dissect this. And I thank the gentleman, Ms. Pulse. Uh, recognizing a request from the gentlewoman, Mrs. Slaughter, she's recognized. Thank you very much, Ms. Session. I appreciate you letting me go out of turn. But I really wanted to talk to these two gentlemen from Energy and Commerce. We, uh, we, I think all of us were here for the Clinton health care, were we not? That was the first time, uh, I guess I had not paid enough attention, but that was the first time I ever became aware of the fact that uh, you had a lifetime cap. I think that time was about a million dollars. I hope it's gone up since then. Uh, and once you reach that cap, you were not insurable again in the United States of America. And it occurred to me the same thing, of course, as Ms. Castor mentioned this morning with cancer that you may be covered once with cancer, but don't get it again. I mean, the fact that people were not, again, insurable. Um, and it occurs to me that while we have this huge number of uninsured persons in the United States, and we just lump them all in together as uninsured, uh, if there would be any way that we could ever quantify how many of those were persons who simply reached that arbitrary cap uh, and kept them from ever even having insurance again. Um, I Certainly in my lifetime, I've known many people who had reached the cap and who simply could not, uh, uh, had amputations, other things, a, a head injury. You could use that million dollars up in a matter of 
to three months. Um, and it, the, the arbitrariness of that, uh, and what we did to, to family structure, spending the rest of their lives trying to make up that money, uh, I, I think if there was no other rationale, and heaven knows there was plenty, for us to do this bill, what we could do uh, to relieve that kind of burden, I think it affected people's effectiveness, the kinds of jobs they could have. If they were lucky enough to have some insurance, they knew they could never leave that job, could not move up. Uh, I, it, do you, does that uh, make any inroads or any sense to you that what we're saying, we really simply don't know how many people were denied insurance because they were sick well, I, or I'm had sure, been sick? I'm sure we can find out, but I, I, what the gentlewoman raises, and I think, you know, again, this goes to the larger issue, you know, who's going to benefit from um, the repeal? The only person or the only group, in my opinion, that benefits from the repeal are the insurance, the insurance companies, companies. Yeah. because they keep raising premiums. Right. The or reason they're helping you if you're sick. Right. And the reason yeah. they have all these discriminatory practices, whether it's the pre existing conditions or the lifetime caps or the annual caps, is for them to save money and mm. so that they can, you know, make up a, a larger profit. And, um, you know, and, and of course, who's going to pay? They're going to make profits. Their shareholders are going to make money with the repeal. But who's going to end up paying? The government. Because, what, you know, when the person doesn't have insurance, you know, you say recurrence in the cancer, they're going to go back to the hospital, they're in the ranks of the uninsured, and you end up paying for it anyway through uncompensated care, either at the federal or the state level. So, you know, this is not... Um, the health care reform saves the federal government money. There's absolutely no oh, question does. about it. And the repeal is going to, in my opinion, not only cost money because it's going to go further into debt, but it's, it continues a status quo system where the only person that benefits is the insurance company, the special insurance. And I'm not, you know, maybe a lot of the Republicans don't realize that that's who they're benefiting, but that is who they're benefiting. And that's what the lifetime cap is all about. And I, I think one of the most important things we did was the medical loss ratio, which said uh, 80 to 85 percent of the premium dollar going to the insurance company has to be spent on health care. I'm not sure a lot of people know that as well. So instead of going into overhead or exorbitant salaries or big bonuses or everything, it goes, the money you paid in goes to provide health care. That, again, should, I think, save the government a great deal of money. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Sessions. I uh, thank the gentlewoman and am always pleased to extend time to uh, the, the gentlewoman for I questions appreciate on these very things. Much. Thank you. Uh, at this time, I'm going to recognize that I believe that all the members of the, uh, of the uh, minority have asked questions that they would wish of this panel, and I would choose to go down through my Republican members and ask them if they, because we've been coming and going with votes, if they would uh, choose to have any questions. That's the gentlewoman, Mrs. Fox, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I I'd like to make uh, one comment and then put something in the record, if I might. Uh, Mr. Pallone just said something that um, uh, it troubles me a lot that it's said, again, it's been said often in this room today, and that is the government pays. You know, I think in the last few years especially, um, people in this country have heard that said so much that they think somehow or another the government has manna from heaven, that there's money that comes down to the government that is just, quote, free, as that term has been used to do. I think we should not use the term government because it's other, it's taxpayer money. Uh, the government has only that money which it confiscates from us as taxpayers and that that it borrows. So I think we must be very careful that we don't continue this myth that gets perpetuated by some of our colleagues that there's something called government money, which again is like manna from heaven. Um, so I'm going to do that in the future uh, when, when that's said. The other thing I'd like to to put in, the thing I'd like to put in the record, Mr. Speak, uh, Mr. Chairman, is um, the roll call votes on the Medicare Prescription Drug and Modernization Act. Our colleagues are very enamored of closing the donut hole, but I note that those people all voted against this bill when it was passed, and I've heard on many occasions, up until the point where the uh, job-killing 
health care bill was passed last year, I heard my colleagues over and over and over again condemn this bill, and yet suddenly they're embracing a part of it. And so I would like to put into the record that objection so it will be show in who record. voted against that bill, which well, brought the prescription well, well, the general, drug plan. Will the gentleman yield for one second? To, for a question or yeah. for a comment? I guess um, a little bit of both. Well, I wasn't here when, no, when but this I, bill but you, was you, you, But since you talked to us about how we voted on the Medicare prescription drug bill, let me just say, say um, we had an alternative approach, which we voted for, that didn't have a donut hole. And the other thing is the bill that uh, you're referring to that the Republicans rammed through like in the middle of the night, uh, I think early into the morning, they had, a, they had the roll call open for like three hours to twist some arms. Uh, it was not paid for uh, and added significantly to our deficit. So what we're saying here is we want to go do what we originally wanted to do, provide seniors uh, a prescription drug bill without a donut hole. Could I ask the, gentleman to, the gentlewoman to yield just on the first point? I agree with you that when you talk about the government, it means the taxpayers. I mean, we're in total agreement on that. My only point was that if a person, as, as Ms. Sauter describes, reaches their lifetime cap and then their uh, cancer reoccurs and they have no insurance, they, they go to the hospital, right? And it may not be the federal government, but in my case, you, you, the, the emergency room the hospital has to take them, and then it becomes uncompensated care. And many times in New Jersey, we've had to, the state legislature has had to, you know, come up with new taxes as a way of funding that uncompensated care. I mean, it happens so many times in the state legislature. So you're right. I mean, it, the government is the taxpayer. But my point is, if you don't, if you repeal this bill, and then you go back to a situation where more and more people don't have insurance. Yes, the government's going to pay more, and the taxpayers are going to pay more, but that's exactly what we're trying to avoid. I, I, I don't disagree with your premise that the taxpayers and the government are the same. Thank you, gentlemen. Gentlemen, he wished more time to extend. Gentlemen, Mr. Woodall is uh, recognized. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Pallone, I agree with exactly what you just said, that, that what we saw in uh, the health care bill in, in many instances was the replacement of what would have once been state and local responsibilities with the new federal responsibility for those very for those very same things. Maybe it's a cost saver, maybe it's a, a cost uh, raiser, but simply replacing one level of government with another. Uh, I know we have one of your colleagues from the Energy and Commerce Committee, Mr. Markey, now is our new governor in the great state of uh, Georgia, being inaugurated uh, next week. We're, we're proud to have him. He's got some great ideas for what we can do in Georgia to solve those very same issues that you're struggling with in New Jersey. Now, we've been preempted uh, by this uh, by the health care bill uh, to do those things. Those responsibilities have been changed and shifted. There have been some new burdens added that, uh, that were not there before. So I, I absolutely understand that there's, there's no free lunch. There's no free lunch for folks who, who think they're giving away free benefits, and there's no uh, free lunch for folks who think they're, they're saving money. It's, uh, it's going to get paid for one, uh, one way or the other. Uh, what I heard from uh, constituents and continue to hear from constituents, and since you've established your credentials as the, uh, as the senior member here, Mr. Markey, you might be able to, to educate me. Uh, throughout the entire health care debate, and, and you were talking about the donut hole uh, fix and the amendment here, and I, I find it striking about all of the amendments added. There are those things that are inextricably linked, such as the mandate uh, and guaranteed issue, that those things are inextricably linked. Presumptively, these amendments that we're seeing today are things that are not inextricably linked, things we could deal with one-on-one. Uh, -on -one. And uh, with reference to the donut hole uh, fix, you believe we could go to the floor today and pass that donut hole fix with a markedly more conservative Congress than what we had last summer, a markedly more conservative Senate than what we had last summer. So why didn't, uh, the question constituents are asking me, why didn't we do that last summer? Why didn't we take the donut hole fix to the floor as a, as a standalone bill? I'm just tremendously proud that coming right out of the gate, the Republican leadership has decided to, to bring a two-page bill to the floor and have an up or down vote on a, on a single issue to give us a single way to, uh, to speak to an issue. Well, why didn't the Energy and Commerce Committee, for example, decide to move that bill alone, uh, preventive screenings alone, uh, insurance for young people alone, so on and so on and so on? Uh, it's a very good question. And uh, of course, it begs the question of why, if we've just had an election and there was objection to the way in which that process occurred, that the majority now, the new majority, doesn't take all of those things and create a bill uh, and bring it out and not be rushed to get something done 
within one week. This is a very important subject, the health care of grandma. You know? And uh, as Mrs. Fox raised the question, it's true it is the government, but Medicare is the government. That, and we decided long ago that we were going to provide for grandma. So if the majority wants to, they can propose something that's an alternative. Take their time, put it together. But what we fear is that the real plan is just to repeal this entire bill and not have something as a substitute. And that will, so but what I'm saying is there is a concomitant. Reclaiming my time, Mr. Markey, we've only ended up in this circumstance because of the outrage of the passage of this <coughs> giant bill. Ms. Slaughter referenced uh, 1994, the first time Congress changed hands because of the American outrage over stuffing every health care provision into a single bill and, and trying to push it through. Here we are uh, uh, doing that one more time. What was the decision last summer among among a committee chairmen like yourself, among the Democratic leadership, not to move these ideas that you find so compelling they could pass on their own merits. Well, there Why was didn't a, you move them on their own merits? Well, because, uh, honestly, uh, there were parts of it that were inextricably entwined and were moving as well. And there was pretty uniform opposition on the part of the Republicans then in the minority uh, to us moving. And so at a certain point, in because of the inability to put together a bipartisan coalition on the legislation, um, we had to move in that direction. And you saw what happened in the Senate as well. It basically turned into a process where 40 people or 39 over there were saying nothing is going to move at all. And so that's the unfortunate part about it. What you have as an opportunity now is to take all of the things that you do believe in, if you do believe in filling the donut hole, if you do believe in free screening for grandma, for cancer, if you do believe in rooting out the Medicare fraud, if you do believe, if you do believe, if you do believe, I think those are the first things you should be saying, to be honest with you. You should be telling us and the American people what you do support, okay? All you're doing here is just saying we oppose this entirety over here almost as, a, as, a, as an entity without any component parts to it except that it's the, it's the job-killing health care bill without substituting something that is intelligible to the American people as you promised to them, which we haven't heard yet. And I think that's what we object to. We're afraid that this is really a plan to kill all of it and all of the programs that help kids, that help grandma, uh, that are in there, uh, without your teasing out, at least rhetorically, the things that you will support. You know, because when I hear Mrs. Fox talk about the government, I almost conclude that she doesn't really want to build in these programs for grandma. And so it, that's kind of what you, you're left with as a conclusion as you listen to the rhetoric. And so I think if you give, gave yourself more time, you said to the health committees, put something together, you know, try to work with the Democrats, which is what you wanted, uh, and this will be the bipartisan substitute. But instead, we kind of get the feeling that it's going to be we're all done next Tuesday dealing with health care. I am tremendously pleased that within just 24 hours of being in Congress, I've already found areas of agreement uh, with you, Mr. Markey, and I, I, I couldn't agree with you. I couldn't agree with you more. I think what we're doing today is exactly the, the right thing to do, but my great hope is that coming out of your committee uh, very soon will be exactly those alternatives uh, that we believe, not all in a lump sum, as, as you might have suggested, but one by one by one so we can have those up or down votes and the, and the openness the speaker has provided. But I, I thank you both uh, for your testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, we've, we've heard several times today that the uh, cost of insurance is simply not going down. And does anyone in here believe that the cost of insurance is actually going up? Yeah, I certainly do. And so my question then becomes if the cost of insurance is in fact going up, by changing who pays for it, does that cost go down? And the answer is obviously the is not. It does not go down simply because you change who pays for the cost of health care. Second thing I, I've heard several times today is that this bill saves money and reduces the deficit. My question then would be any bill that actually has tax increases in it that exceeds the cost of the bill would in fact reduce the deficit. That makes sense. If you raise taxes enough, you reduce the deficit the cost, the, the, if the cost for it goes down. Third thing I've heard several times is that the individual mandate is, in fact, a necessity to make this whole bill work. My question then becomes if the individual mandate is unconstitutional and it's found to be true by our Supreme Court at some point in the future, then the whole Ponzi scheme, to some extent, falls apart. Fourth thing I've heard several times today is that the fact that we have 10 years of revenue to pay for six years of benefit. That does not sound like it's paying for itself. I wonder what happens the second decade. Fifth thing I would say is that 
the whole concept of lifetime benefits uh, being exceeded, the question is, what is the actuarial cost on those lifetime benefits being exceeded, and how do we absorb those in the cost of shifting it to the government to include another layer of bureaucracy to help to account for that? Sixth thing I would ask is that the, the question as it relates to the private sector responding to the needs of folks who have not the access to health care is being addressed all throughout our country. The fact is that doctors in my community, Casey Fitz to be one who started the Project, project Care, is providing a private sector alternative to this health care plan. It allows for a group of physicians to provide health care in the private sector at a cost that, are, that is pennies on the dollar to what we see today in this national health care move. I would suggest that Rasmussen's recent poll on Monday that says that 60 percent of the voters, likely voters, still want this thing repealed, there's a reason for that. And the reasons are the six points that I just made. Ultimately, I enjoy and appreciate the passion that we all have about creating more access to health care. The real question is, who pays for it? And the answer is, if the government pays for it, it simply costs extraordinarily more. When I, look down, when I look down the road a decade or two, when we look at the intergenerational effect of taking on another entitlement uh, on this back of our government, when we simply have a 70 plus trillion dollar hole for entitlement expenses in our future, how do we say to ourselves that the day will not come when all of us are facing the same crisis we see in other nations around the cost of health care? It costs too much. So if those in the private sector who are, do nothing but health care can't figure out how to make it work actuarially without increasing the annual cost of insurance, how do we do so as a government? Can the gentleman yield? I don't know that I can address everything or even remember all the points, but let, let me just say this in response. Um, first of all, um, I, I would stress that um, although we have government programs like Medicare, Medicaid, uh, there is some expansion of Medicaid in the bill, certainly. But for the most part, we're still talking private sector. In other words, once the exchanges get up uh, and are going in 2014, people are still buying private insurance through those exchanges. Now they're going to get some sort of a subsidy if they're lower income, uh, you know, through tax credits. But it's still private insurance. And so I, I, I want to dispel the, the myth which is out there. I'm not saying you're saying it, but the myth that out there that somehow this is a, a big entitlement and all this is being paid for the government. Most of the people are, being, are buying private insurance, insurance through the exchange. The other thing I would say is that, you know, all we can do is go by CBO. You know, over the two years when we were putting this together, I personally, many times before this committee, actually said, look, I don't know why we're looking at CBO, because I think that once everybody has a doctor and gets regular care, you're going to save so much money because you're doing all this prevention and wellness yeah. that, um, you know, the government's going to save trillions of dollars. And why are we using CBO scores? CBO would not score any of that preventative care in any way. Uh, and I, I'm sure some of you remember my saying, let's not just look at CBO, because there's tremendous savings here uh, to the government. May I ask you a question? Sure. When CBO scored this bill, my question is, when you add a trillion dollars of, of new expenses and you raise taxes in order to pay for it, if you raise taxes in excess of the actual cost of the bill, and the, and the bill itself only addresses 60% you know, of, the, of, the, of the benefits while getting 100% of the cost, and, and that's the way that we make a balance by increasing taxes, well, not having a 10 years worth of benefits. Well, it wasn't I, taxes. I question, I question the scoring first, and second question I would have is that how does CBO presume upon the American people lifestyle choices that some could be making now, but they're not making as far as preventative care? Well, it wasn't really taxes. It wasn't tax increases. What, what they, essentially, the, the cost of this is primarily uh, uh, twofold. First, expanding Medicaid because people at higher income levels would be eligible for Medicaid. And the second thing with the subsidy or the tax credits for people who were on the exchange who were in that category from say 25 to, to 80,000 for a family of four who would get a subsidy when they bought the insurance on the, on the exchange privately. That's where most of the cost was. Now the savings to make up for that were primarily in, in, in uh, were various, but a big part of it was, was uh, uh, cuts to providers. As you know, you know, the drug industry uh, agreed to a certain amount of cuts, the yes. hospitals agreed to a certain amount of cuts, yes. and the list goes down the road. So that's how it was balanced and still actually saves 
money uh, and reduces the deficit over the course of the 10 years. Uh, may I ask you a question again? When we look at the fact that the Hospital Association of America joined on to the health care plan, I certainly understand that under President Reagan they had through the emergency rooms have to take on all patients. So hence the, the necessity of the individual mandate. So if that is in fact found to be unconstitutional, we find ourselves in the same position where hospitals will perhaps rethink their position because then it does not become cost effective for them to continue forward. Well, perhaps. I, 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 I can only say in response to that that I, I don't think that that will ever happen. I mean, I think that the Constitution, you know, I know there was one judge who said that the mandate was unconstitutional, but there are others that have said that it is. And I think ultimately it will be found constitutional. If the mandate is thrown out, uh, you know, that is going to present a problem because the, the fact of the matter is by having everybody in this insurance pool, uh, that's one of the ways that you reduce costs for individuals because everybody's covered. So hopefully that doesn't happen. I don't think it will. Yes, sir. Uh, on the, the six years of benefits and the 10 years of revenue, looking at the second decade or the intergenerational effect that this bill would have on future Americans, how do, how do we quantify that impact and how do we qualify the fact that this bill in fact pays for itself even with the tax increases I'm, that I'm going to say the same thing that I, I said before. I, I just think that once everybody's covered under the bill and the exchanges are in place in 2014, once everybody gets to see a doctor on a regular basis, doesn't go to an emergency room, doesn't get sicker because you have a, 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 a America that's, that's healthier, Yes, sir. The, the savings are just tremendous. And, you know, we use the CBO numbers. We did end up with savings. We do reduce the deficit. But I don't think that has the, the, the actual savings to the system as a whole are just going to be so much greater that I don't even want to emphasize this. Would the gentleman, quote. Would gentleman yield just for one uh, second? Let me ask you one more question. I, I think we're on the same page as it relates to, to the necessity of maintenance issues. To the extent that we can get folks to make healthier lifestyle decisions early on, we find ourselves saving astronomically in the healthcare industry. I would suggest that the government telling us that we have to have mammograms or some type of checkup doesn't work. I think if we allow ourselves as individuals to make those decisions, that we will make those. I do not necessarily believe that consistently that the only factor that makes that lifestyle decision necessary for us is the cost of it. As I suggested, even in my community in, in South Carolina, we are having small networks of physicians providing high levels of care in the private sector at a cost that is pennies on the dollars. And I, well, I'm glad, look I forgot, forward to working I'm glad, you, on I'm glad you brought up, reminded me that you mentioned that. Yes, sir. Um, actually, earlier when I was talking about some of my colleagues on Energy and Commerce, uh, Peter Welch, uh, Bruce Braley, and others, there are, some, there are a lot of provisions in here that probably haven't had much attention today that actually uh, provide for pilot programs very similar, I think, to what you're proposing yes, in a way of trying to achieve efficiencies. And um, that's one of the things that's beginning to kick in. So these kinds of pilot programs or demonstrations are, are built into the system, and those doctors can probably, I mean, we can look into it further if you like uh, through yes, my sir. office, those doctors can probably, uh, probably apply to be certified to do that kind of demonstration and if it works to expand it in some way. I, I, may, I think I understood what you were saying. Before I yield, my, my final statement on, on what you and I were having a, a positive dialogue on from my perspective is the issue of Medi Medicaid reimbursement rates. My thought is that the Medicaid reimbursement rates are, are low enough now where it's very difficult for some patients to find care anyways. So when we factor that into the, the actual cost of the spill and what it creates, which is a lack of access to more health care for folks who are on Medicaid, I think that the number would score differently long term. Well, you have both, if I understand your question. You have uh, higher eligibility under Medicaid based on income, but you also cool. have a higher reimbursement rate for primary care doctors under Medicaid because we know that a lot of physicians will not take Medicaid now. So we bring the Medicaid reimbursement rate for primary care physicians up to the Medicare level. Uh, yeah. it, only for primary care physicians. And I, I would suggest that the, the doc fix that seems to be necessary to get the Medicare rates to the place where it needs to be uh, is, is still in the works. Well, that, that's the, we, we did that with legislation in the lame duck. You know, we eliminated the cuts under Medicare for doctors' reimbursement rates for the next year for, uh, until the end of, of this year, 2011. But the, um, the health care reform bill actually brings Medicaid rates for primary care doctors up to Medicare levels exactly to encourage them to take 
Medicaid patients and so that they get primary preventative care. Can I just say that the paradox of the paradox of prevention, and by the way, we don't mandate that a senior has to get right. a cancer screening. We just make it free right. as an encouragement. You should go. It's free. Because ultimately that will save the system money. And it's the same paradox as research. If we spent, if we doubled the NIH research budget for Alzheimer's today, knowing that half of all people over 85 get Alzheimer's, would save trillions later. It would score right now as billions we're spending and look at all the federal money, but in the long run, you'd save trillions because we'll have them all in nursing homes, uh, all uh, draining the federal government. So there's a paradox when it comes to prevention and it comes to research that it does look like it costs money up front, but at the end, we all know from a common sense perspective that you save a lot of money. So right now, we don't have a, a, a health care system. We have a sick care system. And what the bill tried to do is change the orientation more towards prevention more towards research um, so that we, 50 years ago, only had 5% going, uh, going to research and going to prevention. In 2010, it was 5%, still going to research, still going to prevention. We're trying to flip that here so that we start to deal with these exploding issues that especially are going to hit seniors with Parkinson's, with Alzheimer's. Four million seniors have Alzheimer's today, 15 million by the time the last baby born retires. It'll bankrupt the entire system. That's what we're trying to do in the bill. I just want to make three quick points. Mr. Markey just made one of them, which is. I think we're Yeah, he just yielded. Yes, I'll yield, sir. Yeah, okay. All right. Uh, one is that um, uh, you, you talk about man, uh, forced mandates. I mean, as Mr. Markey pointed out, I mean, no one's forcing anybody to go get a colonoscopy or a mammogram. But the part of the problem right now is that some people don't do it because of the cost. Secondly, I think it's important for the record to reflect that the neutral CBO score, not the Republicans on the Budget Committee, but the neutral CBO score says that the Affordable uh, Care Act is fully paid for and reduces the deficit by $143 billion over 10 years. You asked about the next 10 years. It's $1.2 trillion over the next 10 years. And the other thing is Mr. That the governor? We're, we're told that, Mr. McGovern, that this, this will also would, would you like to also, yield on that point? Also increase the solvency for Medicare. I'll reclaim my time. Thank you. Yeah. I would suggest to you that uh, if you, continue, if you increase taxes enough, of course you can pay for anything at any time. The question really is how do you do that? Number one. Number two, as I've reclaimed my time, I'm learning. I'm still a rookie here, so give me a little time. I would suggest to you, however, that the second decade, unless we have a crystal ball and not a CBO, it's very difficult for us to tell me what the actuarial cost of, of health care will be, because fact be told that if the actuaries of the best and brightest companies we have in the world today cannot estimate the cost of health care long term, it's very difficult for me to believe that someone else has figured that out. So who do we rely on to get cost estimates? Uh, I will yield. Yeah. Yes, sir. So, so, uh, it is true that you can increase taxes at any time to pay for anything until you get to the point where you don't have taxpayers to do just that, and I thank my friend for yielding. Yes, sir. I guess my, my question to you is then who, who do you rely on to get cost estimates for anything? I mean, who are we going to re rely on, you know, a, a political process that, you know, whoever's in, in power can make up the numbers? Or, you, I mean, I'm just trying to figure out if you're not going to trust CBO. Yeah. Then Here, here's, what I was, here's what I would suggest that if, in fact, the, 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 G, the, the cost of medic, medical insurance or health care itself is, is outpacing inflation in a way that we can't even articulate. It's very hard to put a definitive cost on anything. For us to add a, a trillion dollars of spending in a decade and then know that that spending has to increase in the second decade, and for us to come to the conclusion that somehow spending $2 trillion saves you a trillion dollars, I just don't buy it. I think, that, uh, that's, I think that the rationale behind this is that if you at, require people to get insurance, you, know, you, you, ex, you expand the pool, you control the cost because I'm, we're all not paying, those of us who have insurance are not paying for the people who don't have insurance who end up in emergency room care. That's one of the reasons why health care costs is going up so rapidly because the uncompensated care pool. Certainly so, appreciate that. And we, and we need to address that and that's what this bill does. I'll simply say, reclaiming my time, that uh, serving on the board of, of a hospital association, on a hospital for four years, uh, working in the, in the health care business for a little while, I have an appreciation and affinity for the fact that Access to health care is an absolute necessity. How we get there is really the problem. I would suggest that having the government be that provider of creating access and managing the, the health care of all Americans will break the most trusted relationship between a physician and a patient. I find that quite challenging. We may disagree on that. Finally, I would say this, that 
If, in fact, we look down the road and think that the government is, in fact, the answer to all that ails us, the day will come, as our chairman has so eloquently stated and quickly, concisely, that there won't be anyone to pay it. We will be bankrupt as a country. I don't know how we continue to dig the hole and think that it's the way out. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, I will say that uh, I, I apologize for breaking with the uh, precedent being set today in the Rules Committee and that being brief. Um, let's uh, oh, there is say, uh, Mr. Nugent or Mr. Webster, any more uh, comments? Okay. Thank you Thank both you. very much for being Thank here. You, Mr. We, uh, Thank you, Mr. We appreciate that. Now, as I said, um, we uh, Look forward to having a count of the exact number of witnesses we've had today. Let me uh, explain how we're going to uh, proceed. Um, I believe that we have completed now all of the members of the Energy and Commerce Committee uh, who have been here. And uh, so we will now move to the Committee on Education and the Workforce. And let me just read the by seniority. Lynn Woolsey, I mean, well, George Miller is not in the room, but I'll, I'll go down this list as we uh, have it presented here. Lynn Woolsey, John Tierney, Raul Grijalva, Paul Tonko, Rush Holt. Holt is after Tierney. Holt is after Tierney. Not according to this makeup here. So I think you might have been bumped down in seniority there, Rush. Okay. So then uh, we're, we're going by seniority, which is the uh, standard procedure for rules of the House. Good. Uh, so I guess. I guess this is not quite right then. Uh, Mr. Holt comes after Tierney. Okay. Well, we're going to take your word for it, Rush. Okay, so we're going to go Woolsey, Tierney, then Holt. Is that it? it okay. Matter. Come on. Grijalva, Tonko. Oh, excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Excuse me. Okay, then we're going to go Holt, then Davis. Okay. Then Davis, okay. And then uh, Holt, then Davis, and then would it be Grijalva? Okay. Then I have Tonko. Courtney. Courtney, okay. Courtney then. And then Tonko, would that be right? Okay. And then, uh, and then we've got uh, you know, Hosa, Clark, Courtney, we've done Tim Bishop. Yes, and we don't have Chu's name on here, but She's another. She's now uh, on the back, but you're a member of the Education and the Workforce Committee. So please, we've got a seat right over here for you, Judy. Right over here. You can, you can even take notes. Yes, we do. Anyway, so we've got it now. So we're going by seniority. And have we got, I can't remember where I started. So how did I, who starts? Is it Lynn? It's Woolsey. Lynn Woolsey will begin, so. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. This is somewhat unusual, by the way, I will say, uh, for us to have as many witnesses as we do today before the Rules Committee, but we certainly welcome it on our opening day. I'm very, very happy to have you, and thank you for being, thanks to all of you for being so patient. You're welcome, and thank you uh, for acknowledging our importance here, because we know that we are. Mr. Chairman, uh, we achieved historic reform with the passage of the health care bill last March. Uh, this legislation was a strong first step to create a framework upon which health care can be built and continually improved. Repealing the Affordable Care Act would not only reverse this progress, it would add $230 billion to the federal debt by the year 2021. That is according to the analysis released today by the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office. The cost to millions of Americans would be even greater since repealing the health care law would eliminate their access to affordable health care. My amendment today would control the damages. It has two sections. The first section guarantees that repeal cannot be enacted unless the Office of Management and Budget, OMB, and the Congressional Budget Office, CBO, certify that repeal will not reduce the availability of affordable health coverage choices. If they report back that access to primary care would, in fact, be undermined, this amendment would stop repeal from happening. The second section of my amendment would enact a public health insurance option to compete among private health insurance plans within the health insurance exchanges. My legislation, the Public Option Deficit Reduction Act, H.R. 191, was reintroduced yesterday. And it is projected 
according to CBO, to save the federal government $68 billion over a seven-year period. $68 billion. This, uh, Madam Chairwoman, uh, this uh, $68 billion uh, is money that the government could use to make coverage more affordable or to pay down our deficit. The public option was also cited by the National Commission on Fiscal Responsibility and Reform as a viable means to control health care costs, since it provides affordable alternatives to private plans. Madam Chairwoman, right now is a perfect moment for the public option and a way for the new congressional leadership to show how they really care about this deficit. And they can do this by supporting this amendment. Rather than adding billions of dollars to the budget deficit by trying to take apart the health care reform law. With that, I, I'm available for questions. I, I don't have any questions, Ms. Uh, but I certainly commend her and have joined her on this idea about the public option. Uh, losing that was pretty devastating, I think, uh, and I believe that uh, pretty much all of us who supported it continue to support it, and we'll try to see it through if we can. Uh, it's, I think it a, was a very important component. Um, and let me say, because I won't bother all of you with these things, but I thank you for the hard work that you've put in on these amendments, and they're very thoughtful, and I hope we can get them made in order. Thank you very much. Thank you. Mr. Andrews, would you like to come up to the table? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. And I'm going by the order that Mr. Dreyer has put here, and according to his order and seniority, Mr. Tierney is next. Actually, Mr. Andrews. Mr. Andrews, next. Okay. I'm much older than Mr. Tierney, <laughs> but not as wise. Thank you very much. Let me begin, Madam Chairwoman, by um, thanking you and all the members of the committee for the hours that you put in. Mr. Andrews. Uh, yes, ma'am. I'm very sorry to stop you, but we need to take a recess. Sure. Thank you. Well, do we have any idea of the length of the recess? Well, I would draw my thanking of you then. <laughs> <laughs> you got to be kidding. I am sorry. I do not know an. A I'm sorry. I don't know an answer to your question. We'll make it as short as possible. So we continue our live coverage here from the House Rules Committee. You can see members uh, milling about a little bit. They're setting up the framework for floor debate on the repeal if they uh, finish their work today. We understand that floor debate will take place tomorrow on the floor of the House, and we'll have that for you on C-SPAN, of course. A final vote on this so-called uh, health care repeal is likely next Wednesday. 
The Congressional Budget uh, Office today estimating that a repeal of the health care law enacted by the last Congress would increase the deficit by $230 billion by 2021. Senate Democrats say they don't plan to take up the repeal. Uh, in the House earlier today, one vote on the floor of the House on a uh, measure to reduce the operating expenses of the House, some of the, uh, the committees and some of the staff by some 5%, some $35 million. Uh, we all know that yesterday was uh, an exciting day for members on the House floor. Families were with us and uh, obviously just as today's uh, hearing has had a lot of people downstairs, there were a lot of people. Apparently, uh, accidentally Mr. Sessions uh, was not on the floor when the oath was administered to all of us when we raised our right hand. And uh, he's offered a motion in this committee and he is here now as a, a, a duly sworn member of uh, <laughs> now he's a colleague of ours uh, once again. Constitutional crisis one more day after John Kennedy. Exactly. Like, uh, he has just been he's just been sworn in. He's just been sworn in. And sworn in. Yeah, and sworn in too for uh, having uh, accidentally been off the floor. And so what we're trying to do is, is right now we're trying to figure out exactly how we um, pick up where we left off. And our crack staff director, Mr. Halpern, who is an expert, is going to walk out of the room and as soon as he comes back with an answer for us, we look forward to resuming this wonderfully uh, important hearing. We move to repeal anything, Mr. Sessions? <laughs> All right, so as we watch this uh, House Rules Committee, you can see uh, Congressman Dreyer there making that announcement uh, that apparently Congressman Sessions, Pete Sessions from uh, the 32nd District there in Texas, somehow wasn't on the floor when all the House members got sworn in yesterday. He had to kind of make up that uh, official ceremony, uh, that official swearing in to make sure he's constitutionally uh, in office, and they're trying to figure out if this affects the way the Rules Committee moves forward. At this point, there are some uh, parliamentary issues apparently being resolved, and we'll keep you uh, uh, posted as we watch this unfold here on C-SPAN 2. And as we wait for this Rules Committee, House Rules Committee, to get back underway, we're going to take you live uh, over to another side of the Capitol. Senator Harry Reid, the majority leader in the Senate, speaking with reporters after the Senate Democrats' caucus luncheon. Live coverage here on C-SPAN 2. 
take away the tax cuts for businesses that have health insurance for their employees.